The Adventure of the Dying Detective by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Section 1 of the Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Dr. John Watson, read by Andrew Nixon Sherlock Holmes, read by Peter Yearsley Mrs. Hudson, read by phone Mr. Culverton Smith, read by T.J. Burns Inspector Morton, read by Beth Thomas The Butler, read by Lian Yao Mrs. Hudson, the landlady of Sherlock Holmes, was a long-suffering woman. Not only was her first-floor flat invaded at all hours by throngs of singular and often undesirable characters, but her remarkable lodger showed an eccentricity and irregularity in his life which must have sorely tried her patience. His incredible untidiness, his addiction to music at strange hours, his occasional revolver practice within doors, his weird and often malodorous scientific experiments, and the atmosphere of violence and danger which hung around him made him the very worst tenant in London. On the other hand, his payments were princely. I have no doubt that the house might have been purchased at the price which Holmes paid for his rooms during the years that I was with him. The landlady stood in the deepest awe and respect of him, and never dared to interfere with him, however outrageous his proceedings might seem. She was fond of him too, for he had a remarkable gentleness and courtesy in his dealings with women. He disliked and distrusted the sex, but he was always a chivalrous opponent. Knowing how genuine was her regard for him, I listened earnestly to her story when she came to my room in the second year of my married life and told me of the sad condition to which my poor friend was reduced. He's dying, Dr. Watson said she. For three days he has been sinking, and I doubt if he will last a day. He would not let me get a doctor. This morning, when I saw his bones sticking out of his face, and his great bright eyes looking at me, I could stand no more of it. With your leave or without it, Mr. Holmes, I am going for a doctor this very hour, said I. Let it be Watson, then, said he. I wouldn't waste an hour in coming to him, sir, or you may not see him alive. I was horrified, for I had heard nothing of his illness. I need not say that I rushed for my coat and my hat. As we drove back, I asked for details. There is little I can tell you, sir. He has been working at a case down at Rutherhithe, in an alley near the river, and he has brought this illness back with him. He took to his bed on Wednesday afternoon and has never moved since. For these three days, neither food nor drink has passed his lips. Good God! Why did you not call in a doctor? He wouldn't have it, sir. You know how masterful he is. I didn't dare to disobey him. But he's not long for this world, as you'll see for yourself the moment that you set eyes on him. He was indeed a deplorable spectacle. In the dim light of a foggy November day, the sick room was a gloomy spot, but it was that gaunt, wasted face staring at me from the bed which sent a chill to my heart. His eyes had the brightness of fever. There was a hectic flush upon either cheek, and dark crusts clung to his lips. The thin hands upon the coverlet twitched incessantly. His voice was croaking and spasmodic. He lay listlessly as I entered the room, but the sight of me brought a gleam of recognition to his eyes. Well, Watson, we seem to have fallen upon evil days, said he in a feeble voice, but with something of his old carelessness of manner. My dear fellow, I cried, approaching him. Stand back, stand right back, said he, with a sharp imperiousness which I had associated only with moments of crisis. If you approach me, Watson, I shall order you out of the house. But why? Because it is my desire. Is that not enough? Yes, Mrs. Hudson was right. He was more masterful than ever. 
It was pitiful, however, to see his exhaustion. I only wish to help, I explained. Exactly. You will help best by doing what you are told. Certainly, Holmes. He relaxed the austerity of his manner. You are not angry? He asked, gasping for breath. Poor devil! How could I be angry when I saw him lying in such a plight before me? It's for your own sake, Watson, he croaked. For my sake? I know what is the matter with me. It is a coolie disease from Sumatra, a thing that the Dutch know more about than we, though they have made little of it up to date. One thing only is certain. It is infallibly deadly, and it is horribly contagious. He spoke now with a feverish energy, the long hands twitching and jerking as he motioned me away. Contagious by touch, Watson. That's it, by touch. Keep your distance, and all is well. Good heavens, Holmes. Do you suppose that such a consideration weighs with me of an instant? It would not affect me in the case of a stranger. Do you imagine it would prevent me from doing my duty to so old a friend? Again I advanced but he repulsed me with a look of furious anger. If you will stand there, I will talk. If you do not, you must leave the room. I have so deep a respect for the extraordinary qualities of Holmes that I have always deferred to his wishes, even when I least understood them. But now all my professional instincts were aroused. Let him be my master elsewhere. I at least was his in a sick room. Holmes, said I, you are not yourself. A sick man is but a child, and so I will treat you. Whether you like it or not, I will examine your symptoms and treat you for them. He looked at me with venomous eyes. If I am to have a doctor, whether I will or not, let me at least have someone in whom I have confidence, said he. Then you have none in me? In your friendship, certainly. But facts are facts, Watson, and after all, you are only a general practitioner with very limited experience and mediocre qualifications. It is painful to have to say these things, but you leave me no choice. I was bitterly hurt. Such a remark is unworthy of you, Holmes. It shows me very clearly the state of your own nerves. But if you have no confidence in me, I would not intrude my services. Let me bring you Sir Jasper Meek, or Penrose Fisher, or any of the best men in London. But someone you must have, and that is final. If you think that I am going to stand here and see you die without either helping you myself, or bringing anyone else to help you, then you have mistaken your man. You mean well, Watson, said the sick man with something between a sob and a groan. Shall I demonstrate your own ignorance? What? Do you know, pray, of Tapanuli fever? What do you know of the black Formosa corruption? I have never heard of either. There are many problems of disease, many strange pathological possibilities in the East, Watson. He paused after each sentence to collect his failing strength. I have learned so much during some recent researches which have a medical criminal aspect. It was in the course of them that I contracted this complaint. You can do nothing. Possibly not, but I happen to know that Dr. Ainstree, the greatest living authority upon tropical disease, is now in London. All remonstrance is useless. I am going this instant to fetch him. I turned resolutely to the door. Never have I had such a shock. In an instant, with a tiger spring, the dying man had intercepted me. I heard the sharp snap of a twisted key. The next moment he had staggered back to his bed, exhausted and panting, after his one tremendous outflame of energy. You won't take the key from me by force, Watson. I've got you, my friend. Here you are, and here you will stay until I will otherwise. But I'll humour you. All this in little gasps, with terrible struggles for breath between. You've only my own good at heart. Of course, I know that very well. You shall have your way, but 
give me time to get my strength not now watson not now it's four o'clock at six you can go this is insanity holmes only two hours watson i promise you will go at six are you content to wait i seem to have no choice none in the world watson thank you i need no help in arranging the clothes you will please keep your distance now watson there is one other condition that i would make you will seek help not from the man you mention but from the one that i choose by all means the first three sensible words that you have uttered since you entered this room watson you will find some books over there i am somewhat exhausted i wonder how a battery feels when it pours electricity into a non-conductor at six watson we resume our conversation but it was destined to be resumed long before that hour and in circumstances which gave me a shock hardly second to that caused by his spring to the door i had stood for some minutes looking at the silent figure in the bed his face was almost covered by clothes and he appeared to be asleep then unable to settle down to reading i walked slowly round the room examining the pictures of celebrated criminals with which every wall was adorned finally in my aimless perambulation i came to the mantelpiece a litter of pipes tobacco pouches syringes pen knives revolver cartridges and other debris was scattered over it in the midst of these was a small black and white ivory box with a sliding lid it was a neat little thing and i had stretched out my hand to examine it more closely when it was a dreadful cry that he gave a yell which might have been heard down the street my skin went cold and my hair bristled at that horrible scream as i turned i caught a glimpse of a convulsed face and frantic eyes i stood paralyzed with the little box in my hand put it down down this instant watson this instant i say his head sank back upon the pillow and he gave a deep sigh of relief as i replaced the box upon the mantelpiece i hate to have my things touched watson you know that i hate it you fidget me beyond endurance you a doctor you are enough to drive a patient into an asylum sit down man and let me have my rest the incident left a most unpleasant impression upon my mind the violent and causeless excitement followed by this brutality of speech so far removed from his usual suavity showed me how deep was the disorganization of his mind of all ruins that of a noble mind is the most deplorable i sat in silent dejection until the stipulated time had passed he seemed to have been watching the clock as well as i for it was hardly six before he began to talk with the same feverish animation as before now watson said he have you any change in your pocket yes any silver a good deal how many half crowns i have five ah uh, too few too few how very unfortunate watson however such as they are you can put them in your watch pocket and all the rest of your money in your left trouser pocket thank you it will balance you so much better like that this was raving insanity he shuddered and again made a sound between a cough and a sob <coughs> you will now light the gas watson but you will be very careful that not for one instant shall it be more than half on i implore you to be careful watson thank you that is excellent no you need not draw the blind now you will have the kindness to place some letters and papers upon this table within my reach thank you now some of that litter from the mantelpiece excellent watson there is a sugar tongs there kindly raise that small ivory box with its assistance place it here 
among the papers. Good. You can now go and fetch Mr. Culverton Smith of 13 Lower Burke Street. To tell the truth, my desire to fetch a doctor had somewhat weakened, for poor Holmes was so obviously delirious that it seemed dangerous to leave him. However, he was as eager now to consult the person named as he had been obstinate in refusing. I never heard the name, said I. Possibly not, my good Watson. It may surprise you to know that the man upon earth who is best versed in this disease is not a medical man, but a planter. Mr. Culverton Smith is a well-known resident of Sumatra, now visiting London. An outbreak of the disease upon his plantation, which was distant from medical aid, caused him to study it himself with some far-reaching consequences. He is a very methodical person, and I did not desire you to start before six, because I was well aware that you would not find him in his study. If you could persuade him to come here and give us the benefit of his unique experience of this disease, the investigation of which has been his dearest hobby, I cannot doubt that he could help me. I gave Holmes's remarks as a consecutive whole, and I will not attempt to indicate how they were interrupted by gaspings for breath and those clutchings of his hands, which indicated the pain from which he was suffering. His appearance had changed for the worse during the few hours that I had been with him. Those hectic spots were more pronounced. The eyes shone more brightly out of darker hollows, and a cold sweat glimmered upon his brow. He still retained, however, the jaunty gallantry of his speech. To the last gasp he would always be the master. You will tell him exactly how you have left me, said he. You will convey the very impression which is in your own mind, a dying man, a dying and delirious man. Indeed, I cannot think why the whole bed of the ocean is not one solid mass of oysters. So prolific the creatures seem. Ah, oh, I am wandering. Strange how the brain controls the brain. What was I saying, Watson? My directions for Mr. Colbert and Smith. Ah, oh, yes, I remember. My life depends upon it. Plead with him, Watson. There is no good feeling between us. His nephew, Watson. I had suspicion of foul play, and I allowed him to see it. The boy died horribly. He has a grudge against me. You will soften him, Watson. Beg him, pray him, get him here by any means. He can save me, only he. I will bring him in a cab if I have to carry him down to it. You will do nothing of the sort. You will persuade him to come, and then you will return in front of him. Make any excuse so as not to come with him. Don't forget, Watson, you won't fail me. You never did fail me. No doubt there are natural enemies which limit the increase of the creatures. You and I, Watson, we have done our part. Shall the world then be overrun by oysters? No, no, horrible. You'll convey all that is in your mind. I left him full in the image of this magnificent intellect babbling like a foolish child. He had handed me the key, and with a happy thought I took it with me, lest he should lock himself in. Mrs. Hudson was waiting, trembling and weeping, in the passage. Behind me, as I passed from the flat, I heard Holmes's high, thin voice in some delirious chant. Below, as I stood whistling for a cab, a man came on me through the fog. How is Mr. Holmes, sir? He asked. It was an old acquaintance, Inspector Morton of Scotland Yard, dressed in unofficial tweeds. He is very ill, I answered. He looked at me in a most singular fashion. Had it not been too fiendish, I could have imagined that the gleam of the fanlight showed exultation in his face. I heard some rumour of it, said he. The cab had driven up, and I left him. Lower Burke Street proved to be a line of fine houses, 
lying in the vague borderland between Notting Hill and Kensington. The particular one at which my cabman pulled up had an air of smug and demure respectability in its old-fashioned iron railings, its massive folding door, and its shining brasswork. All was in keeping with the solemn butler, who appeared framed in the pink radiance of a tinted electrical light behind him. Yes, Mr. Calverton Smith is in, Dr. Watson. Very good, sir. I will take up your card. My humble name and title did not appear to impress Mr. Culverton Smith. Through the half-open door, I heard a high, petulant, penetrating voice. Who is this person? What does he want? Dear me, Stables, how often have I said that I am not to be disturbed in my hours of study? There came a gentle flow of soothing explanation from the butler. Well, I won't see him, Stables. I can't have my work interrupted like this. I am not at home. Say so. Tell him to come in the morning if he really must see me. Again the gentle murmur. Well, well, give him that message. He can come in the morning, or he can stay away. My work must not be hindered. I thought of Holmes tossing upon his bed of sickness, and counting the minutes, perhaps, until I could bring help to him. It was not a time to stand upon ceremony. His life depended upon my promptness. Before the apologetic butler had delivered his message, I had pushed past him and was in the room. With a shrill cry of anger, a man rose from a reclining chair beside the fire. I saw a great yellow face, coarse-grained and greasy, with heavy double chin and two sullen, menacing grey eyes, which glared at me from under tufted and sandy brows. A high, bald head had a small velvet smoking cap poised coquettishly upon one side of its pink curve. The skull was of enormous capacity, and yet, as I looked down, I saw to my amazement that the figure of the man was small and frail, twisted in the shoulders and back like one who had suffered from rickets in his childhood. "'What's this?' he cried in a high, screaming voice. "'What is the meaning of this intrusion?' Didn't I send you word that I would see you tomorrow morning? I am sorry, said I, but the matter cannot be delayed. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. The mention of my friend's name had an extraordinary effect upon the little man. The look of anger passed in an instant from his face. His features became tense and alert. Have you come from Holmes? He asked. I have just left him. What about Holmes? How is he? He is desperately ill. That is why I have come. The man motioned me to a chair and turned to resume his own. As he did so, I caught a glimpse of his face in the mirror over the mantelpiece. I could have sworn that it was set in a malicious and abominable smile. Yet I persuaded myself that it must have been some nervous contraction which I had surprised for he turned to me an instant later with genuine concern upon his features. I am sorry to hear this, said he. I only know Mr. Holmes through some business dealings which we have had, but I have every respect for his talents and his character. He is an amateur of crime, as I am of disease. For him, the villain. For me, the microbe. There are my prisons. He continued, pointing to a row of bottles and jars, which stood upon a side table. Among those gelatin cultivations, some of the very worst offenders in the world are now doing time. It was on account of your special knowledge that Mr. Holmes desired to see you. He has a high opinion of you, and thought that you were the one man in London who could help him. The little man started, and the jaunty smoking cap slid to the floor. Why? he asked. Why should Mr. Holmes think that I could help him in his trouble? Because of your knowledge of Eastern diseases. But why should he think that the disease which he has contracted is Eastern? Because, in some professional inquiry, he has been working among Chinese sailors down in the docks. Mr. Culverton Smith smiled pleasantly and picked up his smoking cap. Oh, that's it, is it? said he. I trust the matter is not so grave as you suppose. How long has he been ill? About three days. 
Is he delirious? Occasionally. Tut, tut. This sounds serious. It would be inhuman not to answer his call. I very much resent any interruption to my work, Dr. Watson, but this case is certainly exceptional. I will come with you at once. I remembered Holmes's injunction. I have another appointment, said I. Very good. I will go alone. I have a note of Mr. Holmes' address. You can rely upon my being there within half an hour at most. It was with a sinking heart that I re-entered Holmes's bedroom. For all that I knew, the worst might have happened in my absence. To my enormous relief, he had greatly improved in the interval. His appearance was as ghastly as ever, but all trace of delirium had left him, and he spoke in a feeble voice, it is true, but with even more than his usual crispness and lucidity. Well, did you see him, Watson? Yes, he is coming. Admirable, Watson, admirable. You are the best of messengers. He wished to return with me. That would never do, Watson. That would be obviously impossible. Did he ask what ailed me? I told him about the Chinese in the East End. Exactly. Well, Watson, you have done all that a good friend could. You can now disappear from the scene. I must wait and hear his opinion, Holmes. Of course you must. But I have reasons to suppose that this opinion would be very much more frank and valuable if he imagines that we are alone. There is just room behind the head of my bed, Watson. My dear Holmes. I fear there is no alternative, Watson. The room does not lend itself to concealment, which is as well, as it is the less likely to arouse suspicion. But just there, Watson, I fancy that it could be done. Suddenly he sat up with a rigid intentness upon his haggard face. There are the wheels, Watson. Quick, man, if you love me, and don't budge, whatever happens. Whatever happens, do you hear? Don't speak, don't move, just listen with all your ears. Then in an instant his sudden access of strength departed, and his masterful, purposeful talk droned away into the low, vague murmurings of a semi-delirious man. From the hiding-place into which I had been so swiftly hustled, I heard the footfalls upon the stair, with the opening and closing of the bedroom door. Then, to my surprise, there came a long silence, broken only by the heavy breathings and gaspings of the sick man. I could imagine that our visitor was standing by the bedside and looking down at the sufferer. At last that strange hush was broken. Holmes! He cried. Holmes! In the insistent tones of one who awakens a sleeper. Can't you hear me, Holmes? There was a rustling, as if he had shaken the sick man roughly by the shoulder. Is that you, Mr. Smith? Holmes whispered. I hardly dared hope that you would come. The other laughed. <laughs> I should imagine not, he said. And yet, you see, I am here. Coals of fire, Holmes. Coals of fire. It is very good of you, very noble of you. I appreciate your special knowledge. Our visitor sniggered. <laughs> you do. You are, fortunately, the only man in London who does. Do you know what is the matter with you? The same, said Holmes. Ah, you recognize the symptoms? Only too well. Well, I shouldn't be surprised, Holmes. I shouldn't be surprised if it were the same. A bad lookout for you if it is. Poor Victor was a dead man on the fourth day. A strong, hearty young fellow. It was certainly, as you said, very surprising that he should have contracted an out-of-the-way Asiatic disease in the heart of London. A disease, too, of which I had made such a very special study. Singular coincidence, Holmes. Very smart of you to notice it. But uh, rather uncharitable to suggest that it was cause and effect. I knew that you did it. Oh, you did, did you? Well, you couldn't prove it, anyhow. But what do you think of yourself spreading reports about me like that? 
and then crawling to me for help the moment you are in trouble. What sort of a game is that, eh? I heard the rasping, laboured breathing of the sick man. Give me the water, he gasped. You're precious near your end, my friend. But I don't want you to go until I've had a word with you. That's why I give you water. There, don't slop it about. That's right. Can you understand what I say? Holmes groaned. Oh, do what you can for me. Let bygones be bygones, he whispered. I'll put the words out of my head. I swear I will. Only cure me, and I'll forget it. Forget what? Well, about Victor Savage's death. You as good as admitted, just now, that you had done it. I'll forget it. You can forget it, or remember it, just as you like. I don't see you in the witness box. Quite another shaped box, my good Holmes, I assure you. It matters nothing to me that you should know how my nephew died. <laughs> it's not him we are talking about. It's you. Yes, yes. The fellow who came for me, I've forgotten his name, said that you contracted it down in the East End among the sailors. I could only account for it, so... You are proud of your brains, Holmes, are you not? Think yourself smart, don't you? You came across someone who is smarter this time. Now cast your mind back, Holmes. Can you think of no other way you could have got this thing? I can't think. My mind is gone. For heaven's sake, help me. Yes, I will help you. I'll help you understand just where you are and how you got there. I'd like you to know before you die. Give me something to ease my pain. Painful, is it? Yes. The coolies used to do some squealing in the end. Takes you as a cramp, I fancy. Yes, yes, it is cramp. Well, you can hear what I say anyhow. Listen now. Can you remember any unusual incident in your life? Just about the time your symptoms began? No, no, nothing. Think again. I'm too ill to think. Well, then I'll help you. Did anything come by post? By post? A box, by chance? I'm fainting. I'm gone. Listen, Holmes. There was a sound as if he was shaking the dying man, and it was all that I could do to hold myself quiet in my hiding place. You must hear me. You shall hear me. Do you remember a box, an ivory box? It came on Wednesday. You opened it. Do you remember? Yes, yes, I opened it. There was a sharp spring inside it, some joke. It was no joke, as you will find to your cost. You fool. You would have it, and you have got it. Who asked you to cross my path? If you had left me alone, I would not have hurt you. I remember, Holmes gasped. The spring. It drew blood. This box. This on the table. The very one, by George. And it may as well leave the room in my pocket. There goes your last shred of evidence. But you have the truth now, Holmes, and you can die with the knowledge that I killed you. You knew too much of the fate of Victor Savage, so I have sent you to share it. You are very near your end, Holmes. I will sit here, and I will watch you die. Holmes' voice had sunk to an almost inaudible whisper. What is that? said Smith. Turn up the gas. Ah, the shadows begin to fall, do they? Yes, I will turn it up, that I may see you the better. He crossed the room, and the light suddenly brightened. Is there any other little service that I can do you, my friend? A match and a cigarette. I nearly called out in my joy and my amazement. He was speaking in his natural voice. A little weak, perhaps but the very voice I knew. There was a long pause, 
and I felt that Colwoodson Smith was standing in silent amazement, looking down at his companion. What's the meaning of this? I heard him say at last in a dry, rattling tone. The best way of successfully acting a part is to be it, said Holmes. I give you my word that for three days I have tasted neither food nor drink until you were good enough to pour me out that glass of water. But it is the tobacco which I find most irksome. Ah, here are some cigarettes. I heard the striking of a match. That is very much better. Hello, hello, do I hear the step of a friend? There were footfalls outside. The door opened, and Inspector Morton appeared. All is in order, and this is your man, said Holmes. The officer gave the usual cautions. I arrest you on the charge of the murder of one Victor Savage, he concluded. And you might add of the attempted murder of one Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> remarked my friend with a chuckle. To save an invalid trouble, Inspector, Mr. Culverton Smith was good enough to give our signal by turning up the gas. By the way, the prisoner has a small box in the right-hand pocket of his coat, which it would be as well to remove. Thank you. I would handle it gingerly if I were you. Put it down here. It may play its part in the trial. There was a sudden rush and a scuffle, followed by the clash of iron and a cry of pain. You'll only get yourself hurt, said the inspector. Stand still, will you? There was the click of the closing handcuffs. A nice trap! cried the high, snarling voice. It will bring you into the dark, Holmes, not me. He asked me to come here, to cure him. I was sorry for him, and I came. Now he will pretend, no doubt, that I have said anything which he may invent, which will corroborate his insane suspicions. You can lie as you like, Holmes. My word is always as good as yours. Good heavens, cried Holmes. I had totally forgotten him. My dear Watson, I owe you a thousand apologies to think that I should have overlooked you. I need not introduce you to Mr. Culverton Smith, since I understand that you met somewhat earlier in the evening. Have you the cab below? I will follow you when I am dressed, for I may be of some use at the station. I never needed it more, said Holmes, as he refreshed himself with a glass of claret and some biscuits in the intervals of his toilet. However, as you know, my habits are irregular, and such a feat means less to me than to most men. It was very essential that I should impress Mrs. Hudson with the reality of my condition, since she was to convey it to you, and you in turn to him. You won't be offended, Watson. You will realize that among your many talents dissimulation finds no place, and that if you had shared my secret, you would never have been able to impress Smith with the urgent necessity of his presence, which was the vital point of the whole scheme. Knowing his vindictive nature, I was perfectly certain that he would come to look upon his handiwork. But your appearance, Holmes, your ghastly face. Three days of absolute fast does not improve one's beauty, Watson. For the rest, there is nothing which a sponge may not cure. With Vaseline upon one's forehead... Belladonna in one's eyes, rouge over the cheekbones, and crusts of beeswax round one's lips. A very satisfying effect can be produced. Malingering is a subject upon which I have sometimes thought of writing a monograph. A little occasional talk about half-crowns, oysters, or any other extraneous subject produces a pleasing effect of delirium. But why would you not let me near you, since there was, in truth, no infection? Can you ask, my dear Watson? Do you imagine that I have no respect for your medical talents? Could I fancy that your astute judgment would pass a dying man who, however weak, had no rise of pulse or temperature? At four yards I could deceive you. If I failed to do so, who would bring my smith within my grasp? No, Watson, I would not touch that box. You can just see if you look at it sideways where the sharp spring, like a viper's tooth, emerges as you open it. I dare say it was by some such device that poor Savage, who stood between this monster and a reversion, 
was done to death. My correspondence, however, is, as you know, a varied one, and I am somewhat upon my guard against any packages which reach me. It was clear to me, however, that by pretending that he had really succeeded in his design, I might surprise a confession. That pretense I have carried out with the thoroughness of the true artist. Thank you, Watson. You must help me on with my coat. When we have finished at the police station, I think that something nutritious at Simpson's would not be out of place. End of The Dying Detective An Unexpected Result by Edward P. Rowe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Like Many Waters. Will Munson, read by Chuck Williamson. Jack Ackland, read by Andrew Nixon. Eva Van Tyne, read by the story girl mrs alston read by abai eva's aunt read by phone a friend read by sonia half a dozen voices read by larry wilson an unexpected result jack she played with me deliberately heartlessly I can never forgive her. In that case, Will, I congratulate you. Such a girl isn't worth a second thought, and you've made a happy escape. No congratulations, if you please. You can talk coolly, because in regard to such matters you are cool, and I may add a trifle cold. Ambition is your mistress, and a musty law book has more attractions for you than any woman living. I am not so tempered. I am subject to the general law of nature, and a woman's love and sympathy are essential to success in my life and work. That's all right, but there are as good fish. Oh, have done with your trite nonsense. Interrupted Will Munson impatiently. I'd consult you on a point of law in preference to most of the greybeards, but... I was a fool to speak of this affair, and yet as my most intimate friend. Come, Will. I am not unfeeling. And John Ackland rose and put his hand on his friend's shoulder. I admit that the subject is remote from my line of thought and wholly beyond my experience. If the affair is so serious, I shall take it to heart. Serious? Is it a slight thing to be crippled for life oh come now said ackland giving his friend a hearty and encouraging thump you are sound in mind and limb what matters a scratch on the heart to a man not twenty-five very well i'll say no more about it when i need a lawyer i'll come to you good-bye i sail for brazil in the morning Will, sit down and look me in the eyes, said Ackland decisively. Will, forgive me, you are in trouble. A man's eyes usually tell me more than all his words, and I don't like the expression of yours. There is yellow fever in Brazil. I know it, was the careless reply. What excuse have you for going? Business complications have arisen there, and I promptly volunteered to go. My employers were kind enough to hesitate and warn me, and to say that they could send a man less valuable to them, but I soon overcame their objections. That is your excuse for going, the reason I see in your eyes. You are reckless, Will. I have reason to be. I can't agree with you, but I feel for you all the same. Tell me all about it, for this is sad news to me. I had hoped to join you on the beach in a few days, and to spend August with you and my cousin. 
I confess I am beginning to feel exceedingly vindictive towards this pretty little monster, and if any harm comes to you, I shall be savage enough to scalp her. The harm has come already, Jack. I'm hit hard. She showed me a mirage of happiness that has made my present world a desert. I am reckless, I'm desperate. You may think it is weak and unmanly, but you don't know anything about it. Time or the fever may cure me, but now I am bankrupt in all that gives value to life. A woman with an art so consummate that it seemed artless deliberately evoked the best there was in me, then threw it away as indifferently as a cast-off glove. Tell me how it came about. How can I tell you? How can I, in cold blood, recall glances, words, intonations, the pressure of a hand that seemed alive with reciprocal feeling? In addition to her beauty, she had the irresistible charm of fascination. I was wary at first, but she angled for me with a skill that would have disarmed any man who did not believe in the inherent falseness of woman. The children in the house idolized her, and I have great faith in a child's intuitions. Oh, that was only a part of her guile, said Ackland frowningly. <sighs> Probably. At any rate, she has taken all the color and zest out of my life. I wish someone could pay her back in her own coin. I don't suppose she has a heart, but I wish her vanity might be wounded in a way that would teach her a lesson never to be forgotten. It certainly would be a well-deserved retribution, said Ackland musingly. Jack, you are the one of all the world to administer the punishment. I don't believe a woman's smiles ever quickened your pulse one beat. You are right, Will. It is my cold-bloodedness to put your thought in plain English that will prove your best ally. I only hope I am not leading you into danger. You will need an Indian stoicism. Bah! I may fail ignominiously and find her vanity invulnerable. But I pledge you my word that I will avenge you, if it be within the compass of my skill. My cousin, Mrs. Olsen, may prove a useful ally. I think you wrote me that the name of this siren was Eva Van Tyne? Yes. I only wish she had the rudiments of a heart, so that she might feel in a faint far-off way a, a little of the pain she has inflicted on me. Don't let her make you falter or grow remorseful, Jack. Remember that you have given a pledge to one who may be dead before you can fulfill it. Acklin said farewell to his friend with a fear that he might never see him again, and a few days later found himself at a New England seaside resort with a relentless purpose lurking in his dark eyes. Mrs. Alston did unconsciously prove a useful ally, for her wealth and elegance gave her unusual prestige in the house, and in joining her party, Ackland achieved immediately all the social recognition he desired. While strolling with this lady on the piazza, he observed the object of his quest, and was at once compelled to make more allowance than he had done hitherto for his friend's discomfiture. Two or three children were leaning over the young girl's chair, and she was amusing them by some clever caricatures. She was not so interested, however, but that she soon noted the newcomer, and bestowed upon him from time to time curious and furtive glances. That these were not returned seemed to occasion her some surprise, for she was not accustomed to be so utterly ignored, even by a stranger. A little later Ackland saw her consulting the hotel register. I have at least awakened her curiosity, he thought. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to ask me who that pretty girl is, 
said Mrs. Alston, laughing. You do indeed exceed all men in indifference to women. I know all about that girl, was the grim reply. She has played the very deuce with my friend Munson. Yes, replied Mrs. Alston indignantly. It was the most shameful piece of coquetry I ever saw. She is a puzzle to me. To the children and the old people in the house she is consideration and kindness itself. But she appears to regard men of your years as legitimate game and is perfectly remorseless. So beware. She is dangerous, invulnerable as you imagine yourself to be. She will practice her wiles upon you if you give her half a chance, and her art has much more than her pretty face to enforce it. She is unusually clever. Ackland's slight shrug was so contemptuous that his cousin was nettled, and she thought, I wish the girl could disturb his complacent equanimity just a little. It vexes one to see a man so indifferent. It's a slight to a woman. And she determined to give Miss Van Tyne the vantage ground of an introduction at the first opportunity. And this occurred before the evening was over. To her surprise, Ackland entered into an extended conversation with the enemy. Well, she thought, if he begins in this style, there will soon be another victim. Miss Van Tyne can talk to as bright a man as he is and hold her own. Meanwhile, she will assail him in a hundred covert ways. Out of regard for his friend, he should have shown some disapproval for her. But there he sits, quietly talking in the publicity of the parlor. Mrs. Elston, said a friend at her elbow, you ought to forewarn your cousin and tell him of Mr. Munson's fate. Oh, he knows all about Mr. Munson, was her reply. Indeed, the latter is his most intimate friend. I suppose my cousin is indulging in a little natural curiosity concerning this destroyer of masculine peace, and if ever a man could do so in safety, he can. Why so? Well, I never knew so unsusceptible a man. With the exception of a few of his relatives, he has never cared for ladies' society. Mrs. Alston was far astray in supposing that curiosity was Ackland's motive in his rather prolonged conversation with Miss Van Tyne. It was simply part of his tactics, for he proposed to waste no time in skirmishing or in guarded and gradual approaches. He would cross weapons at once and secure his object by a sharp and aggressive campaign. His object was to obtain immediately some idea of the caliber of the girl's mind, and in this respect he was agreeably surprised, for while giving little evidence of thorough education, she was unusually intelligent and exceedingly quick in her perceptions. He soon learned also that she was gifted with more than woman's customary intuition, that she was watching his face closely for meanings that he might not choose to express in words or else to conceal by his language. While he feared that his task would be far more difficult than he expected and that he would have to be extremely guarded in order not to reveal his design, he was glad to learn that the foe was worthy of his steel. Meanwhile, her ability and self-reliance banished all compunction. He had no scruples in humbling the pride of a woman who was at once so proud, so heartless, and so clever. Nor would the effort be wearisome, for she had proved herself both amusing and interesting. He might enjoy it quite as much as an intricate law case. Even prejudiced Ackland, as he saw her occasionally on the following day, was compelled to admit that she was more than pretty. Her features were neither regular nor faultless. Her mouth was too large to be perfect, and her nose was not Grecian but her eyes were peculiarly fine and illumined her face, whose chief charm lay in its power of expression. If she chose, almost all her thoughts and feelings could find their reflex there. The trouble was that she could as readily mask her thought and express what she did not feel. Her eyes were of the darkest blue, and her hair seemed light in contrast. It was evident that she had studied grace so thoroughly that her manner and carriage appeared unstudied and natural. She never seemed self-conscious, and yet no one had ever seen her in an ungainly posture, or had known her to make an awkward gesture. 
This grace, however, like a finished style in writing, was tinged so strongly with her own individuality that it appeared original as compared with the fashionable monotony which characterized the manners of so many of her age. She could not have been much more than twenty, and yet, as Mrs. Alston took pains to inform her cousin, she had long been in society, adding, Its homage is her breath of life, and from all I hear your friend Munson has had many predecessors. Be on your guard. Your solicitude on my behalf is quite touching, he replied. Who is this fair buccaneer that has made so many wrecks and exacts so heavy a revenue from society? Who has the care of her, and what are her antecedents? She is an orphan, and possessed, I am told, of considerable property in her own name. A forceless, nerveless maiden aunt is about the only antecedent we see much of. Her guardian has been here once or twice, but practically she's independent. Miss Van Tyne's efforts to learn something concerning Ackland were apparently quite as casual and indifferent, and yet were made with utmost skill. She knew that Mrs. Alston's friend was something of a gossip, and she led her to speak of the subject of her thoughts with an indirect finesse that would have amused the young man exceedingly could he have been an unobserved witness. When she learned that he was Mr. Munson's intimate friend, and that he was aware of her treatment of the latter, she was somewhat disconcerted. One so forewarned might not become an easy prey. But the additional fact that he was almost a woman-hater put her upon her mettle at once, and she felt that here was a chance for a conquest such as she had never made before. She now believed that she had discovered the key to his indifference. He was ready enough to amuse himself with her as a clever woman, but knew her too well to bestow upon her even a friendly thought. If I can bring him to my feet, it will be a triumph indeed. She murmured exultantly. And at my feet he shall be, if he gives me half a chance. Seemingly he gave her every chance that she could desire, and while he scarcely made any effort to seek her society, she noted with secret satisfaction that he often appeared as if accidentally near her and that he ever made it the easiest and most natural thing in the world for her to join him. His conversation was often as gay and unconventional as she would wish, but she seldom failed to detect in it an uncomfortable element of satire and irony. He always left her dissatisfied with herself, and with a depressing consciousness that she had made no impression upon him. His conquest grew into an absorbing desire, and she unobtrusively brought to bear upon him every art and fascination that she possessed. Her toilets were as exquisite as they were simple. The children were made to idolize her more than ever, but Ackland was candid enough to admit that this was not all guile on her part, for she was evidently in sympathy with the little people, who can rarely be imposed upon by any amount of false interest. Indeed, he saw no reason to doubt that she abounded in good nature toward all except the natural objects of her ruling passion, but the very skill and deliberateness with which she sought to gratify this passion greatly increased his vindictive feeling. He saw how naturally and completely his friend had been deceived, and how exquisite must have been the hopes and anticipations so falsely raised. Therefore he smiled more grimly at the close of each succeeding day and was more than ever bent upon the accomplishment of his purpose. At length Miss Van Tyne changed her tactics, and grew quite oblivious to Ackland's presence in the house, but she found him apparently too indifferent to observe the fact. She then permitted one of her several admirers to become devoted. Ackland did not offer the protest of even a glance. He stood, as it were, just where she had left him, ready for an occasional chat, stroll, or excursion, if the affair came about naturally and without much effort on his part she found that she could neither induce him to seek her nor annoy him by an indifference which she meant should be more marked than his own some little time after there came a windy day when the surf was so heavy that there were but few bathers ackland was a good swimmer and took his plunge as usual he was leaving the water when miss van tyne ran down the beach and was about to dart through the breakers in her wonted fearless style be careful, he said to her. The undertow is strong, and the man who has charge of the bathing is ill and not here. 
the tide is changing. In fact, running out already, I believe. But she would not even look at him, much less answer. As there were other gentlemen present, he started for his bathhouse, but had proceeded but a little way up the beach, before a cry brought him to the water's edge instantly. Something is wrong with Miss Van Tyne, cried half a dozen voices. She ventured out recklessly, and it seems as if she couldn't get back. At that moment her form rose on the crest of a wave, and above the thunder of the surf came her faint cry. Help! The other bathers stood irresolute, for she was dangerously far out, and the tide had evidently turned. Ackland, on the contrary, dashed through the breakers, and then, in his efforts for speed, dived through the waves nearest to the shore. When he reached the place where he expected to find her, he saw nothing for a moment or two but great crested billows that every moment were increasing in height under the rising wind. For a moment he feared that she had perished, and the thought that the beautiful creature had met her death so suddenly and awfully made him almost sick and faint. An instant later, however, a wave threw her up from the trough of the sea into full vision somewhat on his right, and a few strong strokes brought him to her side. Oh, save me! she gasped. Don't cling to me, he said sternly. Do as I bid you. Strike out for the shore if you are able. If not, lie on your back and float. She did the latter, for now that aid had reached her, she apparently recovered from her panic and was perfectly tractable. He placed his left hand under her and struck out quietly, aware that the least excitement causing exhaustion on his part might cost both of them their lives. As they approached the shore, a rope was thrown to them, and Ackland, who felt his strength giving way, seized it desperately. He passed his arm around his companion with a grasp that almost made her breathless and they were dragged half suffocated through the water until strong hands on either side rushed them through the breakers. Miss Van Tyne for a moment or two stood dazed and panting, then disengaged herself from the rather warm support of the devoted admirer whom she had tried to play against Ackland, and tried to walk, but after a few uncertain steps fell senseless on the sand, thus for the moment drawing to herself the attention of the increasing throng. Ackland, glad to escape notice, was staggering off to his bathhouse, when several ladies, more mindful of his part in the affair than the men had been, overtook him with a fire of questions and plaudits. Please leave me alone, he said almost savagely, without looking around. What a bear he is! Anyone else would have been a little complacent over such an exploit they chorused, as they followed the unconscious girl, who was now being carried to the hotel. Ackland locked the door of his little apartment and sank panting on the bench. Maledictions on her, he muttered. At one time there was a better chance of her being fatal to me than to Munson, with his yellow fever tragedy in prospect. Her recklessness today was perfectly insane. If she tries it again, she may drown for all that I care, or at least ought to care. His anger appeared to act like a tonic, and he was soon ready to return to the house. A dozen sprang forward to congratulate him, but they found such impatience and annoyance at all reference to the affair, that with many surmises the topic was dropped. You are a queer fellow, remarked his privileged cousin, as he took her out to dinner. Why don't you let people speak naturally about the matter? Or rather, why don't you pose as the hero of the occasion? Because the whole affair was most unnatural, and I am deeply incensed. In a case of necessity, I am ready to risk my life, although it has unusual attractions for me. But I'm no melodramatic hero looking for adventures. What necessity was there in this case? It is the old story of Munson over again in another guise. The act was that of an inconsiderate, heartless woman who follows her impulses and inclinations, no matter what may be the consequences. After a moment he added less indignantly. I must give her credit for one thing, angry as I am. She behaved well in the water, otherwise she would have drowned me. She is not a fool. Most women would have drowned you. 
She is indeed not a fool, therefore she's the more to blame. If she is ever so reckless again, may I be asleep in my room. Of course, one can't stand by and see a woman drown, no matter who or what she is. Jack, what made her so reckless? Mrs. Austin asked, with a sudden intelligence lighting up her face. Hang it all! How should I know? What made her torture Munson? She follows her own impulses, and they are not always conducive to anyone's well-being, not even her own. Mark my words, she has never shown this kind of recklessness before. Oh yes, she has. She was running her horse to death the other hot morning and nearly trampled on a child. And he told of an unexpected encounter while he was taking a rather extended ramble. Well, exclaimed Mrs. Austin, smiling significantly, I think I understand her symptoms better than you do. If you are as cold-blooded as you seem, I may have to interfere. Oh, bah, he answered impatiently. Pardon me but I should despise myself forever should I become sentimental, knowing what I do. Jack, had you no compunctions when fearing that such a beautiful girl might perish? We are going to have an awful night. Hear the wind whistle and moan, and the sky is already black with clouds. The roar of the surface grows louder every hour. Think of that lovely form being out in those black, angry waves, darted at and preyed upon by horrible, slimy monsters. Oh, it fairly makes my flesh creep. And mine too, he said, with a strong gesture of disgust. Especially when I remember that I should have kept her company, for of course I could not return without her. I confess that when at first I could not find her, I was fairly sick at the thought of her fate. But remember how uncalled for it all was. Quite as much so as that poor Will Manson is on his way to die with the yellow fever, like enough. Jack, said his cousin affectionately, laying her hand on his arm. Blessings on your courage today. If what might have happened so easily had occurred, I could have never looked upon the sea again without a shudder. I should have been tormented by a horrible memory all my life. It was brave and noble. Oh, hush, he said angrily. I won't hear another word about it, even from you. I'm not brave and noble. I went because I was compelled to go. I hated to go. I hate the girl, and have more reason now than ever. If we had both drowned, no doubt there would have been less trouble in the world. There would have been one lawyer the less, and a coquette extinguished. Now we shall both prey on society, in our different ways, indefinitely. Jack, you're in an awful mood today. I am. Never was in a worse. Having so narrowly escaped death, you ought to be subdued and grateful. On the contrary, I am inclined to profanity. Excuse me, don't wish any dessert. I'll try a walk and a cigar. You will now be glad to be rid of me on any terms. Stay, Jack. See, Miss Van Tyne has so far recovered as to come down. She looked unutterable things at you as she entered. Of course she did. Very few of her thoughts concerning me or the other young men would sound well if uttered. Tell your friends to let this topic alone, or I shall be rude to them and without a glance toward the girl he had rescued, he left the dining-room. "'Well, well,' murmured Mrs. Austin. "'I never saw Jack in such a mood before. It is quite as unaccountable as Miss Tyne's recklessness. I wonder what is the matter with him?' Ackland was speedily driven back from his walk by the rain, which fact he did not regret, for he found himself exhausted and depressed. Seeking a retired piazza in order to be alone, he sat down with his hat drawn over his eyes and smoked furiously. Before very long, however, he was startled out of a painful reverie by a timid voice saying, Mr. Ackland, won't you permit me to thank you? 
he rose miss van tyne stood before him with outstretched hand he did not notice it but bowing coldly said please consider that you have thanked me and let the subject drop do not be so harsh with me she pleaded i cannot help it if you are mr ackland you saved my life possibly and possibly you think that it is scarcely worth saving possibly your own conscience suggested that thought to you you are heartless she burst out indignantly he began to laugh that's a droll charge for you to make he said she looked at him steadfastly for a moment and then murmured you are thinking of your friend mr munson that would be quite natural how many more can you think of you are indeed unrelenting she faltered tears coming into her eyes but i cannot forget that but for you i should now be out there and she indicated the sea by a gesture then covered her face with her hands and shuddered do not feel under obligations i should have been compelled to do as much for any human being you seem to forget that i stood an even chance of being out there with you and that there was no more need of the risk than there was that my best friend's life should be blight you you out there she cried springing toward him and pointing to the sea certainly you cannot suppose that having once found you i could come ashore without you as it was my strength was rapidly giving away and were it not for the rope oh, forgive me she cried passionately seizing his hand in spite of him it never entered my mind that you could drown i somehow felt that nothing could harm you i was reckless i didn't know what i was doing i don't understand myself any more please please forgive me or i shall not sleep tonight certainly he said lightly if you will not refer to our little episode again please don't speak in that way she sighed turning away i have complied with your request i suppose i must be content she resumed sadly then turning her head slowly toward him she added hesitatingly will you forgive me for for treating your friend no he replied with such stern emphasis that she shrank from him and trembled you are indeed heartless she faltered as she turned to leave him miss van tyne he said indignantly twice you have charged me with being heartless your voice and manner indicate that I would be unnatural and unworthy of respect were I what you charge. In the name of all that's rational, what does this word heartless mean to you? Where was your heart when you sent my friend away, so wretched and humbled that he is virtually seeking the death from which you are so glad to escape? I did not love him, she protested faintly. He laughed bitterly and continued love that's a word which i believe has no meaning for you at all but it had for him you are a remarkably clever woman miss van tyne you have brains in abundance see i do you justice what is more you are beautiful and can be so fascinating that a man who believed in you might easily worship you you made him believe in you you tried to beguile me into a condition that with my nature would be ruin indeed. You never had the baby plea of a silly, shallow woman. I took pains to find that out the first evening we met. In your art of beguiling an honest, trusting man, you were as perfect as you were remorseless. And you understood exactly what you were doing. For a time she seemed overwhelmed by his lava-like torrent of words, and stood with bowed head and shrinking, trembling form. But when he ceased she turned to him and said bitterly and emphatically, I did not understand what I was doing. 
Nor would my brain have taught me were I all intellect like yourself. I half wish you had left me to drown. And with a slight despairing gesture she turned away and did not look back. Hacklin's face lighted up with a sudden flash of intelligence and deep feeling. He started to recall her, hesitated, and watched her earnestly until she disappeared. Then looking out on the scowling ocean, he took off his hat and exclaimed in a deep, low tone, By all that's divine, can this be? Is it possible that through the suffering of her own awakening heart, she is learning to know the pain she has given to others? Should this be true? The affair is taking an entirely new aspect, and Munson will be avenged as neither of us ever dreamed would be possible. He resumed his old position and thought long and deeply, then rejoined his cousin, who was somewhat surprised to find that his bitter mood had given place to his former composure. How is this, Jack? she asked. As the storm grows wilder without, you become more serene. Only trying to make amends for my former bearishness, he said carelessly, but with a little rising color. I don't understand you at all, she continued discontentedly. I saw you sulking in that out-of-the-way corner, and I saw Miss Van Tyne approach you hesitatingly and timidly, with the purpose, no doubt, of thanking you. Of course I did not stay to watch, but a little later I met Miss Van Tyne, and she looked white and rigid. She has not left her room since. You take a great interest in Miss Van Tyne. It is well you are not in my place. I half wish I was and had your chances. You are more pitiless than the waves from which you saved her. I can't help being just what I am, he said coldly. Good night. And he too disappeared for the rest of the evening. The rain continued to fall in blinding torrents, and the building fairly trembled under the violence of the wind. The guests drew together in the lighted rooms, and sought by varied amusements to pass the time until the fierceness of the storm abated, few caring to retire while the uproar of the elements was so great. At last, as the storm passed away, and the late rising moon threw a sickly gleam on the tumultuous waters, Eva looked from her window with sleepless eyes, thinking sadly and bitterly of the past and future. Suddenly a dark figure appeared on the beach in the track of the moonlight. She snatched at an opera glass, but could not recognize the solitary form. The thought would come, however, that it was Ackland, and if it were, what were his thoughts, and what place had she in them? Why was he watching so near the spot that might have been their burial place? At least he shall not think that I can stolidly sleep after what has occurred she thought, and she turned up her light, opened her window, and sat down by it again. Whoever the unseasonable rambler might be, he appeared to recognize the gleam from her window, for he walked hastily down the beach and disappeared. After a time she darkened her room again, and waited in vain for his return. If it were he, he shuns even the slightest recognition. She thought despairingly, and the early dawn was not far distant when she fell into an unquiet sleep. For the next few days Miss Van Tyne was a puzzle to all except Mrs. Alston. She was quite unlike the girl she had formerly been, and she made no effort to disguise the fact. In place of her old exuberance of life and spirits, there was lassitude and great depression. The rich color ebbed steadily from her face, and dark lines under her eyes betokened sleepless nights. She saw the many curious glances in her direction, but apparently did not care what was thought or surmised. Were it not that her manner to Ackland was so misleading, the tendency to couple their names together would have been far more general. She neither sought nor shunned his society. In fact, she treated him as she did the other gentlemen of her acquaintance. She took him at his word. He had said he would forgive her on condition that she would not speak of what he was pleased to term that little episode, and she never referred to it. Her aunt was as much at fault as the others, and one day querulously complained to Mrs. Alston that she was growing anxious about Eva. At first I thought she was disappointed over the indifference of that icy cousin of yours, but she does not appear to care a straw for him. When I mention his name, she speaks of him in a natural, grateful way. 
Then her thoughts appear to wander off, to some matter that is troubling her. I can't find out whether she is ill, or whether she has heard some bad news of which she will not speak. She never gave me, or anyone that I know of, much of her confidence. Mrs. Austin listened, but made no comments. She was sure she was right in regard to Miss Van Tyne's trouble, but her cousin mystified her. Ackland had become perfectly inscrutable. As far as she could judge by any word or act of his, he had simply lost his interest in Miss Van Tyne, and that was all that could be said. And yet a fine instinct tormented Mrs. Alston with the doubt that this was not true, and that the young girl was the subject of a sedulously concealed scrutiny. Was he watching for his friend or for his own sake, or was he, in a spirit of retaliation, enjoying the suffering of one who had made others suffer? His reserve was so great that she could not pierce it, and his caution baffled even her vigilance, but she waited patiently, assured that the little drama must soon pass into a more significant phase. And she was right. Miss Van Tyne could not maintain the line of action she had resolved upon. She thought, I won't try to appear happy when I am not. I won't adopt the conventional mask of gaiety when the heart is wounded. How often I have seen through it and smiled at the transparent farce. A farce it seemed then. But I now fear it was often tragedy. At any rate, there was neither dignity nor deception in it. I have done with being false— and so shall simply act myself and be a true woman. Though my heart break a thousand times, not even by a glance shall I show that it is breaking for him. If he or others surmise the truth, they may let them. It is a part of my penance. And I will show the higher, stronger pride of one who makes no vain, useless pretense to happy indifference— but who can maintain a self-control so perfect that even Mrs. Alston shall not see one unmaidenly advance or overture. She succeeded for a time, as we have seen, but she overrated her will and underrated her heart, that with deepening intensity craved the love denied her. With increasing frequency she said to herself, I must go away. My only course is to hide my weakness and never see him again. He is inflexible, and yet his very obduracy increases my love a hundredfold. At last, after a lonely walk on the beach, she concluded, My guardian must take me home on Monday next. He comes tonight to spend Sunday with us, and I will make preparations to go at once. Although her resolution did not fail her, she walked forward more and more slowly, her dejection and weariness becoming almost overpowering. As she was turning a sharp angle of rocks that jutted well down to the water, she came face to face with Ackland and Mrs. Alston. She was off her guard, and her thoughts of him had been so absorbing that she felt he must be conscious of them. She flushed painfully and hurried by with slight recognition and downcast face, but she had scarcely passed them when, acting under a sudden impulse, she stopped and said in a low tone, Mr. Rackland. He turned expectantly toward her. For a moment she found it difficult to speak, then ignoring the presence of Mrs. Alston, resolutely began. Mr. Rackland, I must refer once more to a topic which you have in a sense forbidden. I feel partially absolved, however, for I do not think you have forgiven me anything. At any rate, I must ask your pardon once more for having so needlessly and foolishly imperiled your life. I say these words now because I may not have another opportunity. We leave on Monday. With this she raised her eyes to his with an appeal for a little kindness which Mrs. Alston was confident could not be resisted. Indeed, she was sure that she saw a slight nervous tremor in Ackland's hand, as if he found it hard to control himself. Then he appeared to grow rigid, Lifting his hat, he said gravely and unresponsively, Miss Van Tyne, you now surely have made ample amends. Please forget the whole affair. She turned from him at once, but not so quickly, but that both he and his cousin saw the bitter tears that would come. A moment later she was hidden by the angle of the rock, 
As long as she was visible, Ackland watched her without moving. Then he slowly turned to his cousin, his face inscrutable as ever. She walked at his side for a few moments in ill-concealed impatience, then stopped and said decisively, I'll go no further with you today. I am losing all respect for you. Without speaking, he turned to accompany her back to the house. His reticence and coldness appeared to annoy her beyond endurance, for she soon stopped and sat down on a ledge of the rocks that jutted down the beach where they had met Miss Van Tyne. John, you are the most unnatural man I ever saw in my life. She began angrily. What reason have you for so flattering an opinion? He asked coolly. You have been giving reason for it every day since you came here. She resumed hotly. I always heard it said that you had no heart, but I defended you and declared that your course toward your mother, even when a boy, showed that you had and that you would prove it some day. But I now believe that you are unnaturally cold, heartless and unfeeling. I had no objection to your wounding Miss Van Tyne's vanity and encouraged you when that alone bid fair to suffer. But when she proved she had a heart and that you had awakened it, she deserved at least kindness and consideration on your part. If you could not return her affection, you should have gone away at once. But I believe that you have stayed for the sole and cruel purpose of gloating over her suffering. She has not suffered more than my friend, or than I would if... You indeed! The idea of your suffering from any such cause... I half believe you came here with the deliberate purpose of avenging your friend, and that you are keeping for his inspection a diary in which the poor girl's humiliation today will form the hateful climax. They did not dream that the one most interested was near. Miss Van Tyne had felt too faint and sorely wounded to go further without rest, believing that the rocks would hide her from whose eyes she would most wish to shun. She had thrown herself down beyond the angle and was shedding the bitterest tears that she had ever known. Suddenly she heard Mrs. Alston's words but a short distance away and was so overcome by their import that she hesitated what to do. She would not meet them again for the world but felt so weak that she doubted whether she could drag herself away without being discovered, especially as the beach trended off to the left so sharply a little further on that they might discover her. While she was looking vainly for some way to escape, she heard Ackland's words and Mrs. Alston's surmise in reply that he had come with the purpose of revenge. She was so stung by their apparent truth that she resolved to clamber up through an opening of the rocks if the thing were possible. Panting and exhausted, she gained the summit and then hastened to an adjacent grove, as some wounded, timid creature would run to the nearest cover. Ackland had heard sounds and had stepped around the point of the rocks just in time to see her disappearing above the bank. Returning to Mrs. Alston, he said impatiently, In view of your opinions, my society can have no attractions for you. Shall I accompany you to the hotel? No, was the angry reply. I'm in no mood to speak to you again today. He merely bowed and turned as if to pursue his walk. The moment she was hidden, however, he also climbed the rocks in time to see Miss Van Tyne entering the grove. With swift and silent tread he followed her, but could not at once discover her hiding place. At last passionate sobs made it evident that she was concealed behind a great oak a little on his left. Approaching cautiously, he heard her moan. Oh, this is worse than death. He makes me feel as if even God had no mercy for me. But I will expiate my wrong. I will. At the bitterest sacrifice which a woman can make. She sprang up to meet Ackland, standing with folded arms before her. She started violently and leaned against the tree for support. But the weakness was momentary for she wiped the tears from her eyes and then turned to him so quietly that only her extreme pallor proved that she realized the import of her words. Mr. Ackland, she asked, have you Mr. Munson's address? It was his turn now to start, but he merely answered, yes. Do, do you think he still cares for me? Undoubtedly. 
since then you were so near a friend. Will you write to him that I will try? She turned away and would not look at him as, after a moment's hesitation, she concluded her sentence. I will try to make him as happy as I can. Do you regret your course? He asked, with a slight tremor in his voice. I regret that I misled, that I wronged him beyond all words. I am willing to make all the amends in my power. Do you love him? She now turned wholly away and shook her head. And yet you would marry him? Yes, if he wished it, knowing all the truth. Can you believe he would wish it? He asked indignantly. Can you believe that any man... Then avenge him to your cruel soul's content! She exclaimed passionately. Tell him that I have no heart to give him or to anyone. Through no effort or fault of mine, I overheard Mrs. Alston's words and yours. I know your design against me. Assuage your friend's grief by assuring him of your entire success, of which you were already so well aware. Tell him how you triumphed over an untaught, thoughtless girl who was impelled merely by the love of power and excitement, as you are governed by ambition and a remorseless will. I did not know. I did not understand how cruel I was. Although now that I do know, I shall never forgive myself. But if you had the heart of a man, you might have seen that you were subjecting me to torture. I did not ask or expect that you should care for me. But I had a right to hope for a little kindness— a little manly and delicate consideration, a little healing sympathy for the almost mortal wound that you have made. But I now see that you have stood by and watched like a grand inquisitor. Tell your friend that you have transformed the thoughtless girl into a suffering woman. I cannot go to Brazil. I cannot face dangers that might bring rest. I must keep my place in society. Keep it, too, under a hundred observant and curious eyes. You have seen it all of late in this house. I was too wretched to care. It was a part of my punishment, and I accepted it. I would not be false again, even in trying to conceal a secret which it is like death to a woman to reveal. I only craved one word of kindness from you. Had I received it, I would have gone away in silence and suffered in silence. But your course and what I have heard have made me reckless and despairing. You do not leave me even the poor consolation of self-sacrifice. You are my stony-hearted fate. I wish you had left me to drown. Tell your friend that I am more wretched than he can ever be, because I am a woman. Will he be satisfied? He ought to be, was the low, husky reply. Are you proud of your triumph? No, I am heartily ashamed of it, but I have kept a pledge that will probably cost me far more than it has you. A pledge? Yes, my pledge to make you suffer as far as possible as he suffers. She put her hand to her side as if she had received a wound and after a moment said wearily and coldly, Well, tell him that you succeeded, and be content. And she turned to leave him. Stay. He cried impetuously. It is now your turn. Take your revenge. My revenge? She repeated in unfeigned astonishment. Yes, your revenge. I have loved you from the moment I hoped you had a woman's heart, yes, and before, when I feared I might not be able to save your life. I know it now, though the very thought of it enraged me then. I have watched and waited more to be sure that you had a woman's heart than for aught else, though a false sense of honour kept me true to my pledge. 
After I met you on the beach, I determined at once to break my odious bond and place myself at your mercy. You may refuse me in view of my course. You probably will. But everyone in that house there shall know that you refuse me, and your triumph shall be more complete than mine. She looked into his face with an expression of amazement and doubt, but instead of coldness there was now a devotion and pleading that she had never seen before. She was too confused and astounded, however, to comprehend his words immediately, nor could the impression of his hostility pass away readily. You were mocking me, she faltered, scarcely knowing what she said. I cannot blame you that you think me capable of mocking the noble candour which has cost you so dear, as I can now understand. I cannot ask you to believe that I appreciate your heroic impulse of self-sacrifice, your purpose to atone for the wrong by inflicting irreparable wrong on yourself. It is natural that you should think of me only as an instrument of revenge with no more feeling than some keen-edged weapon would have. This also is the inevitable penalty of my course. When I speak of my love, I cannot complain if you smile in bitter incredulity, but I have at least proved that I have a resolute will and that I keep my word. And I again assure you that it shall be known this very night that you have refused me, that I offered you my hand, that you already had my heart, where your image is enshrined with that of my mother, and that I entreated you to be my wife. My cousin alone guessed my miserable triumph. All shall know of yours. As he spoke with impassioned earnestness, the confusion passed from her mind. She felt the truth of his words. She knew that her ambitious dream had been fulfilled, and that she had achieved the conquest of a man upon whom all others had smiled in vain. But how immeasurably different were her emotions from those which she had once anticipated. Not her beauty, not her consummate skill in fascination had wrought this miracle, but her woman's heart, awakened at last, and it thrilled with such unspeakable joy that she turned away to hide its reflex in her face. He was misled by the act into believing that she could not forgive him, and yet was perplexed when she murmured with a return of her old piquant humor. You are mistaken, Mr. Ackland. It shall never be known that I refused you. How can you prevent it? If your words are sincere, you will submit to such terms as I choose to make. I am sincere, and my actions shall prove it. But I shall permit no mistaken self-sacrifice on your part, nor any attempt to shield me from the punishment I well deserve. She suddenly turned upon him a radiant face, in which he read his happiness and faltered. Jack, I do believe you. Although the change seems wrought by some heavenly magic, but it will take a long time to pay you up. I hope to be your dear torment for a lifetime. He caught her in such a strong, impetuous embrace that she gasped. I thought you were cold to our sex. It's not your sex that I am clasping, but you. You, my Eve. Like the first man, I have won my bride under the green trees and beneath the open sky. Yes, Jack, and I give you my whole heart, as truly as did the first woman when there was but one man in all the world. That is my revenge. This is what Will Munson wrote some weeks later. Well, Jack, I've had the yellow fever, and it was the most fortunate event of my life. I was staying with a charming family, and they would not permit my removal to a hospital. One of my bravest and most devoted nurses has consented to become my wife. I hope you punished that little wretch, Ava Van Tyne, as she deserved. Confound your fickle soul, muttered Ackland. I punished her as she did not deserve, 
and I risked more than life in doing so. If her heart had not been as good as gold and as kind as heaven, she never would have looked at me again. Ackland is quite as indifferent to the sex as ever, but Eva has never complained that he was cold to her. End of an Unexpected Result by Edward P. Rowe The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cast of Characters C. Auguste Dupont Recording by Seamus Dobbin Monsieur G. Read by Java Man. Narrator. Read by Chuck Williamson. The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe. Nil Sapiente Odiosus, Acumena Nemo. Seneca. At Paris, just after dark one gusty evening in the autumn of eighteen redacted, I was enjoying the twofold luxury of meditation, and meerschaum, in the company with my friend, C. Auguste Dupont, in his little back library or book closet, au Trasame, number 33, Rue de Neau, Faubourg, St. Germain. For one hour, at least, we had maintained a profound silence, while each, to any casual observer, might have seemed intently and exclusively occupied with the curling eddies of smoke that oppressed the atmosphere of the chamber. For myself, however, I was mentally discussing certain topics which had formed matter for conversation between us at an earlier period of the evening. I mean, the affair of the Rue Morgue, and the mystery attending the murder of Marie Roget. I looked upon it, therefore, as something of a coincidence, when the door of our apartment was thrown open, and admitted our old acquaintance, Monsieur G., the prefect of the Parisian police. We gave him a hearty welcome, for there was nearly as much of the entertaining as of the uh, contemptible about the man, and we had not seen him for several years. We had been sitting in the dark, and Dupont now arose for the purpose of lighting a lamp, but sat down again without doing so, upon G saying that he had called to consult us, or rather to ask the opinion of my friend about some official business which had occasioned a great deal of trouble. If it is any point requiring reflection, observed Dupont as he forbore to enkindle the wick. We shall examine it to better purpose in the dark. That is another of your odd notions, said the prefect, who had the fashion of calling everything odd that was beyond his comprehension, and thus lived amid an absolute legion of oddities. Very true, said Dupont, as he supplied his visitor with a pipe and rolled toward him a comfortable chair. "'And what is the difficulty now?' I asked. "'Nothing more in the assassination way, I hope.' "'Oh, no, nothing of that nature. The fact is, the business is very simple indeed, and I make no doubt that we can manage it sufficiently well ourselves. But then I thought Dupin would like to hear the details of it, because it is so excessively odd. Simple and odd, said Dupont. Why, yes, and not exactly that either. The fact is, we have all been a good deal puzzled because the affair is so simple, and yet baffles us altogether. Perhaps it is the very simplicity of the thing which puts you at fault, said my friend. <laughs> "'What nonsense you do talk!' replied the prefect, laughing heartily. "'Perhaps the mystery is a little too plain,' 
said Dupont. Oh, good heavens! Who ever heard of such an idea? A little too self-evident. <laughs> Roared our visitor, profoundly amused. Oh, Dupin, you will be the death of me yet. And what, after all, is the matter on hand? I asked. Why, I will tell you, replied the prefect, as he gave a long, steady, and contemplative puff, and settled himself in his chair. I will tell you in a few words, but before I begin, let me caution you that this is an affair demanding the greatest secrecy, and that I should most probably lose the position I now hold were it known that I confided it to any one. Proceed, said I. Or not, said Dupont. Well, then, I have received personal information from a very high quarter that a certain document of the last importance has been purloined from the royal apartments. The individual who purloined it is known, this beyond a doubt. He was seen to take it. It is known also that it still remains in his possession. How is this known? asked Dupont. It is clearly inferred, replied the prefect, from the nature of the document and from the non-appearance of certain results which would at once arise from its passing out of the robber's possession. That is to say, from his employing it as he must design in the end to employ it. Be a little more explicit, I said. Well, I may venture so far as to say that the paper gives its holder a certain power in a certain quarter where such power is immensely valuable. The prefect was fond of the cant of diplomacy. Still, I do not quite understand, said Dupont. No? Well, the disclosure of the document to a third person, who shall be nameless, would bring in question the honor of a personage of most exalted station, and this fact gives the holder of the document an ascendancy over the illustrious personage whose honor and peace are so jeopardized. But this ascendancy, I interposed, would depend upon the robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. Who would dare— The thief, said G is the minister d who dares all things those unbecoming as well as those becoming a man the method of the theft was not less ingenious than bold the document in question a letter to be frank had been received by the personage robbed while alone in the royal boudoir during its perusal she was suddenly interrupted by the entrance of the other exalted personage from whom especially it was her wish to conceal it after a hurried and vain endeavor to thrust it in a drawer she was forced to place it open as it was upon a table the address however was uppermost and the contents thus unexposed the letter escaped notice at this juncture enters the minister d his lynx eye immediately perceives the paper, recognizes the handwriting of the address, observes the confusion of the personage addressed, and fathoms her secret. After some business transactions, hurried through in his ordinary manner, he produces a letter somewhat similar to the one in question, opens it, pretends to read it, and then places it in close juxtaposition to the other— Again, he converses for some fifteen minutes upon the public affairs. At length, in taking leave, he takes also from the table the letter to which he had no claim. Its rightful owner saw, but, of course, dared not call attention to the act in the presence of the third personage who stood at her elbow. The minister decamped, leaving his own letter one of no importance upon the table. Here, then, 
said Dupin to me. You have precisely what you demand to make the ascendancy complete. The robber's knowledge of the loser's knowledge of the robber. Yes, replied the prefect. And the power thus attained has, for some months past, been wielded for political purposes to a very dangerous extent. The personage robbed is more thoroughly convinced every day of the necessity of reclaiming her letter. But this, of course, cannot be done openly. In fine, driven to despair, she has committed the matter to me. Then whom? said Dupont, amid a perfect whirlwind of smoke. No more sagacious agent could, I suppose, be desired or even imagined. <laughs> you flatter me, replied the prefect. But it is possible that some such opinion may have been entertained. It is clear, said I, as you observe, that the letter is still in the possession of the minister, since it is this possession, and not any employment of the letter, which bestows the power. With the employment— the power departs. True, said G. And upon this conviction I proceeded. My first care was to make thorough search of the minister's hotel, and here my chief embarrassment lay in the necessity of searching without his knowledge. Beyond all things, I have been warned of the danger which would result from giving him reason to suspect our design. Uh, but said I. You are quite au fait in these investigations. The Parisian police have done this thing often before. Oh, yes, and for this reason I did not despair. The habits of the minister gave me, too, a great advantage. He is frequently absent from home all night. His servants are by no means numerous. They sleep at a distance from their master's apartment, and being chiefly Neapolitans, are readily made drunk. I have keys, as you know, with which I can open any chamber or cabinet in Paris. For three months a night has not passed during the greater part of which I have not been engaged, personally, in ransacking the D Hotel. My honor is interested, and, to mention a great secret, the reward is enormous. So... I did not abandon the search until I had become fully satisfied that the thief is a more astute man than myself. I fancy that I have investigated every nook and corner of the premises in which it is possible that the paper can be concealed. But is it not possible, I suggested, that, although the letter may be in possession of the minister, as it unquestionably is, he may have concealed it elsewhere than upon his own premises. This is barely possible, said Dupont. The present peculiar condition of affairs at court, and especially of those intrigues in which D is known to be involved, would render the instant availability of the document its susceptibility of being produced at a moment's notice a point of nearly equal importance with its possession. Its susceptibility of being produced, said I. That is to say, of being destroyed, said Dupont. True, I observed. The paper is clearly then upon the premises. As for its being upon the person of the minister, we may consider that as out of the question. Entirely, said the prefect. He has been twice waylaid, as if by footpads, and his person rigidly searched under my own inspection. You might have spared yourself this trouble, said Dupont. D, I presume, is not altogether a fool, and, if not, must have anticipated these waylayings as a matter of course. Not altogether a fool, said G. But then he is a poet which I take to be only one remove from a fool. True, said Dupont, after a long and thoughtful whiff from his meerschaum. 
although I have been guilty of certain doggerel myself. Suppose you detail, said I, the particulars of your search. Why, the fact is, we took our time, and we searched everywhere. I have had long experience in these affairs. I took the entire building, room by room, devoting the nights of a whole week to each. We examined, first, the furniture of each apartment. We opened every possible drawer, and I presume you know that, to a properly trained police agent, such a thing as a secret drawer is impossible. Any man is a dolt who permits a secret drawer to escape him in a search of this kind. The thing is so plain. There is a certain amount of bulk, of space to be accounted for in every cabinet. Then we have accurate rules. The fiftieth part of a line could not escape us. After the cabinets, we took the chairs. The cushions we probed with the fine long needles you have seen me employ. From the tables, we removed the tops. Why so? Sometimes the top of a table or other similarly arranged piece of furniture is removed by the person wishing to conceal an article, then the leg is excavated, the article deposited within the cavity, and the top replaced. The bottoms and tops of bedposts are employed in the same way. But could not the cavity be detected by sounding? I asked. By no means, if, when the article is deposited, a sufficient wadding of cotton be placed around it. Besides, in our case, we were obliged to proceed without noise. But you could not have removed, you could not have taken to pieces all articles of furniture in which it would have been possible to make a deposit in the manner you mention. A letter may be compressed into a thin spiral roll, not differing much in shape or bulk from a large knitting needle, and in this form it might be inserted into the rung of a chair, for example. You did not take to pieces all of the chairs? Certainly not, but we did better. We examined the rungs of every chair in the hotel, and, indeed, the jointings of every description of furniture by the aid of a most powerful microscope. Had there been any traces of recent disturbance, we should not have failed to detect it instantly. A single grain of gimlet dust, for example, would have been as obvious as an apple. Any disorder in the gluing, any unusual gaping in the joints, would have sufficed to ensure detection. I presume you look to the mirrors, between the boards and the plates, and you probe the beds and the bedclothes, as well as the curtains and carpets. That, of course. And when we had absolutely completed every particle of the furniture in this way, then we examined the house itself. We divided its entire surface into compartments, which we numbered, so that none might be missed. Then we scrutinized each individual square inch throughout the premises, including the two houses immediately adjoining, with the microscope as before. The two houses adjoining? I exclaimed. You must have had a great deal of trouble. We had... But the reward offered is prodigious. You include the grounds about the houses? All the grounds are paved with brick. They gave us comparatively little trouble. We examined the moss between the bricks and found it undisturbed. You looked among these papers, of course, and into the books of the library. Certainly. We opened every package and parcel we not only opened every book but we turned over every leaf in each volume not contenting ourselves with a mere shake according to the fashion of some of our police officers we also measured the thickness of every book cover with the most accurate measurement and applied to each the most jealous scrutiny of the microscope had any of the bindings been recently meddled with, it would have been utterly impossible that the fact should have escaped observation. 
Some five or six volumes, just from the hands of the binder, we carefully probed longitudinally with the needles. You explored the floors beneath the carpets? Beyond doubt. We removed every carpet and examined the boards with the microscope. And the paper on the walls? Yes. Y you looked into the cellars? We did. Then, I said, you have been making a miscalculation, and the letter is not upon the premises as you suppose. I fear you are right there said the prefect. And now, Dupin, what would you advise me to do? To make a thorough research of the premises. That is absolutely needless, replied G. I am not more sure that I breathe than I am that the letter is not at the hotel. I have no better advice to give you, said Dupin. You have, of course, an accurate description of the letter? Oh, yes. And here the prefect, producing a memorandum book, proceeded to read aloud a minute account of the internal and especially of the external appearance of the missing document. Soon after finishing the perusal of this description, he took his departure, more entirely depressed in spirit than I had ever known the gentleman before. In about a month afterward, he paid us another visit, and found us occupied very nearly as before. He took a pipe and a chair, and entered into some ordinary conversation. At length I said, Well, but she, what of the purloined letter? I presume you have at last made up your mind that there is no such thing as overreaching the minister. Confound him, say I. Yes, I made the re-examination, however, as Dupin suggested. But it was all labor lost, as I knew it would be. How much was the reward offered, did you say? Asked Dupin. Why, a very great deal. A very liberal reward. I don't like to say how much, precisely. But one thing I will say that I wouldn't mind giving my individual check for 50,000 francs to anyone who could obtain me that letter. The fact is, it is becoming of more and more importance every day, and the reward has been lately doubled. If it were trebled, however, I could do no more than I have done. Why, yes, said Dupont, drawlingly, between the whiffs of his meerschaum. I really think, G, you have not exerted yourself to the utmost in this manner. You might do a little more, I think, eh? How? In what way? Why, you might employ counsel in the matter, eh? Do you remember the story they tell of Abernathy? No, hang Abernathy. To be sure, hang him and welcome. But, once upon a time, a certain rich miser conceived a design of sponging upon this Abernathy for a medical opinion. Getting up for this purpose an ordinary conversation in a private company, he insinuated his case to the physician as that of an imaginary individual. We will suppose, said the miser, that his symptoms are such and such. Now, doctor, what would you have directed him to take? Take, said Abernathy, why, take advice, to be sure. But, said the prefect, a little discomposed, I am perfectly willing to take advice and to pay for it. I would really give 50,000 francs to anyone who would aid me in the matter. In that case, replied Dupont, opening a drawer and producing a checkbook. You may as well fill me up a check for the amount mentioned. When you have signed it, I will hand you the letter. I was astonished. The prefect appeared absolutely thunderstricken. For some minutes he remained speechless and motionless, looking incredulously at my friend with 
open mouth and eyes that seem starting from their sockets. Then, uh, apparently recovering himself in some measure, he seized a pen, and after several pauses and vacant stares, finally filled up and signed a check for fifty thousand francs and handed it across the table to Dupont. The latter examined it carefully and deposited it into his pocket-book. Then, unlocking an escritoire, took thence a letter and gave it to the prefect. This functionary grasped it in a perfect agony of joy, opened it with a trembling hand, cast a rapid glance at its contents, and then, scrambling and struggling to the door, rushed at length unceremoniously from the room and from the house without having uttered a syllable since Dupin had requested him to fill out the check. When he had gone, my friend entered into some explanations. The Parisian police, he said, are exceedingly able in their way. They are persevering, ingenious, cunning, and thoroughly versed in the knowledge which their duties seem chiefly to demand. Thus, when G detailed to us his mode of searching the premises at the Hotel D, I felt entire confidence in his having made a satisfactory investigation, so far as his labors extended. So far as his labors extended, said I. Yes, said Dupont. The measures adopted were not only the best of their kind, but carried out to absolute perfection. Had the letter been deposited within the range of their search, these fellows would, beyond a question, have found it. <laughs> I merely laughed, but he seemed quite serious in all that he said. The measures, then, he continued, were good in their kind and well executed. Their defect lay in their being inapplicable to the case and to the man. A certain set of highly ingenious resources are, with the prefect, a sort of procrustean bed to which he forcibly adapts his designs. But he perpetually errs by being too deep or too shallow for the matter in hand, and many schoolboy is a better reasoner than he. I knew one about eight years of age whose success at guessing in the game of even and odd attracted universal admiration. This game is simple, and is played with marbles. One player holds in his hand a number of these toys and demands of the other whether that number is even or odd. If the guess is right, the guesser wins one. If wrong, he loses one. The boy to whom I allude won all the marbles of the school. Of course, he had some principle of guessing. And this lay in mere observation and admeasurement of the astuteness of his opponents. For example, an errant simpleton is his opponent, and holding up in his closed hand asks, Are they even or odd? Our schoolboy replies, Odd, and loses. But upon the second trial he wins, for he then says to himself, The simpleton has them even upon the first trial, and his amount of cunning is just sufficient enough to make him have them odd upon the second. I will therefore guess odd. He guesses odd and wins. Now with the simpleton a degree above the first, he would have reasoned thus. This fellow finds that in the first instance I guessed odd, and in the second he will propose to himself upon the first impulse a simple variation from even to odd, as did the first simpleton. But then a second thought will suggest that this is too simple a variation, and finally he will decide upon putting it even as before. I will therefore guess even. He guesses even and wins. Now this mode of reasoning in the schoolboy, whom his fellows termed lucky, what, in its last analysis, is it? It is merely, said I, an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent. It is, said Dupont and upon inquiring of the boy by what means he effected the thorough identification in which his success consisted, I received answer as follows. When I wish to find out how wise, or how stupid, or how good, or how wicked is anyone, or what are his thoughts at the moment, I fashioned the expression of my face as accurately as possible in accordance with the expression of his, and then wait to see what thoughts or sentiments arise in my mind or heart, as if to match or correspond with the expression. This response of the schoolboy lies at the bottom of all the spurious profundity which has been attributed to Rochefoucauld, to La Bruyere, to Machiavelli, and to Campanella. 
and the identification i said of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponents depends if i understand you aright upon the accuracy with which the opponent's intellect is at measured for its practical value it depends upon this replied dupont and the prefect and his cohort fail so frequently first by default of this identification and secondly by ill admeasurement or rather through non-admeasurement of the intellect with which they are engaged they consider only their own ideas of ingenuity and in searching for anything hidden advert only to the modes in which they would have hidden it. They are right in this much, that their own ingenuity is a faithful representative of that of the masses, but when the cunning of the individual felon is diverse in character from their own, the felon foils them, of course. This always happens when it is above their own, and very usually when it is below. They have no variation of principle in their investigations, at best, when urged by some unusual emergency, by some extraordinary reward, they extend or exaggerate their old modes of practice without touching their principles. What, for example, in this case of D, has been done to vary the principle of action? What is all this boring and probing and sounding and scrutinizing with the microscope and dividing the surface of the building into registered square inches, what is it all but an exaggeration of the application of the one principle or set of principles of search which are based upon the one set of notions regarding human ingenuity to which the prefect, in the long routine of his duty, has been accustomed? Do you not see he has taken it for granted that all men proceed to conceal a letter not exactly in a gimlet hole bored in a chair leg, but at least in some out of the way hole or corner suggested by the same tenor of thought which would urge a man to secret a letter in a gimlet hole bored in a chair leg. And do you not see also that such recherche nooks for concealment are adapted only for ordinary occasions, and would be adopted only by ordinary intellects? For, in all cases of concealment, a disposal of the article concealed, a disposal of it in this recherche manner, is, in the very first instance, presumable and presumed. And thus its discovery depends not at all upon the acumen, but altogether upon the mere care, patience, and determination of the seekers. And where the case is of importance, or what amounts to the same thing in the policial eyes when the reward is of magnitude, the qualities in question have never been known to fail. You will now understand what I meant in suggesting that had the purloined letter been hidden anywhere within the limits of the prefect's examination, in other words, had the principle of its concealment been comprehended within the principles of the prefect, its discovery would have been a matter altogether beyond question. This functionary, however, has been thoroughly mystified, and the remote source of his defeat lies in the supposition that the minister is a fool, because he has acquired renown as a poet. All fools are poets, this the prefect feels, and he is merely guilty of a non distributio medi in thus inferring that all poets are fools. But is this really the poet? I asked. There are two brothers, I know, and both have attained reputation in letters. The minister, I believe, has written learnedly on the differential calculus. He is a mathematician and no poet you're mistaken i know him well he is both as poet and mathematician he would reason well as mere mathematician he could not have reasoned at all and thus would have been at the mercy of the prefect you surprise me i said by these opinions which have been contradicted by the voice of the world you do not mean to set it not the well-digested idea of centuries the mathematical reason has long been regarded as the reason par excellence. Il y a a parier, replied Dupin, quoting from Chamfort, que toute idée publique, toute convention reçue, est une sottise, car elle a convenu au plus grand nombre. The mathematicians, I grant you, have done their best to promulgate the popular error to which you allude and which is none the less an error for its promulgation as truth. With an art worthy a better cause, for example, they have insinuated the term analysis into application to algebra. The French, 
are the originators of this particular deception. But if a term is of any importance, if words derive any value from applicability, then analysis conveys algebra about as much as, in Latin, ambitus implies ambition, religio, religion, or omnis honesti, a set of honorable men. You have a quarrel on hand, I see, said I, with some of the algebraists of Paris. <laughs> but proceed. I dispute the availability and thus the value of that reason which is cultivated in any special form other than the abstractly logical. I dispute in particular the reason adduced by mathematical study. The mathematics are the science of form and quantity. Mathematical reasoning is merely logic applied to observation upon form and quantity. The great error lies in supposing that even the truths of what is called pure algebra are abstract or general truths. And this error is so egregious that I am confounded of the universality with which it has been received. Mathematical axioms are not axioms of general truth. What is true of relation, of form, and quantity is often grossly false in regard to morals, for example. In this latter science, it is very usually untrue that the aggregated parts are equal to the whole. In chemistry also, the axiom fails. In the consideration of motive, it fails, for two motives, each of a given value, have not necessarily a value, when united, equal to the sum of their values apart. There are numerous other mathematical truths which are only truths within the limit of relation. But the mathematician argues from his finite truths through habit as if they were of an absolutely general applicability, as the world indeed imagines them to be. Bryant in his very learned mythology, mentions an analogous source of error when he says that, although the pagan fables are not believed, yet we forget ourselves continually and make inferences from them as existing realities. With the algebraists, however, who are pagans themselves, the pagan fables are believed and the inferences are made, not so much through lapse of memory as through an unaccountable addling of the brains. In short, I never yet encountered the mere mathematician who could be trusted out of equal roots, or one who did not clandestinely hold it as a point of his faith that x2 plus px was absolutely and unconditionally equal to q. Say to one of these gentlemen, by way of experiment, if you please, that you believe occasions may occur where x squared plus px is not altogether equal to q, and, having made him understand what you mean, Get out of his reach as speedily as convenient, for beyond doubt, he will endeavor to knock you down. I mean to say, continued Dupin, while I merely laughed at his last observations, that if the minister had been no more than a mathematician, the prefect would have been under no necessity of giving me this check. I knew him, however, as both mathematician and poet and my measures were adapted to his capacity with reference to the circumstances by which he was surrounded. I knew him as a courtier, too, and as a bold intrigant. Such a man, I considered, could not fail to be aware of the ordinary policial modes of action. He could not have failed to anticipate, and events have proved that he did not fail to anticipate, the waylayings to which he was subjected. He must have foreseen, I reflected, the secret investigations of his premises. His frequent absences from home at night, which were hailed by the prefect as certain aids to his success, I regarded only as ruses to afford opportunity for thorough search to the police, and thus the sooner to impress them with the conviction to which G, in fact, did finally arrive, the conviction that the letter was not upon the premises. I felt, also, that the whole train of thought which I was at some pains in detailing to you just now, concerning the invariable principle of policial action and schemes for articles concealed, I felt that this whole train of thought would necessarily pass through the mind of the minister. It would imperatively lead him to despise all the ordinary nooks of concealment. He could not, I reflected, be so weak as not to see that the most intricate and remote recesses of his hotel would be as open as his commonest closets to the eyes, to the probes, to the gimlets, and to the microscopes of the prefect. I saw, in fine, that he would be driven, as a matter of course, to simplicity, if not deliberately induced to it as a matter of choice. 
You will remember, perhaps, how desperately the prefect laughed when I suggested upon our first interview that it was just possible this mystery troubled him so much on account of its being so very self-evident. Yes, said I. I remember his merriment well. I really thought he would have fallen into convulsions. The material world, continued Dopon, abounds with very strict analogues to the immaterial. And thus some color of truth has been given to the rhetorical dogma that metaphor or simile may be made to strengthen an argument as well as to embellish a description. The principle of the vis inertiae, for example, seems to be identical in physics and metaphysics. It is not more true in the former that a large body is with more difficulty set in motion than a smaller one, and that its subsequent momentum is commensurate with this difficulty than it is, in the latter, that intellects of the vaster capacity, while more forcible, more constant, and more eventful in their movements than those of inferior grade, are yet the less readily moved, and more embarrassed, and full of hesitation in the first few steps of their progress. Again, have you ever noticed which of the street signs over the shop doors are the most attractive of attention? I have never given the matter a thought, I said. There is a game of puzzles, he resumed which is played upon a map. One party playing requires another to find a given word, the name of a town, a river, state, or empire, any word, in short, upon the motley and perplexed surface of the chart. A novice in the game generally seeks to embarrass his opponents by giving them the most minutely lettered names. But the adept selects such words as stretch in large characters from one end of the chart to the other. These, like the over-largely lettered signs and placards of the street, escaped observation by dint of being excessively obvious. And here the physical oversight is precisely analogous with the moral inapprehension by which the intellect suffers to pass unnoticed those considerations which are too obtrusively and too palpably self-evident. But this is a point, it appears, somewhat above or beneath the understanding of the prefect. He never once thought it probable, or possible, that the minister had deposited the letter immediately beneath the nose of the whole world, by way of best preventing any portion of that world from perceiving it. But the more I reflected upon the daring, dashing, and discriminating ingenuity of D, upon the fact that the document must always have been at hand if he intended to use it to good purpose, and upon the decisive evidence obtained by the prefect that it was not hidden within the limits of that dignitary's ordinary search, the more satisfied it became that, to conceal this letter, the minister had resorted to the comprehensive and sagacious expedient of not attempting to conceal it at all. Full of these ideas, I prepared myself with a pair of green spectacles, and called one fine morning, quite by accident, at the ministerial hotel. I found D at home yawning, lounging, and dawdling as usual, and pretending to be in the last extremity of ennui. He is, perhaps, the most really energetic human being now alive, but that is only when nobody sees him. To be even with him, I complained of my weak eyes, and lamented the necessity of the spectacles under cover of which I cautiously and thoroughly surveyed the whole apartment, while seemingly intent only on the conversation of my host. I paid especial attention to a large writing-table near where he sat, and upon which lay confusedly some miscellaneous letters and other papers, with one or two musical instruments and a few books. Here, however, after a long and very deliberate scrutiny, I saw nothing to excite particular suspicion. At length my eyes, in going the circuit of the room, fell upon a trumpery filigree card-rack of pasteboard that hung dangling by a dirty blue ribbon from a little brass knob just beneath the middle of the mantelpiece. In this rack, which had three or four compartments, were five or six visiting cards and a solitary letter. This last was much soiled and crumpled. It was torn nearly in two, across the middle, as if a design in the first instance to tear it entirely up as worthless had been altered or stayed in the second. It had a large black seal, bearing the D cipher very conspicuously, and was addressed in a diminutive female hand to D, the minister himself. It was thrust carelessly, and even, as it seemed, contemptuously, into one of the uppermost divisions of the rack. 
No sooner had I glanced at this letter than I concluded it to be that of which I was in search. To be sure, it was, to all appearance, radically different from the one of which the prefect had read us so minute a description. Here, the seal was large and black, with a D cipher. There it was small and red, with the ducal arms of the S family. Here the address to the minister was diminutive and feminine. There the superscription to a certain royal personage was markedly bold and decided. The size alone formed a point of correspondence. But then the radicalness of these differences, which was excessive, the dirt, the soiled and torn conditions of the paper so inconsistent with the true methodical habits of D, and so suggestive of a design to delude the beholder into an idea of the worthlessness of the document, these things, together with the hyper-obtrusive situation of this document, full in the view of every visitor, and thus exactly in accordance with the conclusions to which I had previously arrived, these things, I say, were strongly corroborative of suspicion, in one who came with the intention to suspect. I protracted my visit as long as possible and, while I maintained a most animated discussion with the minister upon a topic which I knew well had never failed to interest and excite him, I kept my attention really riveted upon the letter. In this examination I committed to memory its external appearance and arrangement in the rack, and also fell at length upon a discovery which set at rest whatever trivial doubt I might have entertained. In scrutinizing the edges of the paper, I observed them to be more chafed than seemed necessary. They presented the broken appearance, which is manifested when a stiff paper, having been once folded and pressed with a folder, is refolded in a reversed direction, in the same creases or edges which had formed the original fold. This discovery was sufficient. It was clear to me that the letter had been turned as a glove, inside out, redirected and resealed. I bade the minister good morning, and took my departure at once leaving a gold snuff-box upon the table. The next morning I called for the snuff-box, when we resumed quite eagerly the conversation of the preceding day. While thus engaged, however, a loud report as if of a pistol was heard immediately beneath the windows of the hotel, and was succeeded by a series of fearful screams and the shoutings of a terrified mob. D rushed to a casement, threw it open, and looked out. In the meantime I stepped to the card-rack, took the letter, put it in my pocket, and replaced it by a facsimile, so far as regards externals, which I had carefully prepared at my lodgings, imitating the D cipher very readily by means of a seal formed of bread. The disturbance in the street had been occasioned by the frantic behavior of a man with a musket. He had fired it among a crowd of women and children. It proved, however, to have been without a ball, and the fellow was suffered to go his way as a lunatic or a drunkard. When he had gone, D came from the window, whither I had followed him immediately upon securing the object in view. Soon afterward, I bade him farewell. The pretended lunatic was a man in my own pay. What purpose had you, I asked, in replacing the letter by a facsimile? Would it not have been better, at the first visit, to have seized it openly and departed? D replied Dupont, is a desperate man, and a man of nerve. His hotel, too, is not without attendants devoted to his interests. Had I made the wild attempt you suggest, I might never have left the ministerial presence alive. The good people of Paris might have heard of me no more. But I had an object apart from these considerations. You know my political prepossessions. In this manner I act as a partisan of the lady concerned. For eighteen months the minister has had her in his power. She has now him in hers, since, being unaware that the letter is not in his possession, he will proceed with his exactions as if it was. Thus he will inevitably commit himself at once to his political destruction. His downfall, too, will not be more precipitate than awkward. It is all very well to talk about the facilus de sensus averni, but in all kinds of climbing, as Catalani said of singing, it is far more easy to get up than to come down. In the present instance, 
I have no sympathy, at least no pity, for him who descends. He is that monstrum horrendum, an unprincipled man of genius. I confess, however, that I should like very well to know the precise character of his thoughts, when, being defied by her whom the prefect terms a certain personage, he is reduced to opening the letter which I left for him in the card rack. How? Did you put anything particular in it? Why, it did not seem altogether right to leave the interior blank. That would have been insulting. D. at Vienna once did me an evil turn, which I told him quite good-humouredly that I should remember. So as I knew he would feel some curiosity in regard to the identity of the person who had outwitted him, I thought it a pity not to give him a clue. He is well acquainted with my MS, and I just copied into the middle of the blank sheet the words Un descend si funest, s'il n'est ding de tre, est ding de tiest. They are to be found in Crebelon's Atre. End of the Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe. The Stolen Bacillus by H. G. Wells of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stolen Bacillus by H. G. Wells Bacteriologist, read by Andrew Nixon Anarchist, read by Todd Minnie, read by Beth Thomas Old Tootles, read by Rob Marland Ulster Boy, read by Eitel. Tommy Biles, read by Adrian Stevens. Cabman, read by Scott Calkins. Another Cabman, read by Sonia. Narrated by Abai. This again, said the bacteriologist, slipping a glass slide under the microscope, is a preparation of the celebrated bacillus of cholera, the cholera germ. The pale-faced man peered down the microscope. He was evidently not accustomed to that kind of thing, and held a limp white hand over his disengaged eye. I see very little, he said. Touch this screw, said the bacteriologist. Perhaps the microscope is out of focus for you. Eyes vary so much. Just a fraction of a turn this way or that. Ah, now I see said the visitor. Not so very much to see after all. Little streaks and shreds of pink. And yet those tiny particles, those mere atomies, might multiply and devastate a city. Wonderful! He stood up, and releasing the glass slip from the microscope, held it in his hand towards the window. Scarcely visible! he said, scrutinizing the preparation. He hesitated. Are these alive? Are they dangerous now? Those have been stained and killed, said the bacteriologist. I wish, for my own part, we could kill and stain every one of them in the universe. I suppose, the pale man said with a slight smile, that you scarcely care to have such things about you in the living, in the active state? On the contrary, we are obliged to, said the bacteriologist. Here, for instance. He walked across the room and took up one of several sealed tubes. Here is the living thing. This is a cultivation of the actual living disease bacteria. He hesitated. Bottled cholera, so to speak. A slight gleam of satisfaction appeared momentarily in the face of the pale man. It is a deadly thing to have in your possession, he said, devouring the little tube with his eyes. The bacteriologist watched a morbid pleasure in his visitor's expression. This man, who had visited him that afternoon with a note of introduction from an old friend, interested him from the very contrast of their dispositions. 
the lank black hair and deep grey eyes, the haggard expression and nervous manner, the fitful yet keen interest of his visitor, were a novel change from the phlegmatic deliberations of the ordinary scientific worker with whom the bacteriologist chiefly associated. It was perhaps natural, with a hearer evidently so impressionable to the lethal nature of his topic, to take the most effective aspect of the matter. He held the tube in his hand thoughtfully. Yes, here is the pestilence imprisoned. Only break such a little tube as this into a supply of drinking water. Say to these minute particles of life that one must needs stain and examine with the highest powers of the microscope even to see, and that one can neither smell nor taste, say to them, Go forth, increase and multiply, and replenish the systems. And death, mysterious, untraceable death, death swift and terrible, death full of pain and indignity, would be released upon this city, and go hither and thither seeking his victims. Here he would take the husband from the wife, here the child from its mother, here the statesman from his duty, and here the toiler from his trouble. He would follow the water mains, creeping along streets, picking out and punishing a house here and a house there, where they did not boil their drinking water, creeping into the wells of the mineral water makers, getting washed into salad, and lying dormant in ices. He would wait ready to be drunk, in the horse troughs, and by unwary children in the public fountains. He would soak into the soil to reappear in springs and wells at a thousand unexpected places. One start him up the water supply, and before we could ring him in and catch him again, he would have decimated the metropolis. He stopped abruptly. He had been told rhetoric was his weakness. But he is quite safe here, you know, quite safe. The pale-faced man nodded. His eyes shone. He cleared his throat. These anarchist rascals, said he, are fools, blind fools, to use bombs when this kind of thing is attainable. I think... A gentle rap, a mere light touch of the fingernails was heard at the door. The bacteriologist opened it. Just a minute, dear, whispered his wife. When he re-entered the laboratory, his visitor was looking at his watch. I had no idea I had wasted an hour of your time, he said. Twelve minutes to four. I ought to have left here by half past three. But your things were really too interesting. No, positively, I cannot stop a moment longer. I have an engagement at four. He passed out of the room reiterating his thanks, and the bacteriologist accompanied him to the door, and then returned thoughtfully along the passage to his laboratory. He was musing on the ethnology of his visitor. Certainly the man was not a Teutonic type, nor a common Latin one. A morbid product, anyhow, I am afraid, said the bacteriologist to himself. How he gloated on those cultivations of disease germs. A disturbing thought struck him. He turned to the bench by the vapour bath and then very quickly to his writing table. Then he felt hastily in his pockets and then rushed to the door. I may have put it down on the hall table, he said. Minnie, he shouted hoarsely in the hall. Yes, dear, came a remote voice. Had I anything in my hand when I spoke to you, dear, just now? Pause. Minnie said, Nothing, dear, because I remember... Blue ruin, cried the bacteriologist, and incontinently ran to the front door and down the steps of his house to the street. Minnie, hearing the door slam violently, ran in alarm to the window. Down the street a slender man was getting into a cab. The bacteriologist, hatless and in his carpet slippers, was running and gesticulating wildly towards this group. One slipper came off, but he did not wait for it. He has gone mad, said Minnie. It's that horrid science of his. And, opening the window, would have called after him. 
the slender man suddenly glancing around seemed struck with the same idea of mental disorder he pointed hastily to the bacteriologist said something to the cabman the apron of the cab slammed the whip swished the horse's feet clattered and in a moment cab and bacteriologist hotly in pursuit had receded up the vista of the roadway and disappeared round the corner minnie remained straining out of the window for a minute then she drew her head back into the room again she was dumbfounded of course he is eccentric she meditated but running about london in the height of the season too in his socks a happy thought struck her she hastily put her bonnet on seized his shoes went into the hall took down his hat and light overcoat from the pegs emerged upon the doorstep and hailed a cab that opportunely crawled by drive me up the road and round havelock crescent and see if we can find a gentleman running about in a velveteen coat and no hat velveteen coat ma'am and no hat very good ma'am and the cabman whipped up at once in the most matter-of-fact way as if he drove to this address every day in his life some few minutes later the little group of cabmen and loafers that collects round the cabman's shelter at haverstock hill was startled by the passing of a cab with a ginger-coloured screw of a horse driven furiously they were silent as it went by and then as it receded that's harry hicks what's he got said the stout gentleman known as old tootles he's a using his whip he is too right said the ostler boy hello said poor old tommy biles here's another bloomin' lunatic blowed if there ain't it's old george said old tootles and he's driving a lunatic as you say ain't he a clawin out a cab wonder if he's after harry hicks the group around the cabman's shelter became animated go it george it's a race you'll catch em whip up she's a gower she is said the ostler boy strike me giddy cried old tootles yeah i'm a gonna begin in a minute here's another coming if all the cabs in hampstead ain't gone mad this morning it's a field mail this time said the ostler boy she's a following him said old tootles usually the other way about what's she got in her hand looks like a eye hat what a bloomin lark it is three to one and old george said the ostler boy next minnie went by in a perfect roar of applause she did not like it but she felt that she was doing her duty and whirled on down haverstock hill and camden town high street with her eyes ever intent on the animated back view of old george who was driving her vagrant husband so incomprehensibly away from her the man in the foremost cab sat crouched in the corner his arms tightly folded and the little tube that contained such vast possibilities of destruction gripped in his hand his mood was a singular mixture of fear and exultation chiefly he was afraid of being caught before he could accomplish his purpose but behind this was a vaguer but larger fear of the awfulness of his crime but his exultation far exceeded his fear no anarchist before him had ever approached this conception of his ravachol valiant all those distinguished persons whose fame he had envied dwindled into insignificance beside him he had only to make sure of the water supply and break the little tube into a reservoir how brilliantly he had planned it forged a letter of introduction and got into the laboratory and how brilliantly he had seized his opportunity the world should hear of him at last all those people who had sneered at him neglected him preferred other people to him found his company undesirable should consider him at last death 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 they had always treated him as a man of no importance all the world had been in a conspiracy to keep him under he would teach them yet what it is to isolate a man what was this familiar street great saint andrew's street of course how fared the chase he craned out of the cab 
the bacteriologist was scarcely fifty yards behind. That was bad. He would be caught and stopped yet. He felt in his pocket for money and found half a sovereign. This he thrust up through the trap in the top of the cap into the man's face. More! he shouted. If only we get away! The money was snatched out of his hand. Right you are, said the cabman, and the trap slammed, and the lash lay along the glistening side of the horse. The cab swayed, and the anarchist, half standing under the trap, put the hand containing the little glass tube upon the apron to preserve his balance. He felt the brittle thing crack, and the broken half of it rang upon the floor of the cab. He fell back into the seat with a curse, and stared dismally at the two or three drops of moisture on the apron. He shuddered. Well, I suppose I shall be the first. Phew. Anyhow, I shall be a martyr. That's something. But it is a filthy death, nevertheless. I wonder if it hurts as much as they say. Presently a thought occurred to him. He groped between his feet. A little drop was still in the broken end of the tube, and he drank that to make sure. It was better to make sure. At any rate, he would not fail. Then it dawned upon him that there was no further need to escape the bacteriologist. In Wellington Street he told the cabman to stop and got out. He slipped on the step and his hand felt queer. It was rapid stuff, this cholera poison. He waved his cabman out of existence, so to speak, and stood on the pavement with his arms folded upon his breast, awaiting the arrival of the bacteriologist. There was something tragic in his pose. The sense of imminent death gave him a certain dignity. He greeted his pursuer with a defiant laugh. Ha! Vive l'anarchy! You are too late, my friend. I have drunk it. The cholera is abroad. The bacteriologist from his cab beamed curiously at him through his spectacles. You have drunk it? An anarchist? I see now. He was about to say something more and then checked himself. A smile hung in the corner of his mouth. He opened the apron of his cab as if to descend, at which the anarchist waved him a dramatic farewell and strode off towards Waterloo Bridge, carefully jostling his infected body against as many people as possible. The bacteriologist was so preoccupied with the vision of him that he scarcely manifested the slightest surprise at the appearance of Minnie upon the pavement with his hat and shoes and overcoat. Very good of you to bring my things, he said, and remained lost in contemplation of the receding figure of the anarchist. You had better get in, he said, still staring. Minnie felt absolutely convinced now that he was mad, and directed the cabman home on her own responsibility. Put on my shoes, certainly, dear said he as the cab began to turn and hid the strutting black figure, now small in the distance, from his eyes. Then suddenly something grotesque struck him, and he laughed. Then he remarked, It is really very serious, though. You see, that man came to my house to see me, and he is an anarchist. No, don't faint, or I cannot possibly tell you the rest. And I wanted to astonish him not knowing he was an anarchist, and took up a cultivation of that new species of bacterium I was telling you of, that infest, and I think caused the blue patches upon various monkeys, and like a fool I said it was Asiatic cholera, and he ran away with it to poison the water of London, and he certainly might have made things look blue for this civilised city, and now he has swallowed it. Of course, I cannot say what will happen, but you know it turned that kitten blue, and the three puppies in patches, and the sparrow bright blue. But the bother is, I shall have all the trouble and expense of preparing some more. 
put on my coat on this hot day? Why? Because we might meet Mrs. Jabber. My dear, Mrs. Jabber is not a draught. But why should I wear a coat on a hot day because of Mrs. Oh, very well. End of The Stolen Bacillus by H. G. Wells The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham Chapters 3 and 4 of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by The Story Girl. Moll, read by Beth Thomas. Rat, read by T.J. Burns. The Rabbit, read by Peter Yearsley. Badger, read by Johnny English. Hedgehog, read by Jasmine Selma. Otter, read by phone. Chapter 3. The Wild Wood. The Mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of the Badger. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage, and, though rarely visible, to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whenever the Mole mentioned his wish to the Water Rat, he always found himself put off. It's all right, the Rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. He's always turning up. And then I'll introduce you. The best of fellows. But uh, you must not only take him as you find him, but when you find him. Couldn't you ask him here for dinner or something? Said the Mole. He wouldn't come, replied the Rat simply. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that sort of thing. Well then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the Mole. Oh, I'm sure he wouldn't like that at all, said the Rat, quite alarmed. He's so very shy, he'd sure to be offended. I've never even ventured to call him at his own home myself, though I know him so well. Besides, we can't. It's quite out of the question, because he lives in the very middle of the wild wood. Well, supposing he does, said the Mole. You told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, I know, I know. So it is, replied the Rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now. Not just yet. It's a long way, and he wouldn't be at home at this time of year anyhow. And he'll be coming along some day, if you'll wait quietly. The Mole had to be content with this. But the badger never came along, and every day brought its amusements, and it was not till summer was long over, and cold and frost and miry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside their windows with a speed that mocked at boating of any sort or kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistence on the solitary grey badger who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the wild wood. In the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising late. During his short day, he sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic jobs about the house. And, of course, there were always animals dropping in for a chat. And consequently, there was a good deal of storytelling and comparing notes on the past summer and all its doings. Such a rich chapter it had been when one came to look back on it all with illustrations so numerous and so very highly coloured. The pageant of the river bank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in scene pictures that succeeded each other in stately procession. Purple loose strife arrived early, shaking luxuriant, tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence its own face laughed back at it. Willow herb, tender and wistful, like a pink sunset cloud, was not slow to follow. Comfrey, the purple hand in hand with the white, crept forth to take its place in the line, and at last, one morning, the diffident and delaying dog rose, stepped delicately on the stage, and one knew, as if string music had announced it in stately chords that strayed into a gavotte, that June at last was here. One member of the company was still awaited, the shepherd boy, for the nymphs to woo, the knight for whom the ladies waited at the window, the prince that was to kiss the sleeping summer back to life and love. 
But when meadow-sweet, debonair and odorous and amber jerkin moved graciously to his place in the group, then the play was ready to begin. And what a play it had been, drowsy animals snug in their holes while wind and rain were battering at their doors, recalled still keen mornings, an hour before sunrise, when the white mist, as yet undispersed, clung closely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge, the scamper along the bank, and the radiant transformation of earth, air, and water, when suddenly the sun was with them again, and grey was gold, and colour was born and sprang out of the earth once more, they recalled the languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, the sun striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots, the boating and bathing of the afternoon, the rambles along dusty lanes and through yellow cornfields, and the long, cool evening at last, when so many threads were gathered up, so many friendships rounded, and so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on those short winter days when the animals found themselves round the fire. Still, the mole had a good deal of spare time on his hands, and so one afternoon, when the rat in his armchair before the blaze was alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't fit, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wildwood and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with Mr. Badger. It was a cold, still afternoon, with a hard, steely sky overhead, when he slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought that he had never seen so far and so intimately into the insides of things as on that winter day, when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. Copses, dells, quarries, and all hidden places, which had been mysterious mines for exploration in leafy summer, now exposed themselves and their secrets pathetically, and seemed to ask him to overlook their shabby poverty for a while, till they could riot and rich masquerade as before, and trick and entice him with the old deceptions. It was pitiful in a way, and yet cheering, even exhilarating." He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hard and stripped of its finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were fine and strong and simple. He did not want the warm clover and the play of seeding grasses. The screens of quickset, the billowy drapery of beech and elm, seemed best away, and with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wildwood, which lay before him, low and threatening, like a black reef in some still southern sea. There was nothing to alarm him at first entry. Twigs crackled under his feet, logs tripped him, funguses on stumps resembled caricatures, and startled him for the moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away. But that was all fun and exciting. It led him on, and he penetrated to where the light was less, and trees crouched nearer and nearer, and holes made ugly mouths at him on either side. Everything was very still now. The dusk advanced on him steadily, rapidly, gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be draining away like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder, and indistinctly, that he first thought he saw a face— a little evil wedge-shaped face looking out at him from a hole. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had vanished. He quickened his pace, telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things, or there would be simply no end to it. He passed another hole, and another, and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly a little narrow face with hard eyes had flashed up for an instant from a hole and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself up for an effort and strode on. Then suddenly, and as if it had been so all the time, every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. If he could only get away from the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. 
he swung off the path and plunged into the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him when first he heard it, but somehow it made him hurry forward. Then, still very faint and shrill, it sounded far ahead of him and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision, it broke out on either side and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout the whole length of the wood to its farthest limit. But they were up and alert and ready, evidently, whoever they were, and he, he was alone and unarmed and far from any help and the night was closing in. Then the pattering began. He thought it was only falling leaves at first. So slight and delicate was the sound of it. Then, as it grew, it took a regular rhythm, and he knew it for nothing else but the pat, pat, pat of little feet still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be first one and then the other, then both. It grew and it multiplied, till from every quarter as he listened anxiously, leaning this way and that, it seemed to be closing in on him. As he stood still to hearken, a rabbit came running hard towards him through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him into a different course. Instead, the animal almost brushed him as it dashed past, his face set and hard, his eyes staring. Get out of this, you fool! Get out! The mole heard him mutter as he swung round a stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. The pattering increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread around him. The whole wood seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing, closing in round something or somebody. In panic, he began to run too, aimlessly, he knew not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he darted under things and dodged round things. At last, he took refuge in the deep, dark hollow of an old beech tree which offered shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety, but who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further, but could only snuggle down into the dry leaves which had drifted into the hollow, and hope he was safe for a time. And as he lay there, panting and trembling, and listening to the whistlings and the patterings outside, he knew it at last, in all its fullness, that dread thing which other little dwellers in field and hedgerow had encountered here, and known as their darkest moment, that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him from, the terror of the wild wood. Meantime, the rat, warm and comfortable, dozed by his fireside. His paper of half-finished verses slipped from his knee, his head fell back, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the verdant banks of dream rivers. Then a coal slipped, the fire crackled and sent up a spurt of flame, and he woke with a start. Remembering what he had been engaged upon, he reached down to the floor for his verses, poured over them for a minute, and then looked round for the mole to ask him if he knew a good rhyme for something or other. But the mole was not there. He listened for a time. The house seemed very quiet. Then he called, Molly, several times, and receiving no answer, got up and went out into the hall. The mole's cap was missing from its accustomed peg. His galoshes, which always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat left the house and carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's tracks. There they were, sure enough. The galoshes were new, just bought for the winter, and the pimples on their soles were fresh and sharp. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running along, straight and purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat looked very grave, and stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt round his waist, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took up a stout cudgel that stood in a corner of the hall and set off for the wild wood at a smart pace. It was already getting towards dusk when he reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. 
Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at sight of the valorous animal, his pistols, and the great, ugly cudgel in his grasp, and the whistling and pattering, which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry, died away and ceased, and all was very still. He made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge. Then, forsaking all paths, he set himself to traverse it, laboriously working over the whole ground, and all the time calling out cheerfully, Molly, 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 where are you? It's me, it's Old Rat. He had patiently hunted through the wood for an hour or more, when at last, to his joy, he heard a little answering cry. Guiding himself by the sound, he made his way through the gathering darkness to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it, and from out of the hole came a feeble voice saying, Ratty, is that really you? The rat crept into the hollow, and there he found the mole, exhausted and still trembling. Oh, rat, he cried, I've been so frightened you can't think. Oh, I quite understand, said the rat soothingly. You shouldn't really have gone and done it, Mole. I did my best to keep you from it. We river bankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. If we have to come, we come in couples at least. Then we're generally all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know, which we understand all about, and you don't as yet. I mean, passwords and signs and sayings, which have power and effect, and plants you carry in your pocket and verses you repeat, and dodges and tricks you practice. All simple enough when you know them, but they've got to be known if you're small, or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you were badger or otter, it would be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr. Toad wouldn't mind coming here by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Old Toad, said the rat, laughing heartily. He wouldn't show his face here alone. Not for a whole hatful of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was greatly cheered by the sound of the rat's careless laughter, as well as by the sight of his stick and his gleaming pistols, and he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Now then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together and make a start for home while there's still a little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you understand? Too cold, for one thing. Dear Ratty, said the poor Mole, I'm dreadfully sorry, but I'm simply dead beat, and that's a solid fact. You must let me rest here a while longer and get my strength back, if I'm to get home at all. Oh, all right, said the good-natured Rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now anyhow, and uh, there ought to be a bit of a moon later. So the mole got well into the dry leaves and stretched himself out, and presently dropped off into sleep, though of a broken and troubled sort, while the rat covered himself up too, as best he might, for warmth, and lay patiently waiting, with a pistol in his paw. When at last the mole woke up, much refreshed and in his usual spirits, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's quiet and then we really must be off. He went to the entrance of their retreat and put his head out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, here is a go. What's up, Ratty? asked the mole. Snow is up, replied the rat briefly. Or rather, down. It's snowing hard. The mole came and crouched beside him, and looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was springing up everywhere that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. A fine powder filled the air and caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch, and the black boles of the trees showed up in a light that seemed to come from below. Well, well, it can't be helped, said the rat, after pondering. We must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. 
The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are, and now the snow makes everything look so very different. It did indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same wood. However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed most promising, holding on to each other and pretending with invincible cheerfulness that they recognised an old friend in every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them, or saw openings, gaps or paths with a familiar turn in them, in the monotony of white space and black tree trunks that refused to vary. An hour or two later, they had lost all count of time, they pulled up, dispirited, weary and hopelessly at sea, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be done. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their little legs through it, and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood and no beginning and no difference in it, and worst of all, no way out. We can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it, and do something or other. The cold is too awful for anything, and the snow will soon be too deep for us to wade through. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. This is what occurs to me. There's a sort of dell down here in front of us, where the ground seems all hilly and humpy and hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try to find some sort of shelter, a cave or a hole with a dry floor to it, out of the snow and the wind. And there we'll have a good rest before we try again, for we're both of us pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off, or something may turn up. So, once more, they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell, where they hunted about for a cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind and the whirling snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits the rat had spoken of, when suddenly the mole tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. "'Oh, my leg!' he cried. "'Oh, my poor shin!' and he sat up on the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Poor old mole, said the rat kindly. You don't seem to be having much luck today, do you? Let's have a look at that leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knees to look. You've cut your shin, sure enough. Wait till I get my handkerchief and I'll tie it up for you. I must have tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh, my! Oh, my! It's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again attentively. That was never done by a branch or a stump. Looks as if it was made by a sharp edge of something in metal. Funny. He pondered a while and examined the humps and slopes that surrounded them. Well, never mind what done it, said the mole, forgetting his grammar and his pain. It hurts just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after carefully tying up the leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping in the snow. He scratched and shoveled and explored, all four legs working busily, while the mole waited impatiently, remarking at intervals, Oh, come on, rat! Suddenly, the rat cried, Hooray! And then, Hooray! 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 and fell to executing a feeble jig in the snow. "'What have you found, Ratty?' asked the mole, still nursing his leg. "'Come and see,' said the delighted rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. "'Well,' he said at last, slowly, "'I see it right enough, seen the same sort of thing before, lots of times. Familiar object, I call it. A door scraper. Well, what of it?' Why dance jigs around a door scraper? But don't you see what it means, you, you dough-witted animal? Cried the rat impatiently. Of course I see what it means, replied the mole. It simply means that some very careless and forgetful person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood, just where it's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call it. 
when i get home i shall go and complain about it to to somebody or other see if i don't oh dear oh dear cried the rat in despair at his obtuseness here stop arguing and come and scrape and he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around him after some further toil his efforts were rewarded and a very shabby doormat lay exposed to view there what did i tell you exclaimed the rat in great triumph absolutely nothing whatever replied the mole with perfect truthfulness well now he went on you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter done for and thrown away and i suppose you're perfectly happy better go ahead and dance your jig round that if you've got to and get it over and then perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps can we eat a doormat or sleep under a doormat or sit on a doormat and sledge home over the snow on it you exasperating rodent do you mean to say cried the excited rat that this doormat doesn't tell you anything really rat said the mole quite pettishly i think we'd had quite enough of this folly whoever heard of a doormat telling anyone anything they simply don't do it they are not that sort at all doormats know their place now look here you you thick-headed beast replied the rat really angry this must stop not another word but scrape scrape and scratch and dig and hunt round especially on the sides of the hummocks if you want to sleep dry and warm tonight, for this is our last chance the rat attacked a snowbank beside them with ardour probing with his cudgel everywhere and then digging with fury and the mole scraped busily too more to oblige the rat than for any other reason for his opinion was that his friend was getting light-headed some ten minutes hard work and the point of the rat's cudgel struck something that sounded hollow he worked till he could get a paw through and feel then called the mole to come and help him hard at it went the two animals till at last the result of their labours stood full in view of the astonished and hitherto incredulous mole in the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a solid-looking little door painted a dark green an iron bell pull hung by the side and below it on a small brass plate neatly engraved in square capital letters they could read by the aid of moonlight mr badger the mole fell backwards on the snow from sheer surprise and delight rat he cried in penitence you're a wonder a real wonder that's what you are i see it all now you argued it out step by step in that wise head of yours from the very moment i fell and cut my shin and you looked at the cut and at once your majestic mind said to itself door scraper and then you turned to and found the very door scraper that done it did you stop there no some people would have been quite satisfied but not you your intellect went on working let me only just find a doormat says you to yourself and my theory is proved and of course you found your doormat you're so clever i believe you could find anything you liked now says you that door exists as plain as if i saw it there's nothing else remains to be done but to find it well i've read about that sort of thing in books but i've never come across it before in real life you ought to go where you'll be properly appreciated you're simply wasted here among us fellows if i only had your head ratty but as you haven't interrupted the rat rather unkindly i suppose you're going to sit on the snow all night and talk get up at once and hang on to that bell pole you see there and ring hard as hard as you can while i hammer while the rat attacked the door with his stick the mole sprang up at the bell pool clutched it and swung there both feet well off the ground and from quite a long way off they could faintly hear a deep-toned bell respond chapter four mr badger they waited patiently for what seemed a very long time stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm at last they heard the sound of slow shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside it seemed as the mole remarked to the rat like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel which was intelligent of mole because that was exactly what it was 
there was the noise of a bolt shot back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. Now, the very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time, disturbing people on such a night? Speak up. Oh, Badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole, and we've lost our way in the snow. What, Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed the Badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must be perished. Well, I never, lost in the snow, and in the wild wood too, and at this time of night, but come in with you. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown, and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw and had probably been on his way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along, come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there and supper and everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and, to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of a central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long tunnel-like passages branching, passages mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well, stout, oaken, comfortable-looking doors, one of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large fire-lit kitchen. The floor was well-worn red brick, and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs, between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught. A couple of high-backed settles, facing each other on either side of the fire, gave further sitting accommodations for the sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song, or where two or three friends of simple tastes could sit about as they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling. The oaken settles, shiny with long wear, exchanged cheerful glances with each other, plates on the dresser grinned at pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to toast themselves at the fire, and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers, and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water and mended the cut with sticking plaster, till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better, in the embracing light and warmth, warm and dry at last, with weary legs propped up in front of them, and a suggestive clink of plates being arranged on the table behind, it seemed to the storm-driven animals, now in safe anchorage, that the cold and trackless wild wood just left outside was miles and miles away, and all that they had suffered in it a half-forgotten dream. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table, where he had been busy laying a repast. 
they had felt pretty hungry before but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spread for them really it seemed only a question of what they should attack first where all was so attractive and whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had time to give them attention conversation was impossible for a long time and when it was slowly resumed it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full the badger did not mind that sort of thing at all nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table or everybody speaking at once as he did not go into society himself he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter we know of course that he was wrong and took too narrow a view because they do matter very much though it would take too long to explain why he sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story and he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything and he never said i told you so or just what i always said or remarked that they ought to have done so and so or ought not to have done something else the mole began to feel very friendly towards him when supper was really finished at last and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late and so independent and so full and after they had chatted for a time about things in general the badger said heartily now then tell us the news from your part of the world how's old toad going on oh from bad to worse said the rat gravely while the mole cocked up on a settle and basking in the firelight his heels higher than his head tried to look properly mournful another smash-up only last week and a bad one you see he will insist on driving himself and he's hopelessly incapable if he'd only employ a decent steady well-trained animal pay him good wages and leave everything to him he'd get on all right but no he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver and nobody can teach him anything and all the rest follows how many has he had inquired the badger gloomily smashes or machines asked the rat oh well after all it's the same thing with toad this is the seventh as for the others you know that coach house of his well it's piled up literally piled up to the roof with fragments of motor cars none of them bigger than your hat that accounts for the other six so far as they can be accounted for he's been in hospital three times put in the mole and as for the fines he's had to pay it's simply awful to think of yes and that's part of the trouble continued the rat toad's rich we all know but he's not a millionaire and he's a hopelessly bad driver and quite regardless of law and order killed or ruined it's got to be one of the two things sooner or later badger we're his friends oughtn't we to do something the badger went through a bit of hard thinking now look here he said at last rather severely of course you know i can't do anything now his two friends assented quite understanding his point no animal according to the rules of animal etiquette is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter all are sleepy some actually asleep all are weather-bound more or less and all are resting from arduous days and nights during which every muscle in them has been severely tested and every energy kept at full stretch very well then continued the badger but when once the year has really turned and the nights are shorter and half-way through then one rouses and feels fidgety and wanting to be up and doing by sunrise if not before you know both animals nodded gravely they knew well then went on the badger we that is you and me and our friend the mole here we'll take toad seriously in hand we'll stand no nonsense whatever we'll bring him back to reason by force if need be we'll make him be a sensible toad we'll you're a sleep rat uh, not me said the rat waking up with a jerk 
he's been asleep two or three times since supper said the mole laughing he himself was feeling quite wakeful and even lively though he didn't know why the reason was of course that he being naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding the situation of badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home while the rat who slept every night in a bedroom the windows of which opened on a breezy river naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive well it's time we were all in bed said the badger getting up and fetching flat candlesticks come along you two and i'll show you to your quarters and take your time to-morrow morning breakfast at any hour you please he conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft the badger's winter stores which indeed were visible everywhere took up half the room piles of apples turnips and potatoes baskets full of nuts and jars of honey but the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting and the linen on them though coarse was clean and smelt beautifully of lavender and the mole and the water rat shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment in accordance with the kindly badger's injunctions the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late next morning and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen and two young hedgehogs sitting on a bench at the table eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls the hedgehogs dropped their spoons rose to their feet and ducked their heads respectfully as the two entered there <laughs> sit down sit down said the rat pleasantly and go on with your porridge where have you youngsters come from lost your way in the snow i suppose yes please sir said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully me and little billy here we was trying to find our way to school mother would have us go was the weather ever so and of course we lost ourselves sir and billy he got frightened and took and cried being young and faint-hearted and at last we happened up against mr badger's back door and made so bold as to knock sir for mr badger he is a kind-hearted gentleman as everyone knows i understand said the rat cutting himself some rashes from a side of bacon while the mole dropped some eggs into a saucepan and what's the weather like outside you needn't sir me quite so much he added oh terrible bad sir terrible deep the snow is said the hedgehog no getting out for the likes of you gentlemen to-day where's mr badger inquired the mole as he warmed the coffee pot before the fire the master's gone into his study sir replied the hedgehog and he said as how he was going to be particular busy this morning and on no account was he to be disturbed this explanation of course was thoroughly understood by every one present the fact is as already set forth when you live a life of intense activity for six months in the year and of comparative or actual somnolence for the other six during the latter period you cannot be continually pleading sleepiness when there are people about or things to be done the excuse gets monotonous the animals well knew that badger having eaten a hearty breakfast had retired to his study and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red cotton handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year the front door bell clanged loudly and the rat who was very greasy with buttered toast sent billy the smaller hedgehog to see who it might be there was a sound of much stamping in the hall and presently billy returned in front of the otter who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting get off spluttered the rat with his mouth full thought i should find you here all right said the otter cheerfully they were all in a great state of alarm along river bank when i arrived this morning rat never been home all night nor mole either something dreadful must have happened they said and the snow had covered up all your tracks of course but i knew that when people were in any fix they mostly went to badger or else badger got to know of it somehow so i came straight off here through the wild wood and the snow my 
it was fine coming through the snow as the red sun was rising and showing against the black tree trunks as you went along in the stillness every now and then masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a flop making you jump and run for cover snow castles and snow caverns had sprung up out of nowhere in the night and snow bridges terraces ramparts i could have stayed and played with them for hours here and there great branches had been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky conceited way just as if they had done it themselves a ragged string of wild geese passed overhead high on the grey sky and a few rooks whirled over the trees inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression but i met no sensible being to ask the news of about halfway across i came on a rabbit sitting on a stump cleaning his silly face with his paws he was a pretty scared animal when i crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder i had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it at all at last i managed to extract from him that mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them it was the talk of the burrows he said how mole mr rat's particular friend was in a bad fix how he had lost his way and they were up and out hunting and were chivying him round and round then why didn't any of you do something i asked you may not be blessed with brains but there are hundreds and hundreds of you big stout fellows as fat as butter and your burrows running in all directions and you could have taken him in and made him safe and comfortable or try to at all events what us he merely said do something us rabbits so i cuffed him again and left him there was nothing else to be done at any rate i had learned something and if i had had the luck to meet any of them i'd have learned something more or they would weren't you at all uh nervous asked the mole some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood <laughs> nervous the otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed i'd give him nerves if any of them tried anything on with me here mole fry me some slices of ham like the good little chap you are i'm frightfully hungry and i've got any amount to say to ratty here I haven't seen him for an age so the good-natured mole having cut some slices of ham set the hedgehogs to fry it and returned to his own breakfast while the otter and the rat their heads together eagerly talked river shop which is long shop and talk that is endless running on like the babbling river itself a plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when the badger entered yawning and rubbing his eyes and greeted them all in his quiet simple way with kind inquiries for everyone it must be getting on for luncheon time he remarked to the otter better stop and have it with us you must be hungry this cold morning rather replied the otter winking at the mole the sight of these greedy young hedgehogs stuffing themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished the hedgehogs who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porridge and after working so hard at their frying looked timidly up at mr badger but were too shy to say anything here you two youngsters be off home to your mother said the badger kindly i'll send someone with you to show you the way you won't want any dinner to-day i'll be bound he gave them sixpence apiece and a pat on the head and they went off with much respectful swinging of caps and touching of forelocks presently they all sat down to luncheon together the mole found himself placed next to mr badger and as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them he took the opportunity to tell badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him once well underground he said you know exactly where you are nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you you're entirely your own master and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say things go on all the same overhead and you let em and don't bother about em when you want to up you go and there the things are waiting for you 
The badger simply beamed on him. That's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no security or peace and tranquillity except underground. And then, if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why, a dig and a scrape, and there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two, and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over your wall, and, above all, no weather. Look at Rat now, a couple of feet of flood water, and he's got to move into hired lodgings, uncomfortable, inconveniently situated, and horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall, quite the best house in these parts as a house. But supposing a fire breaks out, where's Toad? Supposing tiles are blown off, or walls sink or crack, or windows get broken, where's Toad? Supposing the rooms are draughty, I hate a draught myself, where's Toad? No, up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily, and the badger, in consequence, got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started a heated argument on the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern and bade the mole follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels, and the wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into another corridor, and here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all. At the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings of the crammed store chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Badger, he said at last, did you ever find time and strength to do all this? It's astonishing. It would be astonishing indeed, said the Badger simply. If I had done it, but as a matter of fact, I did none of it, only cleaned out the passages and chambers as far as I had need of them. There's lots more of it all round about. I see you don't understand, and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wildwood waves now, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it is now, there was a city, a city of people, you know. Here, where we are standing, they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses and feasted. From here they rode out to fight or drove out to trade. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last, for they thought their city would last for ever. But what has become of them all? asked the mole. Who can tell? said the badger. People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build, and they go. It is their way, but we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be, and now there are badgers here again. We are an enduring lot, and we may move out for a time, but we wait, and are patient, and that we come. And so it will ever be. Well, and when they went at last, those people, said the mole. When they went, continued the badger, the strong winds and persistent rains took the matter in hand, patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. Perhaps we badgers, too, in our small way, helped a little. Who knows? It was all down, 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 gradually, ruin and levelling and disappearance. Then it was all up, 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 gradually, as seeds grew to saplings, and saplings to forest trees, and bramble and fern came creeping in to help. Leaf mould rose and obliterated, Streams in their winter freshet brought sand and soil to clog and to cover, and in course of time our home was ready for us again, and we moved in. Up above us, on the surface, the same thing happened. Animals arrived, liked the look of the place, took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. They didn't bother themselves about the past, they never do. They're too busy. The place was a bit bumpy and hillocky, naturally, and full of holes, but that was rather an advantage. And they don't bother about the future either, the future when perhaps the people will move in again, 
for a time as may very well be the wildwood is pretty well populated by now with all the usual lot good bad and indifferent i name no names it takes all sorts to make a world but i fancy you know something about them yourself by this time i do indeed said the mole with a slight shiver well well said the badger patting him on the shoulder it was your first experience of them you see and we must all live and let live but i'll pass the word around to-morrow and i think you'll have no further trouble any friend of mine walks where he likes in this country or i'll know the reason why when they got back to the kitchen again they found the rat walking up and down very restless the underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves and he seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it so he had his overcoat on and his pistols thrust into his belt again come along mole he said anxiously as soon as he caught sight of them we must get off while it's daylight don't want to spend another night in the wild wood again it'll be all right my fine fellow said the otter i'm coming along with you and i know every path blindfold and if there's a hedge that needs to be punched you can confidently rely upon me to punch it you really needn't fret ratty added the badger placidly my passages run further than you think and i bolt holes to the edge of the wood in several directions though i don't care for everybody to know about them when you really have to go you shall leave by one of my shortcuts meantime make yourself easy and sit down again the rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and attend to his river so the badger taking up his lantern again led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped part vaulted part hewn through solid rock for a weary distance that seemed to be miles at last daylight began to show itself confusedly through tangled growth overhanging the mouth of the passage and the badger bidding them a hasty good-bye pushed them hurriedly through the opening made everything look as natural as possible again with creepers brushwood and dead leaves and retreated they found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood rocks and brambles and tree roots behind them confusedly heaped and tangled in front a great space of quiet fields hemmed by lines of hedges black on the snow and far ahead a glint of the familiar old river while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon the otter as knowing all the paths took charge of the party and they trailed out on a bee-line for a distant stile pausing there a moment and looking back they saw the whole mass of the wild wood dense menacing compact grimly set in vast white surroundings simultaneously they turned and made swiftly for home for firelight and the familiar things it played on for the voice sounding cheerily outside their window of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods that never made them afraid with any amazement as he hurried along eagerly anticipating the moment when he would be at home again among the things he knew and liked the mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow linked to the ploughed furrow the frequented pasture the lane of evening lingerings the cultivated garden plot for others the asperities the stubborn endurance or the clash of actual conflict that went with nature in the rough he must be wise must keep to the pleasant places in which his lines were laid and which held adventure enough in their way to last for a lifetime the end of chapters three and four of the wind in the willows the remarkable rocket by oscar wilde this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain and for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rocket read by java man fire balloon read by grace buchanan prince read by luada bengal light duck and people read by t j burns
Squib Page and People, read by Jasmine Sama. Princess, Catherine Wheel, and Goose, read by Beth Thomas. Cracker, read by Honoria. Roman Candle, read by Lynette Calkins. Workman, People, read by Lynette Calkins. King, read by Adrian Stevens. Frog, read by Adrian Stevens. First Boy, read by Todd. Second Boy, read by Grace Buchanan. Narrated by Rob Marland. The Remarkable Rocket The King's son was going to be married, so there were general rejoicings. He had waited a whole year for his bride, and at last she had arrived. She was a Russian princess, and had driven all the way from Finland in a sledge drawn by six reindeer. The sledge was shaped like a great golden swan, and between the swan's wings lay the little princess herself. Her long ermine cloak reached right down to her feet, on her head was a tiny cap of silver tissue, and she was as pale as the snow palace in which she had always lived. So pale was she that as she drove through the streets, all the people wondered. She's like a white rose, they cried, and threw down flowers on her from the balconies. At the gate of the castle, the prince was waiting to receive her. He had dreamy violet eyes, and his hair was like fine gold. When he saw her, he sank upon one knee and kissed her hand. Your picture was beautiful, he murmured. But you are more beautiful than your picture. And the little princess blushed. She was like a white rose before, said a young page to his neighbour. But she is like a red rose now. And the whole court was delighted. For the next three days, everybody went about saying, White rose, red, red rose, rose, red rose, red rose, red rose white, white rose. rose. And the king gave orders that the page's salary was to be doubled. As he received no salary at all, this was not of much use to him, but it was considered a great honour, and was duly published in the court gazette. When the three days were over, the marriage was celebrated. It was a magnificent ceremony, and the bride and bridegroom walked hand in hand under a canopy of purple velvet embroidered with little pearls. Then there was a state banquet, which lasted for five hours. The prince and princess sat at the top of the great hall and drank out of a cup of clear crystal. Only true lovers could drink out of this cup, for if false lips touched it, it grew grey and dull and cloudy. It's quite clear that they love each other, said the little page. As clear as crystal. And the king doubled his salary a second time. <gasps> what, what an, an honour! Honor, cried all the courtiers. After the banquet, there was to be a ball. The bride and bridegroom were to dance the rose dance together, and the king had promised to play the flute. He played very badly, but no one had ever dared to tell him so, because he was the king. Indeed, he knew only two airs, and was never quite certain which one he was playing, but it made no matter, for whatever he did, everybody cried out, Charming! Charming! Charming. The last item on the programme was a grand display of fireworks, to be let off exactly at midnight. The little princess had never seen a firework in her life, so the king had given orders that the royal pyrotechnist should be in attendance on the day of her marriage. What are fireworks like? She had asked the prince one morning as she was walking on the terrace. They are like the Aurora Borealis, said the king, who always answered questions that were addressed to other people. Only much more natural. I prefer them to stars myself as you always know where they're going to appear, and they are as delightful as my own flute playing. You must certainly see them. So at the end of the king's garden a giant stand had been set up, and as soon as the royal pyrotechnist had put everything in its proper place, the fireworks began to talk to each other. The world is certainly very beautiful, cried a little squib. Just look at those yellow tulips. Why? If they were real crackers, they could not be lovelier. I am very glad I have travelled. Travel improves the mind wonderfully, 
and does away with all one's prejudices. The king's garden is not the world, you foolish squib, said a big Roman candle. The world is an enormous place, and it would take you three days to see it thoroughly. Any place you love is the world to you, exclaimed a pensive Catherine Wheel, who had been attached to an old deal box in early life and prided herself on her broken heart. But love is not fashionable any more. The poets have killed it. They wrote so much about it that nobody believed them, and I am not surprised. True love suffers and is silent. I remember myself once, but it is no matter now. Romance is a thing of the past. Nonsense, said the Roman candle. Romance never dies. It is like the moon and lives forever. The bride and bridegroom, for instance, love each other very dearly. I heard all about them this morning from a brown paper cartridge, who happened to be staying in the same drawer as myself and knew the latest court news. But the Catherine Wheel shook her head. Romance is dead. Romance is dead. Romance is dead, she murmured. She was one of those people who think that, if you say the same thing over and over a great many times, it becomes true in the end. Suddenly a sharp, dry cough was heard, <coughs> and they all looked round. It came from a tall, supercilious-looking rocket who was tied to the end of a long stick, he always coughed before he made any observation, so as to attract attention. <clears throat> <clears throat> he said, and everybody listened except the poor Catherine Wheel, who was still shaking her head and murmuring, Romance is dead. Order! Order! cried out a cracker. He was something of a politician, and had always taken a prominent part in the local elections, so he knew the proper parliamentary expressions to use. Quite dead, whispered the Catherine Wheel, and she went off to sleep. As soon as there was perfect silence, the rocket coughed a third time and began. He spoke with a very slow, distinct voice, as if he was dictating his memoirs, and always looked over the shoulder of the person to whom he was talking. In fact, he had a most distinguished manner. How fortunate it is for the king's son, he remarked, that he is to be married on the very day on which I am to be let off. Really, if it had been arranged beforehand, it could not have turned out better for him. But princes are always lucky. Dear me, said the little squib, I thought it was quite the other way, and that we were to be let off in the prince's honor. It may be so with you, he answered. Indeed, I have no doubt that it is, but with me it is different. I am a very remarkable rocket, and come of remarkable parents. My mother was the most celebrated Catherine Wheel of her day, and was renowned for her graceful dancing. When she made her great public appearance, she spun round nineteen times before she went out and each time that she did so she threw into the air seven pink stars. She was three feet and a half in diameter and made of the very best gunpowder. My father was a rocket like myself and of French extraction. He flew so high that the people were afraid that he would never come down again. He did, though, for he was of a kindly disposition, and he made a most brilliant descent in a shower of golden rain. The newspapers wrote about his performance in very flattering terms. Indeed, the court gazette called him a triumph of pyrotechnic art. Pyrotechnic. Pyrotechnic, you mean, said a Bengal light. I know it's pyrotechnic, for I saw it written on my own canister. Well. I said pylotechnic, answered the rocket, in a severe tone of voice, and the Bengal light felt so crushed that he began at once to bully the little squibs, in order to show that he was still a person of some importance. I was saying, continued the rocket, I was saying, 
What was I saying? You were talking about yourself, replied the Roman candle. Of course. I knew I was discussing some interesting subject when I was so rudely interrupted. I hate rudeness and bad manners of every kind, for I am extremely sensitive. No one in the whole world is so sensitive as I am. I am quite sure of that. What is a sensitive person? said the cracker to the Roman candle. A person who, because he has corns himself, always treads on other people's toes, answered the Roman candle in a low whisper, and the cracker nearly exploded with laughter. Pray, what are you laughing at? inquired the rocket. I am not laughing. <laughs> I'm laughing because I am happy, replied the cracker. That is a very selfish reason, said the rocket angrily. What right have you to be happy? You should be thinking about others. In fact, you should be thinking about me. I am always thinking about myself, and I expect everybody else to do the same. That is what is called sympathy. It is a beautiful virtue, and I possess it in a high degree. Suppose, for instance, anything happened to me tonight. What a misfortune that would be for everyone. The prince and princess would never be happy again. Their whole married life would be spoiled. And as for the king, I know he would not get over it. Really, when I begin to reflect on the importance of my position, I am almost moved to tears. If you want to give pleasure to others, cried the Roman candle, you had better keep yourself dry. Certainly exclaimed the Bengal light, who was now in better spirits. That is only common sense. Common sense, indeed, said the rocket indignantly. You forget that I am very uncommon and very remarkable. Why, anybody can have common sense, provided that they have no imagination. But I have imagination, for I never think of things as they really are. I always think of them as being quite different. As for keeping myself dry, there is evidently no one here who can at all appreciate an emotional nature. Fortunately for myself, I don't care. The only thing that sustains one through life is the consciousness of the immense inferiority of everybody else, and this is a feeling that I have always cultivated. But none of you have any hearts. Here you are, laughing and making merry, just as if the prince and princess had not just been married. Well, really, exclaimed a small fire balloon. Why not? It is a most joyful occasion, and when I soar up into the air, I intend to tell the stars all about it. You will see them twinkle when I talk to them about the pretty bride. Ah, uh, what a trivial view of life, said the rocket. But it is only what I expected. There is nothing in you. You are hollow and empty. Why, perhaps the prince and princess may go to live in a country where there is a deep river. And perhaps they may have one only son, a little fair-haired boy with violet eyes like the prince himself. And perhaps some day he may go out to walk with his nurse, and perhaps the nurse may go to sleep under a great elder tree, and perhaps the little boy may fall into the deep river and be drowned. What a terrible misfortune! Poor people! To lose their only son! It is really too dreadful. I shall never get over it. But they have not lost their only son said the Roman candle. No misfortune has happened to them at all. I never said that they had, replied the rocket. I said that they might. If they had lost their only son, there would be no use in saying anything more about the matter. I hate people who cry over spilt milk. But when I think that they might lose their only son, 
I certainly am very much affected. You certainly are, cried the Bengal light. In fact, you are the most affected person I ever met. You are the rudest person I ever met, said the rocket. And you cannot understand my friendship for the prince. Why, you don't even know him, growled the Roman candle. I never said I knew him, answered the rocket. I dare say that if I knew him, I should not be his friend at all. It is a very dangerous thing to know one's friends. You had really better keep yourself dry, said the fire balloon. That is the important thing. Very important for you, I have no doubt, answered the rocket. But I shall weep if I choose. And he actually burst into real tears, which flowed down his stick like raindrops and nearly drowned two little beetles, who were just thinking of setting up house together and were looking for a nice dry spot to live in. He must have a truly romantic nature, said the Catherine Wheel, for he weeps when there is nothing at all to weep about. And she heaved a deep sigh and thought about the deal box. <sighs> but the Roman candle and the Bengal light were quite indignant and kept saying, Humbug! Humbug! at the top of their voices. They were extremely practical, and whenever they objected to anything, they called it humbug. Then the moon rose like a wonderful silver shield, and the stars began to shine, and a sound of music came from the palace. The prince and princess were leading the dance. They danced so beautifully that the tall white lilies peeped in at the window and watched them, and the great red poppies nodded their heads and beat time. Then ten o'clock struck, and then eleven, and then twelve, and at the last stroke of midnight everyone came out onto the terrace, and the king sent for the royal pyrotechnist. Let the fireworks begin, said the king, and the royal pyrotechnist made a low bow, and marched down to the end of the garden. He had six attendants with him, each of whom carried a lighted torch at the end of a long pole, it was certainly a magnificent display. Whiz! Whiz! went the Catherine wheel as she spun round and round. Boom! Boom! went the Roman candle. Then the squibs danced all over the place, and the Bengal lights made everything look scarlet. Goodbye! cried the fire balloon as he soared away, dropping tiny blue sparks. Bang! Bang! answered the crackers who were enjoying themselves immensely. Everyone was a great success, except the remarkable rocket. He was so damp with crying that he could not go off at all. The best thing in him was the gunpowder, and that was so wet with tears that it was of no use. All his poor relations, to whom he would never speak except with a sneer, shot up into the sky like wonderful golden flowers with blossoms of fire. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the court, and the little princess laughed with pleasure. <laughs> I suppose they are reserving me for some grand occasion, said the rocket. No doubt, that is what it means. And he looked more supercilious than ever. The next day the workmen came to put everything tidy. This is evidently a deputation, said the rocket. I will receive them with becoming dignity. So he put his nose in the air and began to frown severely as if he were thinking about some very important subject. But they took no notice of him at all till they were just going away. Then one of them caught sight of him. Hello, he cried. What a bad rocket. And he threw him over the wall into the ditch. Bad rocket? Bad rocket? He said as he whirled through the air. Impossible! Grand rocket! That is what the man said. Bad and grand sound very much the same. Indeed, they often are the same. And he fell into the mud. It is not comfortable here, he remarked. But... 
No doubt it is some fashionable watering place, and they have sent me away to recruit my health. My nerves are certainly very much shattered, and I require rest. Then a little frog, with bright jewelled eyes and a green mottled coat, swam up to him. A new arrival, I see, said the frog. Well, after all, there is nothing like mud. Give me rainy weather and a ditch, and I am quite happy. Do you think it will be a wet afternoon? I am sure I hope so, but the sky is quite blue and cloudless. What a pity. <coughs> uh -huh, said the rocket, and he began to cough. <coughs> what a delightful voice you have, cried the frog. Really? It is quite like a croak, and croaking is, of course, the most musical sound in the world. You'll hear our glee club this evening. We sit in the old duck pond close by the farmer's house, and as soon as the moon rises, we begin. It's so entrancing that everybody lies awake to listen to us. In fact, it was only yesterday that I heard the farmer's wife say to her mother, that she could not get a wink of sleep at night on account of us. It is most gratifying to find oneself so popular. Ahem! Ahem! said the rocket angrily. He was very much annoyed that he could not get a word in. A delightful voice, certainly, continued the frog. I hope you will come over to the duck pond. I am off to look for my daughters. I have six beautiful daughters, and I'm so afraid the pike may meet them. He is a perfect monster, and would have no hesitation in breakfasting of them. Well, good-bye. I have enjoyed our conversation very much, I assure you. Conversation indeed, said the rocket. You have talked the whole time yourself. That is not conversation. Somebody must listen, answered the frog. And I like to do all the talking myself. It saves time and prevents arguments. But I like arguments, said the rocket. I hope not, said the frog complacently. Arguments are extremely vulgar, for everybody in good society holds exactly the same opinions. Goodbye a second time. I see my daughters in the distance. And the little frog swam away. You are a very irritating person said the rocket. And very ill-bred. I hate people who talk about themselves, as you do, when one wants to talk about oneself, as I do. It is what I call selfishness. And selfishness is a most detestable thing, especially to any one of my temperament, for I am well known for my sympathetic nature. In fact, you should take example by me. You could not possibly have a better model. Now that you have the chance, you had better avail yourself of it, for I am going back to court almost immediately. I am a great favorite at court. In fact, the prince and princess were married yesterday in my honor. Of course, you know nothing of these matters, for you are a provincial. There is no good talking to him, said a dragonfly, who was sitting on the top of a large brown bulrush. No good at all, for he has gone away. Well, that is his loss, not mine, answered the rocket. I am not going to stop talking to him merely because he pays no attention. I like hearing myself talk. It is one of my greatest pleasures. I often have long conversations all by myself, and I am so clever that sometimes I don't understand a single word of what I am saying. Then you should certainly lecture on philosophy, said the dragonfly, and he spread a pair of lovely gauze wings and soared away into the sky. How very silly of him not to stay here, said the rocket. I am sure that he has not often got such a chance of improving his mind. However, I don't care a bit. Genius like mine is sure to be appreciated some day. And he sank down a little deeper into the mud. After some time, a large white duck swam up to him. 
she had yellow legs and webbed feet and was considered a great beauty on account of her waddle quack, 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 she said what a curious shape you are may i ask were you born like that or is it the result of an accident it is quite evident that you have always lived in the country answered the rocket otherwise you would know who i am however i excuse your ignorance it would be unfair to expect other people to be as remarkable as oneself you will no doubt be surprised to hear that i can fly up into the sky and come down in a shower of golden rain i don't think much of that said the duck as i cannot see what use it is to anyone now if you could plough the fields like the ox or draw a cart like the horse or look after the sheep like the collie dog that would be something my good creature cried the rocket in a very haughty tone of voice i see that you belong to the lower orders a person of my position is never useful we have certain accomplishments and that is more than sufficient i have no sympathy myself with industry of any kind least of all with such industries as you seem to recommend indeed i have always been of opinion that hard work is simply the refuge of people who have nothing whatever to do well well said the duck who was of a very peaceable disposition and never quarrelled with anyone everybody has different tastes i hope at any rate that you are going to take up your residence here oh dear no cried the rocket i am merely a visitor a distinguished visitor the fact is that i find this place rather tedious there is neither society here nor solitude in fact it is essentially suburban i shall probably go back to court for i know that i am destined to make a sensation in the world i had thoughts of entering public life once myself remarked the duck there are so many things that need reforming indeed i took the chair at a meeting some time ago and we passed resolutions condemning everything that we did not like however they did not seem to have much effect now i go in for domesticity and look after my family i am made for public life said the rocket and so are all my relations even the humblest of them whenever we appear we excite great attention i have not actually appeared myself but when i do so it will be a magnificent sight as for domesticity it ages one rapidly and distracts one's mind from higher things ah the higher things of life how fine they are said the duck and that reminds me how hungry i feel and she swam away down the stream saying quack 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 come back come back screamed the rocket i have a great deal to say to you but the duck paid no attention to him i am glad that she has gone he said to himself she has a decidedly middle-class mind and he sank a little deeper still into the mud and began to think about the loneliness of genius when suddenly two little boys in white smocks came running down the bank with a kettle and some faggots this must be the deputation said the rocket and he tried to look very dignified hello cried one of the boys look at this old stick i wonder how it came here and he picked the rocket out of the ditch old stick said the rocket impossible gold stick that is what he said gold stick is very complimentary in fact he mistakes me for one of the court dignitaries let us put it into the fire said the other boy 
it will help to boil the kettle so they piled the faggots together and put the rocket on top and lit the fire this is magnificent cried the rocket they are going to let me off in broad daylight so that everyone can see me we, we will, will go, go to sleep, sleep now, now they said and, and when, when we, we wake, wake up the kettle, kettle will be boiled. boiled and they lay down on the grass and shut their eyes the rocket was very damp so he took a long time to burn at last however the fire caught him now i am going off he cried and he made himself very stiff and straight i know i shall go much higher than the stars much higher than the moon much higher than the sun in fact i shall go so high that and he went straight up into the air delightful he cried i shall go on like this forever what a success i am but nobody saw him then he began to feel a curious tingling sensation all over him now i am going to explode he cried i shall set the whole world on fire and make such a noise that nobody will talk about anything else for a whole year and he certainly did explode bang 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 went the gunpowder there was no doubt about it but nobody heard him not even the two little boys for they were sound asleep then all that was left of him was the stick and this fell down on the back of a goose who was taking a walk by the side of the ditch good heavens cried the goose it is going to rain sticks and she rushed into the water i knew i should create a great sensation gasped the rocket and he went out end of the remarkable rocket by oscar wilde The Diamond Necklace by Guy de Maupassant of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Betsy Walker. Mathilde Loisel, read by Sonia. Monsieur Loisel, read by Larry Wilson. Jean Forestier. Read by Beth Thomas. Hewler, read by phone. The girl was one of those pretty and charming young creatures who sometimes are born, as if by a slip of fate, into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no expectations, no way of being known, understood, loved, married by any rich and distinguished man. So she let herself be married to a little clerk of the Ministry of Public Instruction. She dressed plainly because she could not dress well. But she was unhappy, as if she had really fallen from a higher station, since with women there is neither caste nor rank, for beauty, grace, and charm take the place of family and birth. Natural ingenuity, instinct for what is elegant, a supple mind, are their sole hierarchy, and often make of women of the people the equals of the very greatest ladies. Matilda suffered ceaselessly, feeling herself born to enjoy all delicacies and all luxuries. She was distressed at the poverty of her dwelling, at the bareness of the walls, at the shabby chairs, the ugliness of the curtains. All those things, of which another woman of her rank would never even have been conscious, tortured her and made her angry. The sight of the little Breton peasant who did her humble housework aroused in her despairing regrets and bewildering dreams. She thought of silent antechambers, hung with oriental tapestry, illumined by tall bronze candelabra, and of two great footmen in knee breeches who sleep in the big armchairs made drowsy by the oppressive heat of the stove. She thought of long reception halls hung with ancient silk, of the dainty cabinets containing priceless curiosities, and of the little coquettish perfumed reception rooms made for chatting at five o'clock with intimate friends with men famous and sought after, whom all women envy and whose attention they all desire. 
When she sat down to dinner before the round table, covered with a tablecloth in use three days, opposite her husband, who uncovered the soup tureen and declared with a delighted air, Ah, oh, the good soup. I don't know anything better than that. She thought of dainty dinners, of shining silverware, of tapestry that peopled the walls with ancient personages and with strange birds flying in the midst of a fairy forest. And she thought of delicious dishes served on marvelous plates and of the whispered gallantries to which you listen with a sphinx-like smile while you are eating the pink meat of a trout or the wings of a quail. She had no gowns, no jewels, nothing. And she loved nothing but that. She felt made for that. She would have liked so much to please, to be envied, to be charming, to be sought after. She had a friend, a former schoolmate at the convent who was rich and whom she did not like to go see any more because she felt so sad when she came home. But one evening, her husband reached home with a triumphant air and holding a large envelope in his hand. There said he. There is something for you. She tore the paper quickly and drew out a printed card which bore these words. The Minister of Public Instruction and Madame Georges Ramponneau request the honor of Monsieur and Madame Loiselle's company at the Palace of the Ministry on Monday evening, January 18th. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation on the table, crossly muttering, What do you wish me to do with that? Why, my dear, I thought you would be glad. You never go out, and this is such a fine opportunity. I had great trouble to get it. Everyone wants to go. It is very select, and they are not giving many invitations to clerks. The whole official world will be there. She looked at him with an irritated glance and said impatiently, And what do you wish me to put on my back? He had not thought of that. He stammered. Oh, why, uh, the, the, the gown you go to the theater in, it looks very well to me. He stopped, distracted, seeing that his wife was weeping. Two great tears ran slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth. What's the matter? What's the matter? He answered. By a violent effort, she conquered her grief and replied in a calm voice while she wiped her wet cheeks. Nothing. Only I have no gown, and therefore I can't go to this ball. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better equipped than I am. He was in despair. He resumed. Come, let us see, Matilda. How much would it cost a suitable gown which you could use on other occasions? Uh, something very simple. She reflected several seconds, making her calculations, and wondering also what sum she could ask without drawing on herself an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she replied, hesitating, I don't know exactly, but I think I could manage it with 400 francs. He grew a little pale because he was laying aside just that amount to buy a gun and treat himself to a little shooting next summer on the plain of Nanterre with several friends who went to shoot larks there of a Sunday. But he said, Ah, oh, very well. I give you four hundred francs, and try to have a pretty gown. The day of the ball drew near, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, uneasy, anxious. Her frock was ready, however. Her husband said to her one evening, what is the matter? Come, you have seemed very queer these last three days. And she answered, It annoys me not to have a single piece of jewelry, not a single ornament, nothing to put on. I shall look poverty-stricken. I would almost rather not go at all. You might wear natural flowers, said her husband. They're very stylish at this time of year. For ten francs you can get two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, there's nothing more humiliating than to look poor among other women who are rich. How stupid you are. Her husband cried. Go look up your friend Madame Forrester and ask her to lend you some jewels. You're intimate enough with her to do that. She uttered a cry of joy. 
true i never thought of it the next day she went to her friend and told of her distress madame forestier went to a wardrobe with a mirror took out a large jewel box brought it back opened it and said to madame loiselle choose my dear she saw first some bracelets then a pearl necklace then a venetian gold cross set with precious stones of admirable workmanship she tried on the ornaments before the mirror hesitated and could not make up her mind to part with them to give them back she kept asking haven't you any more why yes look further i don't know what you like suddenly she discovered in a black satin box a superb diamond necklace and her heart throbbed with an immoderate desire her hands trembled as she took it she fastened it round her throat outside her high-necked waist and was lost in ecstasy at her reflection in the mirror then she asked hesitating filled with anxious doubt will you lend me this only this why yes certainly she threw her arms around her friend's neck kissed her passionately then fled with her treasure the night of the ball arrived madame loiselle was a great success she was prettier than any other woman present elegant graceful smiling and wild with joy all the men looked at her asked her name sought to be introduced all the attaches of the cabinet wished to waltz with her she was remarked by the minister himself she danced with rapture with passion intoxicated by pleasure forgetting all in the triumph of her beauty in the glory of her success in a sort of cloud of happiness comprised of all this homage admiration these awakened desires and that sense of triumph which is so sweet to a woman's heart she left the ball about four o'clock in the morning her husband had been sleeping since midnight in a little deserted ante-room with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying the ball he threw over her shoulders the wraps he had brought the modest wraps of common life the poverty of which contrasted with the elegance of the ball dress she felt this and wished to escape so as not to be remarked by the other women who were enveloping themselves in costly furs loiselle held her back saying wait a bit you will catch cold outside i will call a cab but she did not listen to him and rapidly descended the stairs when they reached the street they could not find a carriage and began to look for one shouting after the cabmen passing at a distance they went towards the seine in despair shivering with cold at last they found on the quay one of those ancient night cabs which as though they were ashamed to show their shabbiness during the day are never seen round paris until after dark it took them to their dwelling on the rue des martyrs and sadly they mounted the stairs to their flat all was ended for her as to him he reflected that he must be at the ministry at ten o'clock that morning she removed her wraps before the glass so as to see herself once more in all her glory but suddenly she uttered a cry she no longer had the necklace around her neck what is the matter with you demanded her husband already half undressed she turned distractedly toward him i have oh, i have i've lost madame forestier's necklace she cried he stood up bewildered what how impossible they looked among the folds of her skirt of her cloak in her pockets everywhere but they did not find it you're sure you had it on when you left the ball he asked yes i felt it in the vestibule of the minister's house but if you lost it in the street we should have heard it fall ah it must be in the cab yes probably did you take his number no and you you didn't notice it no they looked thunderstruck at each other at last loiselle put on his clothes ah i shall go back on foot said he over the whole route to see whether i can find it he went out she sat waiting on a chair in her ball dress without strength to go to bed overwhelmed without any fire without a thought her husband returned about seven o'clock he had found nothing he went to police headquarters to the newspaper offices to offer a reward he went to the cab companies everywhere in fact 
whither he was urged by the least spark of hope. She waited all day, in the same condition of mad fear before this terrible calamity. Loisel returned at night with a hollow, pale face. He had discovered nothing. You must write your friend, said he, that you have broken the clasp of her necklace and that you are having it mended. That will give us time to turn around. She wrote at his dictation. At the end of a week, they had lost all hope. Loiselle, who had aged five years, declared, We must consider how to replace that ornament. The next day they took the box that had contained it and went to the jeweler whose name was found within. He consulted his books. It was not I, madam, who sold that necklace. I must simply have furnished the case. Then they went from jeweler to jeweler, searching for a necklace like the other, trying to recall it, both sick with chagrin and grief. They found, in a shop on the Palais Royal, a string of diamonds that seemed to them exactly like the one they had lost. It was worth 40,000 francs. They could have it for 36. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days yet, and they made a bargain that he should buy it back for 34,000 francs in case they should find the lost necklace before the end of February. Loiselle possessed 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. He did borrow, asking a 1,000 francs of one, 500 of another, five louis here, three louis there. He gave notes, took up ruinous obligations, dealt with usurers and all the race of lenders. He compromised all the rest of his life, risked signing a note without even knowing whether he could meet it. And, frightened by the trouble yet to come, by the black misery that was about to fall upon him, by the prospect of all the physical privations and moral tortures that he was to suffer, he went to get the new necklace, laying upon the jeweler's counter 36,000 francs. When Madame Loiselle took back the necklace, Madame Forestier said to her with a chilly manner, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. She did not open the case, as her friend had so much feared. If she had detected the substitution, what would she have thought? What would she have said? Would she not have taken Madame Loiselle for a thief? Thereafter, Madame Loiselle knew the horrible existence of the needy. She bore her part, however, with sudden heroism. That dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their servant. They changed their lodgings they rented a garret under the roof. She came to know what heavy housework meant and the odious cares of the kitchen. She washed the dishes using her dainty fingers and rosy nails on greasy pots and pans. She washed the soiled linen, the shirts, and the dishcloths, which she dried upon a line. She carried the slops down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping for breath at every landing. And, dressed like a woman of the people, she went to the fruiterer, the grocer, the butcher, a basket on her arm, bargaining, meeting with impertinence, defending her miserable money sou by sou. Every month they had to meet some notes, renew others, obtain more time. Her husband worked evenings, making up a tradesman's accounts, and late at night he often copied manuscript for five sous a page. This life lasted ten years. At the end of ten years, they had paid everything, everything, with the rates of usury and the accumulations of the compound interest. Madame Loiselle looked old now. She had become the woman of impoverished households, strong and hard and rough. With frowsy hair, skirts askew and red hands, she talked loud while washing the floor with great swishes of water. But sometimes... When her husband was at the office, she sat down near the window and she thought of that gay evening of long ago, of that ball where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? How strange and changeful is life? How small a thing is needed to make or ruin us? But one Sunday... Having gone to take a walk in the Champs-Élysées to refresh herself after the labors of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman who was leading a child. It was Madame Forestier, 
still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Loisel felt moved. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all about it. Why not? She went up. Good day, Jeanne. The other, astonished to be familiarly addressed by this plain good wife, did not recognize her at all and stammered. But, madame, I do not know. You must have mistaken. No, I am Mathilde Loisel. Her friend uttered a cry. Oh, my poor Matilda, how you are changed. Yes, I have had a pretty hard life since I last saw you, and great poverty, and that because of you. Of me? How so? Do you remember that diamond necklace you lent me to wear at the ministerial ball? Yes, well? Well, I lost it. What do you mean? You brought it back. I brought you back another exactly like it, and it has taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us, for us who had nothing. At last it is ended, and I am very glad. Madame Forestier had stopped. You say that you bought a necklace of diamonds to replace mine? Yes. You never noticed it then. They were very similar. And she smiled with a joy that was at once proud and ingenuous. Madame Forestier, deeply moved, took her hands. Oh, my poor Matilda, why my necklace was paste. It was worth at most only five hundred francs. End of the Diamond Necklace The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator read by James K. White Roger Button read by Rob Marland Dr. Keen, read by Larry Wilson. First Nurse, read by Lynette Calkins. Second Nurse, read by Beth Thomas. Benjamin Button, read by Adrian Stevens. Store Clerk, played by Grace Buchanan. Mr. Hart, read by Kevin S. First Undergraduate, read by Lorda. Graduate 2, read by Patrick Glenn. Hildegard. Read by Abai. Townspeople. Read by Todd. Roscoe Button. Read by Chuck Williamson. Sentry. Read by Lorda. The Colonel. Read by Scott Calkins. Chapter 1. As long ago as 1860, it was the proper thing to be born at home. At present, so I am told, the high gods of medicine have decreed that the first cries of the young shall be uttered upon the anesthetic air of a hospital, preferably a fashionable one. So young Mr. and Mrs. Roger Button were fifty years ahead of style when they decided, one day in the summer of 1860, that their first baby should be born in a hospital. Whether this anachronism had any bearing upon the astonishing history I am about to set down will never be known. I shall tell you what occurred, and let you judge for yourself. The Roger Buttons held an enviable position, both social and financial, in antebellum Baltimore. They were related to the this family and the that family which, as every Southerner knew, entitled them to membership in that enormous peerage which largely populated the Confederacy. This was their first experience with the charming old custom of having babies. Mr. Button was naturally nervous. He hoped it would be a boy, so that he could be sent to Yale College in Connecticut, at which institution Mr. Button himself had been known for four years by the somewhat obvious nickname of Cuff. On the September morning consecrated to the enormous event, he arose nervously at six o'clock, dressed himself, adjusted an impeccable stock, and hurried forth through the streets of Baltimore to the hospital, to determine whether the darkness of the night had borne in new life upon its bosom. 
when he was approximately a hundred yards from the maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen he saw dr keen the family physician descending the front steps rubbing his hands together with a washing movement as all doctors are required to do by the unwritten ethics of their profession mr roger button the president of roger button and company wholesale hardware began to run toward dr keen with much less dignity than was expected from a southern gentleman of that picturesque period dr keen he called oh dr keen the doctor heard him faced around and stood waiting a curious expression settling on his harsh medicinal face as mr button drew near what happened demanded mr button as he came up in a gasping rush what was it how is she a boy who is it what talk sense said dr keen sharply he appeared somewhat irritated is the child born begged mr button dr keen frowned why yes i suppose so after a fashion again he threw a curious glance at mr button is my wife all right yes is it a boy or a girl here now cried dr keen in a perfect passion of irritation i'll ask you to go and see for yourself outrageous he snapped the last word out in almost one syllable then he turned away muttering do you imagine a case like this will help my professional reputation one more would ruin me ruin anybody what's the matter demanded mr button appalled triplets no not triplets answered the doctor cuttingly what's more you can go and see for yourself and get another doctor i brought you into this world young man and i've been physician to your family for forty years but i'm through with you i don't want to see you or any of your relatives ever again good-bye then he turned sharply and without another word climbed into his phaeton which was waiting at the curbstone and drove severely away mr button stood there upon the sidewalk stupefied and trembling from head to foot what horrible mishap had occurred he had suddenly lost all desire to go into the maryland private hospital for ladies and gentlemen it was with the greatest difficulty that a moment later he forced himself to mount the steps and enter the front door a nurse was sitting behind a desk in the opaque gloom of the hall swallowing his shame mr button approached her good morning she remarked looking up at him pleasantly good morning i i am mr button at this a look of utter terror spread itself over the girl's face she rose to her feet and seemed about to fly from the hall restraining herself only with the most apparent difficulty i want to see my child said mr button the nurse gave a little scream ah oh, oh of course she cried hysterically upstairs right upstairs go up she pointed the direction and mr button bathed in cool perspiration turned falteringly and began to mount to the second floor in the upper hall he addressed another nurse who approached him basin in hand i'm mr button he managed to articulate i want to see my clank the basin clattered to the floor and rolled in the direction of the stairs clank clank it began a methodical descent as if sharing in the general terror which this gentleman provoked i want to see my child mr button almost shrieked he was on the verge of collapse clank the basin reached the first floor the nurse regained control of herself and threw mr button a look of hearty contempt all right mr button she agreed in a hushed voice very well but if you knew what a state it's put us all in this morning it's perfectly outrageous the hospital will never have a ghost of a reputation after hurry he cried hoarsely i can't stand this come this way then mr button he dragged himself after her at the end of a long hall they reached a room from which proceeded a variety of howls 
indeed a room which in later parlance would have been known as the crying room they entered well gasped mr button which is mine there said the nurse mr button's eyes followed her pointing finger and this is what he saw wrapped in a voluminous white blanket and partly crammed into one of the cribs there sat an old man apparently about seventy years of age his sparse hair was almost white and from his chin dripped a long smoke-colored beard which waved absurdly back and forth fanned by the breeze coming in at the window he looked up at mr button with dim faded eyes in which lurked a puzzled question am i mad thundered mr button his terror resolving into rage is this some ghastly hospital joke it doesn't seem like a joke to us replied the nurse severely and i don't know whether you're mad or not but that is most certainly your child the cool perspiration redoubled on mr button's forehead he closed his eyes and then opening them looked again there was no mistake he was gazing at a man of threescore and ten a baby of threescore and ten a baby whose feet hung over the sides of the crib in which it was reposing the old man looked placidly from one to the other for a moment and then suddenly spoke in a cracked and ancient voice are you my father he demanded mr button and the nurse started violently because if you are went on the old man querulously i wish you'd get me out of this place or at least get them to put a comfortable rocker in here where in god's name did you come from who are you burst out mr button frantically i can't tell you exactly who i am replied the querulous whine because i've only been born a few hours but my last name is certainly button you lie you're an impostor the old man turned warily to the nurse nice way to welcome a newborn child he complained in a weak voice tell him he's wrong why don't you you're wrong mr button said the nurse severely this is your child and you'll have to make the best of it we're going to ask you to take him home with you as soon as possible sometime today home repeated mr button incredulously yes we can't have him here we really can't you know i'm right glad of it whined the old man this is a fine place to keep a youngster of quiet tastes with all this yelling and howling i haven't been able to get a wink of sleep i asked for something to eat here his voice rose to a shrill note of protest and they brought me a bottle of milk mr button sank down upon a chair near his son and concealed his face in his hands my heavens he murmured in an ecstasy of horror what will people say what must i do you'll have to take him home insisted the nurse immediately a grotesque picture formed itself with dreadful clarity before the eyes of the tortured man a picture of himself walking through the crowded streets of the city with this appalling apparition stalking by his side i can't i can't he moaned people would stop to speak to him and what was he going to say he would have to introduce this this septuagenarian this is my son born early this morning and then the old man would gather his blanket around him and they would plod on past the bustling stores the slave market for a dark instant mr button wished passionately that his son was black past the luxurious houses of the residential district past the home for the aged come pull yourself together commanded the nurse see here the old man announced suddenly if you think i'm going to walk home in this blanket you're entirely mistaken babies always have blankets with a malicious crackle the old man held up a small white swaddling garment look he quavered this is what they had ready for me babies always wear those said the nurse primly well said the old man this baby's not going to wear anything in about two minutes this blanket itches they might at least have given me a sheet keep it on keep it on said mr button hurriedly he turned to the nurse what'll i do 
Go downtown and buy your son some clothes. Mr. Button's son's voice followed him down into the hall. And a cane, father. I want to have a cane. Mr. Button banged the outer door savagely. Chapter 2 Good morning, Mr. Button said nervously to the clerk in the Chesapeake Dry Goods Company. I want to buy some clothes for my child. How old is your child, sir? About six hours, answered Mr. Button without due consideration. Baby supply department in the rear. Why, I don't think... I'm not sure that's what I want. It's... he's an unusually large-sized child. Exceptionally... Uh, large. They have the largest child's sizes. Right here. Where is the boys' department? inquired Mr. Button, shifting his ground desperately. He felt that the clerk must surely scent his shameful secret. Right here. Well... He hesitated. The notion of dressing his son in men's clothes was repugnant to him. If, say, he could only find a very large boy's suit, he might cut off that long and awful beard, dye the white hair brown, and thus manage to conceal the worst, and to retain something of his own self-respect, not to mention his position in Baltimore society. But a frantic inspection of the boys' department revealed no suits to fit the newborn button. He blamed the store, of course. In such cases, it is the thing to blame the store. How old did you say that boy of yours was? demanded the clerk curiously. He's sixteen. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you said six hours. You'll find the youth's department in the next aisle. Mr. Button turned miserably away. Then he stopped, brightened, and pointed his finger toward a dressed dummy in the window display. There, he exclaimed. I'll take that suit out there on the dummy. The clerk stared. Why? He protested. That's not a child's suit. At least it is. But it's for fancy dress. You could wear it yourself. Wrap it up, insisted the customer nervously. That's what I want. The astonished clerk obeyed. Back at the hospital, Mr. Button entered the nursery and almost threw the package at his son. Here's your clothes, he snapped out. The old man untied the package and viewed the contents with a quizzical eye. They look sort of funny to me, he complained. I don't want to be made a monkey of. You've made a monkey of me, retorted Mr. Button fiercely. Never you mind how funny you look. Put them on or I'll... or I'll spank you. He swallowed uneasily at the penultimate word feeling, nevertheless, that it was the proper thing to say. All right, father. This with a grotesque simulation of filial respect. You've lived longer. You know best. Just as you say. As before, the sound of the word father caused Mr. Button to start violently. And hurry. I'm hurrying, father. When his son was dressed, Mr. Button regarded him with depression. The costume consisted of dotted socks, pink pants, and a belted blouse with a wide white collar. Over the latter waved the long whitish beard, drooping almost to the waist. The effect was not good. Wait! Mr. Button seized a hospital shears, and with three quick snaps amputated a large section of the beard. But even with this improvement, the ensemble fell far short of perfection. The remaining brush of scraggly hair, the watery eyes, the ancient teeth seemed oddly out of tone with the gaiety of the costume. Mr. Button, however, was obdurate. He held out his hand. Come along, he said sternly. His son took the hand trustingly. What are you going to call me, Dad? He quavered as they walked from the nursery. Just baby for a while, till you think of a better name. Mr. Button grunted. I don't know, he answered harshly. I think we'll call you Methuselah. Chapter 3 Even after the new addition to the Button family had had his hair cut short, and then dyed to a sparse unnatural black, had had his face shaved so close that it glistened, 
and had been attired in small boy clothes made to order by a flabbergasted tailor it was impossible for button to ignore the fact that his son was a poor excuse for a first family baby despite his aged stoop benjamin button for it was by this name they called him instead of by the appropriate but invidious methuselah was five feet eight inches tall his clothes did not conceal this nor did the clipping and dyeing of his eyebrows disguise the fact that the eyes under were faded and watery and tired in fact the baby nurse who had been engaged in advance left the house after one look in a state of considerable indignation but mr button persisted in his unwavering purpose benjamin was a baby and a baby he should remain at first he declared that if benjamin didn't like warm milk he could go without food altogether but he was finally prevailed upon to allow his son bread and butter and even oatmeal by way of a compromise one day he brought home a rattle and giving it to benjamin insisted in no uncertain terms that he should play with it whereupon the old man took it with a weary expression and could be heard jingling it obediently at intervals throughout the day there can be no doubt though that the rattle bored him and that he found other and more soothing amusements when he was left alone for instance mr button discovered one day that during the preceding week he had smoked more cigars than ever before a phenomenon which was explained a few days later when entering the nursery unexpectedly he found the room full of faint blue haze and benjamin with a guilty expression on his face trying to conceal the butt of a dark havana this of course called for a severe spanking but mr button found that he could not bring himself to administer it he merely warned his son that he would stunt his growth nevertheless he persisted in his attitude he brought home lead soldiers he brought toy trains he brought large pleasant animals made of cotton and to perfect the illusion which he was creating for himself at least he passionately demanded of the clerk in the toy store whether the paint would come off the pink duck if the baby put it in his mouth but despite all his father's efforts benjamin refused to be interested he would steal down the back stairs and return to the nursery with a volume of the encyclopedia britannica over which he would pour through an afternoon while his cotton cows and his noah's ark were left neglected on the floor against such a stubbornness mr button's efforts were of little avail the sensation created in baltimore was at first prodigious what the mishap would have cost the buttons and their kinsfolk socially cannot be determined for the outbreak of the civil war drew the city's attention to other things a few people who were unfailingly polite racked their brains for compliments to give to the parents and finally hit upon the ingenious device of declaring that the baby resembled his grandfather a fact which due to the standard state of decay common to all men of seventy could not be denied mr and mrs roger button were not pleased and benjamin's grandfather was furiously insulted benjamin once he left the hospital took life as he found it several small boys were brought to see him and he spent a stiff jointed afternoon trying to work up an interest in tops and marbles he even managed quite accidentally to break a kitchen window with a stone from a slingshot a feat which secretly delighted his father thereafter benjamin contrived to break something every day but he did these things only because they were expected of him and because he was by nature obliging when his grandfather's initial antagonism wore off benjamin and that gentleman took enormous pleasure in one another's company they would sit for hours these two so far apart in age and experience and like old cronies discuss with tireless monotony the slow events of the day benjamin felt more at ease in his grandfather's presence than in his parents they seemed always somewhat in awe of him and despite the dictatorial authority they exercised over him frequently addressed him as mister he was as puzzled as anyone else at the apparently advanced age of his mind and body at birth he read up on it in the medical journal 
but found that no such case had been previously recorded. At his father's urging, he made an honest attempt to play with other boys, and frequently he joined in the milder games. Football shook him up too much, and he feared that in case of a fracture, his ancient bones would refuse to knit. When he was five, he was sent to kindergarten, where he initiated into the art of pasting green paper on orange paper, of weaving colored maps and manufacturing eternal cardboard necklaces. He was inclined to drowse off to sleep in the middle of these tasks, a habit which both irritated and frightened his young teacher. To his relief, she complained to his parents, and he was removed from the school. The Roger Buttons told their friends that they felt he was too young. By the time he was twelve years old, his parents had grown used to him. Indeed, so strong is the force of custom that they no longer felt that he was different from any other child, except when some curious anomaly reminded them of the fact. But one day, a few weeks after his twelfth birthday, while looking in the mirror, Benjamin made, or thought he made, an astonishing discovery. Did his eyes deceive him? or had his hair turned in the dozen years of his life from white to iron gray under its concealing dye? Was the network of wrinkles on his face becoming less pronounced? Was his skin healthier and firmer, with even a touch of ruddy winter color? He could not tell. He knew that he no longer stooped, and that his physical condition had improved since the early days of his life. Can it be? He thought to himself, or rather, scarcely dared to think. He went to his father. I am grown, he announced determinedly. I want to put on long trousers. His father hesitated. Well, he said finally, I don't know. Fourteen is the age for putting on long trousers, and you are only twelve. But you'll have to admit, protested Benjamin, that I'm big for my age. His father looked at him with illusory speculation. Oh, I'm not so sure of that, he said. I was as big as you when I was twelve. This was not true. It was all part of Roger Button's silent agreement with himself to believe in his son's normality. Finally, a compromise was reached. Benjamin was to continue to dye his hair. He was to make a better attempt to play with boys of his own age. He was not to wear his spectacles or carry a cane in the street. In return for these concessions, he was allowed his first suit of long trousers. Chapter 4 Of the life of Benjamin Button, between his twelfth and twenty-first year, I intend to say little. Suffice to record that they were years of normal ungrowth. When Benjamin was eighteen, he was erect as a man of fifty. He had more hair, and it was of a dark gray. His step was firm. His voice had lost its cracked quaver and descended to a healthy baritone. So his father sent him up to Connecticut to take examinations for entrance to Yale College. Benjamin passed his examination and became a member of the freshman class. On the third day following his matriculation, he received a notification from Mr. Hart, the college registrar, to call at his office and arrange his schedule. Benjamin, glancing in the mirror, decided that his hair needed a new application of its brown dye, but an anxious inspection of his bureau drawer disclosed that the dye bottle was not there. Then he remembered he had emptied it the day before and thrown it away. He was in a dilemma. He was due at the registrar's in five minutes. There seemed to be no help for it. He must go as he was. He did. Good morning, said the registrar politely. You've come to inquire about your son. Why, as a matter of fact, my name's Button, began Benjamin, but Mr. Hart cut him off. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Button. I'm expecting your son here any minute. That's me, burst out Benjamin. I'm a freshman. What? I'm a freshman. Surely you're joking. Not at all. The registrar frowned and glanced at a card before him. Why, I have Mr. Benjamin Button's age down here as eighteen. That's my age, asserted Benjamin, flushing slightly. The registrar eyed him warily. Now, surely, Mr. Button, you don't expect me to believe that. Benjamin smiled warily. I am eighteen, he repeated. The registrar pointed sternly to the door. 
Get out, he said. Get out of the college and get out of the town. You're a dangerous lunatic. I am 18. Mr. Hart opened the door. The idea, he shouted. A man of your age trying to enter here as a freshman. Eighteen years old, are you? Well, I'll give you eighteen minutes to get out of town. Benjamin Button walked with dignity from the room, and half a dozen undergraduates who were waiting in the hall followed him curiously with their eyes. When he had gone a little way, he turned around, faced the infuriated registrar, who was still standing in the doorway, and repeated in a firm voice, I am eighteen years old. To a chorus of titters which went up from the group of undergraduates, Benjamin walked away. But he was not fated to escape so easily. On his melancholy walk to the railroad station, he found that he was being followed by a group, then by a swarm, and finally by a dense mass of undergraduates. The word had gone around that a lunatic had passed the entrance examinations for Yale and attempted to palm himself off as a youth of eighteen. A fever of excitement permeated the college. Men ran hatless out of classes. The football team abandoned its practice and joined the mob. Professors' wives, with bonnets awry and bustles out of position, ran shouting after the procession, from which proceeded a continual succession of remarks aimed at the tender sensibilities of Benjamin Button. He must be the wandering Jew. He ought to go to the prep school at his age. Look at the infant prodigy. He thought this was the old man's home. Go up to Harvard. Benjamin increased his gait, and soon he was running. He would show them. He would go to Harvard, and then they would regret these ill-considered taunts. Safely on board the train for Baltimore, he put his head from the window. You'll regret this, he shouted. Ha <laughs> ha! The undergraduates laughed. Ha ha ha! It was the biggest mistake that Yale College had ever made. Chapter 5 In 1880, Benjamin Button was twenty years old, and he signalized his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button & Company Wholesale Hardware. It was in that same year that he began going out socially. That is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now fifty and he and his son were more and more companionable. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still grayish, they appeared about the same age, and could have passed for brothers. One night in August, they got into the Phaeton attired in their full dress suits, and drove out to a dance at the Shevlin's Country House, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lusterless color of platinum and late-blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low, half-heard laughter. The open country, carpeted for rods around with bright wheat, was translucent as in the day. It was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky. Almost. There's a great future in the dry goods business, Roger Button was saying. He was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. Old fellows like me can't learn new tricks, he observed profoundly. It's you youngsters with energy and vitality that have the great future before you. Far up the road, the lights of the Shevlin's country house drifted into view, and presently there was a sighing sound that crept persistently toward them. It might have been the fine plaint of violins or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. They pulled up behind a handsome broham, whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. An almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him. Blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was ashen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustled dress. 
Roger Button leaned over to his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncrief, the daughter of General Moncrief. Benjamin nodded coldly. Pretty little thing, he said, indifferently. But when the negro boy had led the buggy away, he added, Dad, you might introduce me to her. They approached a group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she curtsied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of Baltimore as they eddied around Hildegard Moncrief, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin, how intolerably rosy. Their curly brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, his jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. You and your brother got here just as we did, didn't you? asked Hildegard, looking up at him with eyes that were like bright blue enamel. Benjamin hesitated. If she took him for his father's brother, would it be best to enlighten her? He remembered his experience at Yale, so he decided against it. It would be rude to contradict a lady. It would be criminal to mar this exquisite occasion with the grotesque story of his origin. Later, perhaps. So he nodded, smiled, listened, was happy. I like men of your age, Hildegard told him. Young boys are so idiotic. They tell me how much champagne they drink at college and how much money they lose playing cards. Men of your age know how to appreciate women. Benjamin felt himself on the verge of a proposal. With an effort, he choked back the impulse. You're just a romantic age, she continued. Fifty. Twenty-five is too worldly wise. Thirty is apt to be pale from overwork. Forty is the age of long stories that take a whole cigar to tell. Sixty is... Oh, sixty is too near seventy. But fifty is the mellow age. I love fifty. Fifty seemed to Benjamin a glorious age. He longed passionately to be fifty. I've always said, went on Hildegard, that I'd rather marry a man of fifty and be taken care of then marry a man of thirty and take care of him. For Benjamin, the rest of the evening was bathed in a honey-colored mist. Hildegard gave him two more dances, and they discovered that they were marvelously in accord on all the questions of the day. She was to go driving with him on the following Sunday, and then they would discuss all these questions further. Going home in the Phaeton just before the crack of dawn, when the first bees were humming and the fading moon glimmered in the cool dew, Benjamin knew vaguely that his father was discussing wholesale hardware. And what do you think should merit our biggest attention after hammers and nails? The elder Button was saying. Laugh, replied Benjamin absent-mindedly. Lugs? exclaimed Roger Button. Why, I've just covered the question of lugs. Benjamin regarded him with dazed eyes, just as the eastern sky was suddenly cracked with light, and an oriole yawned piercingly in the quickening trees. Chapter 6 When six months later the engagement of Miss Hildegard Moncrief to Mr. Benjamin Button was made known, I say made known, for General Moncrief declared he would rather fall upon his sword than announce it, the excitement in Baltimore society reached a feverish pitch. The almost forgotten story of Benjamin's birth was remembered and sent out upon the winds of scandal in picaresque and incredible forms. It was said that Benjamin was really the father of Roger Button, that he was his brother who had been in prison for forty years, that he was John Wilkes Booth in disguise and, finally, that he had two small conical horns sprouting from his head. 
the sunday supplements of the new york papers played up the case with fascinating sketches which showed the head of benjamin button attached to a fish to a snake and finally to a body of solid brass he became known journalistically as the mystery man of maryland but the true story as is usually the case had a very small circulation however everyone agreed with general moncrief that it was criminal for a lovely girl who could have married any beau in baltimore to throw herself into the arms of a man who was assuredly fifty in vain mr roger button published his son's birth certificate in large type in the baltimore blaze no one believed it you had only to look at benjamin and see on the part of the two people most concerned there was no wavering so many of the stories about her fiancé were false that hildegard refused stubbornly to believe even the true one in vain general moncrief pointed out to her the high mortality among men of fifty or at least among men who looked fifty in vain he told her of the instability of the wholesale hardware business hildegard had chosen to marry for mellowness and marry she did chapter seven in one particular at least the friends of hildegard moncrief were mistaken the wholesale hardware business prospered amazingly in the fifteen years between benjamin button's marriage in eighteen eighty and his father's retirement in eighteen ninety five the family fortune was doubled and this was due largely to the younger member of the firm needless to say baltimore eventually received the couple to its bosom even old general moncrief became reconciled to his son-in-law when benjamin gave him the money to bring out his history of the civil war in twenty volumes which had been refused by nine prominent publishers in benjamin himself fifteen years had wrought many changes it seemed to him that the blood flowed with new vigor through his veins it began to be a pleasure to rise in the morning to walk with an active step along the busy sunny street to work untiringly with his shipments of hammers and his cargoes of nails it was in eighteen ninety that he executed his famous business coup he brought up the suggestion that all nails used in nailing up the boxes in which nails are shipped are the property of the shippee a proposal which became a statute was approved by chief justice fossil and saved roger button and company wholesale hardware more than six hundred nails every year in addition benjamin discovered that he was becoming more and more attracted by the gay side of life it was typical of his growing enthusiasm for pleasure that he was the first man in the city of baltimore to own and run an automobile meeting him on the street his contemporaries would stare enviously at the picture he made of health and vitality he seems to grow younger every year they would remark and if old roger button now sixty-five years old had failed at first to give a proper welcome to his son he atoned at last by bestowing on him what amounted to adulation and here we come to an unpleasant subject which it will be well to pass over as quickly as possible there was only one thing that worried benjamin button his wife had ceased to attract him at that time hildegard was a woman of thirty-five with a son roscoe fourteen years old in the early days of their marriage benjamin had worshipped her but as the years passed her honey-coloured hair became an unexciting brown the blue enamel of her eyes assumed the aspect of cheap crockery moreover and most of all she had become too settled in her ways too placid too content too anemic in her excitements and too sober in her taste as a bride it had been she who had dragged benjamin to dances and dinners now conditions were reversed she went out socially with him but without enthusiasm devoured already by that eternal inertia which comes to live with each of us one day and stays with us to the end benjamin's discontent waxed stronger at the outbreak of the spanish-american war in eighteen ninety eight his home had for him so little charm that he decided to join the army with his business influence he obtained a commission as captain and proved so adaptable to the work that he was made a major and finally a lieutenant-colonel 
just in time to participate in the celebrated charge up San Juan Hill. He was slightly wounded and received a medal. Benjamin had become so attached to the activity and excitement of army life that he regretted to give it up, but his business required attention, so he resigned his commission and came home. He was met at the station by a brass band and escorted to his house. Chapter 8 Hildegard, waving a large silk flag, greeted him on the porch, and even as he kissed her he felt with a sinking of the heart that these three years had taken their toll. She was a woman of forty now, with a faint skirmish line of gray hairs in her head. The sight depressed him. Up in his room he saw his reflection in the familiar mirror. He went closer and examined his own face with anxiety, comparing it after a moment with a photograph of himself in uniform taken just before the war. Good Lord, he said aloud. The process was continuing. There was no doubt of it. He looked now like a man of thirty. Instead of being delighted, he was uneasy. He was growing younger. He had hitherto hoped that once he reached a bodily age equivalent to his age in years, the grotesque phenomenon which had marked his birth would cease to function. He shuddered. His destiny seemed to him awful, incredible. When he came downstairs, Hildegard was waiting for him. She appeared annoyed, and he wondered if she had at last discovered that there was something amiss. It was with an effort to relieve the tension between them that he broached the matter at dinner in what he considered a delicate way. Well, he remarked lightly, everybody says I look younger than ever. Hildegard regarded him with scorn. She sniffed. Do you think it's anything to boast about? I'm not boasting, he asserted uncomfortably. She sniffed again. The idea, she said, and after a moment, I should think you'd have enough pride to stop it. How can I, he demanded. I'm not going to argue with you, she retorted. But there's a right way of doing things and a wrong way. If you've made up your mind to be different from everybody else, I don't suppose I can stop you. But I really don't think it's very considerate. But, Hildegard, I can't help it. You can, too. You're simply stubborn. You think you don't want to be like anyone else. You always have been that way, and you always will be. But just think how it would be if everyone else looked at things as you do. What would the world be like? As this was an inane and unanswerable argument, Benjamin made no reply, and from that time on a chasm began to widen between them. He wondered what possible fascination she had ever exercised over him. To add to the breach, he found, as the new century gathered headway, that his thirst for gaiety grew stronger. Never a party of any kind in the city of Baltimore, but he was there, dancing with the prettiest of the young married women, chatting with the most popular of the debutantes, and finding their company charming, while his wife, a dowager of evil omen, sat among the chaperones now in haughty disapproval, and now following him with solemn, puzzled, and reproachful eyes. Look, people would remark, what a pity, a young fellow that age tied to a woman of forty-five. He must be twenty years younger than his wife. They had forgotten, as people inevitably forget, that back in 1880, their mamas and papas had also remarked about this same ill-matched pair. Benjamin's growing unhappiness at home was compensated for by his many new interests. He took up golf and made a great success of it. He went in for dancing. In 1906, he was an expert at the Boston and in 1908 he was considered proficient at the Maxine, while in 1909 his castle walk was the envy of every young man in town. His social activities, of course, interfered to some extent with his business, but then he had worked hard at wholesale hardware for 25 years, and felt that he could soon hand it on to his son, Roscoe, who had recently graduated from Harvard. He and his son were, in fact, often mistaken for each other, this pleased Benjamin. He soon forgot the insidious fear which had come over him on his return from the Spanish-American War, and grew to take a naive pleasure in his appearance. 
there was only one fly in the delicious ointment he hated to appear in public with his wife hildegard was almost fifty and the sight of her made him feel absurd chapter nine one september day in nineteen ten a few years after roger button and company wholesale hardware had been handed over to young roscoe button a man apparently about twenty years old entered himself as a freshman at harvard university in cambridge he did not make the mistake of announcing that he would never see fifty again nor did he mention the fact that his son had been graduated from the same institution ten years before he was admitted and almost immediately attained a prominent position in the class partly because he seemed a little older than the other freshmen whose average age was about eighteen but his success was largely due to the fact that in the football game with yale he played so brilliantly with so much dash and with such a cold remorseless anger that he scored seven touchdowns and fourteen field goals for harvard and caused one entire eleven of yale men to be carried singly from the field unconscious he was the most celebrated man in college strange to say in his third or junior year he was scarcely able to make the team the coaches said that he had lost weight and it seemed to the more observant among them that he was not quite as tall as before he made no touchdowns indeed he was retained on the team chiefly in hope that his enormous reputation would bring terror and disorganization to the yale team in his senior year he did not make the team at all he had grown so slight and frail that one day he was taken by some sophomores for a freshman an incident which humiliated him terribly he became known as something of a prodigy a senior who was surely no more than sixteen and he was often shocked at the worldliness of some of his classmates his studies seemed harder to him he felt that they were too advanced he had heard his classmates speak of st midas's the famous preparatory school at which so many of them had prepared for college and he determined after his graduation to enter himself at st midas's where the sheltered life among boys his own size would be more congenial to him upon his graduation in 1914 he went home to baltimore with his harvard diploma in his pocket hildegard was now residing in italy so benjamin went to live with his son roscoe but though he was welcomed in a general way there was obviously no heartiness in roscoe's feeling toward him there was even perceptible a tendency on his son's part to think that benjamin as he moped about the house in adolescent mooniness was somewhat in the way roscoe was married now and prominent in baltimore life and he wanted no scandal to creep out in connection with his family benjamin no longer persona grata with the debutantes and younger college set found himself left much done except for the companionship of three or four fifteen-year-old boys in the neighborhood his idea of going to st midas's school recurred to him say he said to roscoe one day i've told you over and over that i want to go to prep school well go then replied roscoe shortly the matter was distasteful to him and he wished to avoid a discussion i can't go alone said benjamin helplessly you'll have to enter me and take me up there i haven't got the time declared roscoe abruptly his eyes narrowed and he looked uneasily at his father as a matter of fact he added you'd better not go on with this business much longer you better pull up short you better you better he paused and his face crimsoned as he sought for words you better turn around and start right back the other way this has gone too far to be a joke it isn't funny any more you you behave yourself benjamin looked at him on the verge of tears and another thing continued roscoe when visitors are in the house i want you to call me uncle not roscoe but uncle do you understand it looks absurd for a boy of fifteen to call me by my first name perhaps you'd better call me uncle all the time so you'll get used to it with a harsh look at his father 
Roscoe turned away. Chapter 10 At the termination of this interview, Benjamin wandered dismally upstairs and stared at himself in the mirror. He had not shaved for three months, but he could find nothing on his face but a faint white down with which it seemed unnecessary to meddle. When he had first come home from Harvard, Roscoe had approached him with the proposition that he should wear eyeglasses and imitation whiskers glued to his cheeks, and it had seemed for a moment that the farce of his early years was to be repeated, but whiskers had itched and made him ashamed. He wept, and Roscoe had reluctantly relented. Benjamin opened a book of boys' stories, The Boy Scouts in Bimini Bay, and began to read. But he found himself thinking persistently about the war. America had joined the Allied cause during the preceding month, and Benjamin wanted to enlist. But alas, sixteen was the minimum age, and he did not look that old. His true age, which was fifty-seven, would have disqualified him anyway. There was a knock at his door, and the butler appeared with a letter bearing a large official legend in the corner and addressed to Mr. Benjamin Button. Benjamin tore it open eagerly and read the enclosure with delight. It informed him that many reserve officers who had served in the Spanish-American War were being called back into service with a higher rank, and it enclosed his commission as Brigadier General in the United States Army with orders to report immediately. Benjamin jumped to his feet fairly quivering with enthusiasm. This was what he wanted. He seized his cap, and ten minutes later he had entered a large tailoring establishment on Charles Street and asked in his uncertain treble to be measured for a uniform. Want to play soldier, Sonny? demanded a clerk casually. Benjamin flushed. Say, never mind what I want, he retorted angrily. My name's Button and I live on Mount Vernon Place, so you know I'm good for it. Well, admitted the clerk hesitantly, if you're not, I guess your daddy is all right. Benjamin was measured, and a week later his uniform was completed. He had difficulty in obtaining the proper general's insignia, because the dealer kept insisting to Benjamin that a nice VWCA badge would look just as well and be much more fun to play with. Saying nothing to Roscoe, he left the house one night and proceeded by train to Camp Mosby in South Carolina, where he was to command an infantry brigade. On a sultry April day, he approached the entrance to the camp, paid off the taxicab which had brought him from the station, and turned to the sentry on guard. Get someone to handle my luggage, he said briskly. The sentry eyed him reproachfully. Say, he remarked. Where are you going with the general starts, Sonny? Benjamin, veteran of the Spanish-American War, whirled upon him with fire in his eye, but with, alas, a changing treble voice. Come to attention, he tried to thunder. He paused for breath. Then suddenly he saw the sentry snap his heels together and bring his rifle to the present. Benjamin concealed a smile of gratification, but when he glanced around, his smile faded. It was not he who had inspired obedience, but an imposing artillery colonel who was approaching on horseback. Colonel! called Benjamin shrilly. The colonel came up, drew rein, and looked coolly down at him with a twinkle in his eyes. Whose little boy are you? he demanded kindly. I'll soon darn well show you whose little boy I am, retorted Benjamin in a ferocious voice. Get down off that horse! The colonel roared with laughter. <laughs> you want him, eh, General? Here, cried Benjamin desperately. Read this. And he thrust his commission toward the colonel. The colonel read it, his eyes popping from their sockets. Where'd you get this? He demanded, slipping the document into his own pocket. I got it from the government, as you'll soon find out. You come along with me, said the colonel, with a peculiar look. We'll go up to headquarters and talk this over. Come along. The colonel turned and began walking his horse in the direction of headquarters. There was nothing for Benjamin to do but follow with as much dignity as possible, meanwhile promising himself a stern revenge. But this revenge did not materialize. Two days later, however, his son Roscoe materialized from Baltimore, hot and cross from a hasty trip, and escorted the weeping general, sans uniform, back to his home. 
Chapter 11 In 1920, Roscoe Button's first child was born. During the attendant festivities, however, no one thought it the thing to mention that the little grubby boy, apparently about ten years of age, who played around the house with lead soldiers and a miniature circus, was the new baby's own grandfather. No one disliked the little boy, whose fresh, cheerful face was crossed with just a hint of sadness, but to Roscoe Button his presence was a source of torment. In the idiom of his generation, Roscoe did not consider the matter efficient. It seemed to him that his father, in refusing to look sixty, had not behaved like a red-blooded he-man. This was Roscoe's favorite expression, but in a curious and perverse manner. Indeed, to think about the matter for as much as half an hour drove him to the edge of insanity. Roscoe believed that live wires should keep young, but carrying it out on such a scale was, was, was inefficient. And there Roscoe rested. Five years later, Roscoe's little boy had grown old enough to play childish games with little Benjamin, under the supervision of the same nurse. Roscoe took them both to kindergarten on the same day, and Benjamin found that playing with little strips of colored paper, making mats and chains and curious and beautiful designs, was the most fascinating game in the world. Once he was bad and had to stand in the corner. Then he cried. But for the most part, there were gay hours in the cheerful room, with the sunlight coming in the windows, and Miss Bailey's kind hand resting for a moment now and then in his tousled hair. Roscoe's son moved up into the first grade after a year, but Benjamin stayed on in the kindergarten. He was very happy. Sometimes, when other tots talked about what they would do when they grew up, a shadow would cross his little face as if in a dim, childish way he realized that those were things in which he was never to share. The days flowed on in monotonous content. He went back a third year to the kindergarten, but he was too little now to understand what the bright shining strips of paper were for. He cried because the other boys were bigger than he, and he was afraid of them. The teacher talked to him, but though he tried to understand, he could not understand at all. He was taken from the kindergarten. His nurse, Nana, in her starched gingham dress, became the center of his tiny world. On bright days, they walked in the park. Nana would point at a great gray monster and say, Elephant, and Benjamin would say it after her. And when he was being undressed for bed that night, he would say it over and over aloud to her. Elephant, elephant, elephant. Sometimes Nana let him jump on the bed, which was fun, because if you sat down exactly right, it would bounce you up on your feet again. And if you said, Ah, for a long time, while you jumped, you got a very pleasing broken vocal effect. He loved to take a big cane from the hat rack and go around hitting chairs and tables with it and saying, Fight! 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 When there were people there, the old ladies would cluck at him, which interested him, and the young ladies would try to kiss him, which he submitted to with mild boredom. And when the long day was done, at five o'clock, he would go upstairs with Nana and be fed on oatmeal and nice, soft, mushy foods with a spoon. There were no troublesome memories in his childish sleep. No token came to him of his brave days at college, of the glittering years when he flustered the hearts of many girls. There were only the white, safe walls of his crib, and Nana, and a man who came to see him sometimes, and a great big orange ball that Nana pointed at just before his twilight bed hour and called Sun. When the sun went, his eyes were sleepy. There were no dreams, no dreams to haunt him. The past, the wild charge at the head of his men up San Juan Hill, the first years of his marriage, when he worked late into the summer dusk down in the busy city for young Hildegard, whom he loved. The days before that, when he sat smoking far into the night in the gloomy old button house on Monroe Street with his grandfather. All these had faded, like unsubstantial dreams from his mind, as though they had never been. He did not remember. He did not remember clearly whether the milk was warm or cool at his last feeding, or how the days passed. 
there was only his crib and Nana's familiar presence, and then he remembered nothing. When he was hungry, he cried. That was all. Through the noons and nights he breathed, and over him there were soft mumblings and murmurings that he scarcely heard, and faintly differentiated smells, and light and darkness. Then it was all dark, and his white crib and the dim faces that moved above him, and the warm sweet aroma of the milk faded out altogether from his mind. End of the Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald In Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2「The Tale of the Pie and the Patty Pan » by Beatrix Potter Section 9 of the Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Narrated by Andrew Nixon Ribby, read by Beth Thomas Duchess Read by Betsy Walker. Dr. Maggotty, a magpie. Read by Larry Wilson. Cousin Tabitha Twitchit, a cat. Read by Devorah Allen. Pussycat sits by the fire. How should she be fair? In walks the little dog. Says, Pussy, are you there? How do you do, Mistress Pussy? Mistress Pussy, how do you do? I thank you kindly, little dog. I fare as well as you. Old Rhyme Once upon a time there was a pussycat called Ribby, who invited a little dog called Duchess to tea. Come in good time, my dear Duchess, said Ribby's letter. And we will have something so very nice. I am baking it in a pie dish, a pie dish with a pink rim. You never tasted anything so good, and you shall eat it all. I will eat muffins, my dear Duchess, wrote Ribby. Duchess read the letter and wrote an answer. I will come with much pleasure at a quarter past four. But it is very strange. I was just going to invite you to come here to supper, my dear Ribby, to eat something most delicious. I will come very punctually, my dear Ribby, wrote Duchess. And then at the end she added, I hope it isn't mouse. And then she thought that did not look quite polite. So she scratched out, Isn't mouse? And changed it to, I hope it will be fine. And she gave her letter to the postman. But she thought a great deal about Ribby's pie, and she read Ribby's letter over and over again. I am dreadfully afraid it will be mouse, said Duchess to herself. I really couldn't, couldn't eat a mouse pie, and I shall have to eat it because it is a party, and my pie was going to be veal and ham, a pink and white pie dish, and so is mine, just like Ribby's dishes. They were both bought at Tabitha Twitchett's. Duchess went into her larder and took the pie off a shelf and looked at it. It is all ready to put in the oven. Such a lovely pie crust. And I put in a little tin patty pan to hold up the crust. And I made a hole in the middle with a fork to let out the steam. Oh, I do wish I could eat my own pie instead of a pie made of mouse. Duchess considered and considered and read Ribby's letter again. A pink and white pie dish, and you shall eat it all. You means me. Then Ribby is not going to even taste the pie herself? A pink and white pie dish. Ribby is sure to go out and buy the muffins. Oh, what a good idea. Why shouldn't I rush along and put my pie into Ribby's oven when Ribby isn't there? Duchess was quite delighted with her own cleverness. Ribby, in the meantime, had received Duchess's answer, and as soon as she was sure that the little dog could come, she popped her pie into the oven. There were two ovens, one above the other, some other knobs and handles were only ornamental and not intended to open. Ribby put the pie into the lower oven. The door was very stiff. The top oven bakes too quickly, said Ribby to herself. It is a pie of the most delicate and tender mouse, minced up with bacon, and I have taken out all the bones, because Duchess did nearly choke herself with a fish bone last time I gave a party. She eats a little fast, rather big mouthfuls, but a most genteel and elegant little dog, infinitely superior company to Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. Ribby put on some coal and swept up the hearth. Then she went out with a can to the well for water to fill up the kettle. 
Then she began to set the room in order, for it was the sitting room as well as the kitchen. She shook the mats out at the front door and put them straight. The hearth rug was a rabbit skin. She dusted the clock and the ornaments on the mantelpiece, and she polished and rubbed the tables and chairs. Then she spread a very clean white tablecloth and set out her best china tea set, which she took out of a wall cupboard near the fireplace. The teacups were white with a pattern of pink roses, and the dinner plates were white and blue. When Ribby had laid the table, she took a jug and a blue and white dish, and went out down the field to the farm to fetch milk and butter. When she came back, she peeped into the bottom oven. The pie looked very comfortable. Ribby put on her shawl and bonnet, and went out again with a basket to the village shop to buy a packet of tea, a pound of lump sugar, and a pot of marmalade. And just at the same time, Duchess came out of her house at the other end of the village. Ribby met Duchess halfway down the street, also carrying a basket covered with a cloth. They only bowed to one another. They did not speak, because they were going to have a party. As soon as Duchess had got round the corner out of sight, she simply ran, straight away to Ribby's house. Ribby went into the shop and bought what she required, and came out, after a pleasant gossip with Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. Cousin Tabitha was disdainful afterwards in conversation. Tch, a little dog indeed. Just as if there were no cats in sorry, and a pie for afternoon tea. The very idea, said Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. Rivy went on to Timothy Baker's and bought the muffins. Then she went home. There seemed to be a sort of scuffling noise in the back passage as she was coming in at the front door. I trust it is not that pie. The spoons are locked up, however, said Rivy. But there was nobody there. Rivy opened the bottom oven door with some difficulty and turned the pie. There began to be a pleasing smell of baked mouse. Duchess, in the meantime, had slipped out at the back door. It is a very odd thing that Ribby's pie was not in the oven when I put mine in. And I can't find it anywhere. I've looked all over the house. I put my pie into a nice hot oven at the top. I could not turn any of the other handles. I think that they are all shams, said Duchess. But I wish I could have removed the pie made of mouse. I cannot think what she has done with it. I heard Ribby coming, and I had to run out by the back door. Duchess went home and brushed her beautiful black coat, and then she picked a bunch of flowers in her garden as a present for Ribby, and passed the time until the clock struck four. Ribby, having assured herself by careful search that there was really no one hiding in the cupboard or in the larder, went upstairs to change her dress. She put on a lilac silk gown for the party, and an embroidered muslin apron and tippet. It is very strange, said Rivy. I did not think I left that drawer pulled out. Has somebody been trying on my mittens? She came downstairs again and made the tea and put the teapot on the hob. She peeped again into the bottom oven. The pie had become a lovely brown and it was steaming hot. She sat down before the fire to wait for the little dog. I am glad I used the bottom oven, said Rivy. The top one would certainly have been much too hot. I wonder why that cupboard door was open. Can there really have been someone in the house? Very punctually at four o'clock, Duchess started to go to the party. She ran so fast through the village that she was too early, and she had to wait a little while in the lane that leads down to Ribby's house. I wonder if Ribby has taken my pie out of the oven yet, said Duchess. And whatever can have become of the other pie made of mouse? At a quarter past four to the minute, there came a most genteel little tap tappity. Is Mrs. Ribston at home? inquired Duchess in the porch. Come in, and how do you do, my dear Duchess? cried Ribby. I hope I see you well. Quite well, I thank you. And how do you do, my dear Ribby? said Duchess. I've brought you some flowers. What a delicious smell of pie, said Duchess. Oh, what lovely flowers. Yes, it is mouse and bacon, said Ribby. Do not talk about food, my dear Ribby, said Duchess. What a lovely white tea cloth. Is it done to a turn? Is it still in the oven? I think it wants another five minutes, said Ribby. Just a shade longer. I will pour out the tea while we wait. Do you take sugar, my dear Duchess? Oh, yes, please, my dear Ribby. And may I have a lump on my nose? With pleasure, my dear Duchess. How beautifully you beg. Oh, how sweetly pretty. Duchess sat up with the sugar on her nose and sniffed. How good that pie smells. I do love veal and ham. I mean, to say, mouse and bacon. She dropped the sugar in confusion and had to go hunting under the tea table, so did not see which oven Ribby opened in order to get out the pie. Ribby set the pie upon the table. There was a very savoury smell. Duchess came out from under the tablecloth munching sugar 
and sat up on a chair. I will first cut the pie for you. I am going to have muffin and marmalade, said Ribby. Do you really prefer muffin? Mind the patty pan. I beg your pardon, said Ribby. May I pass you the marmalade? said Duchess hurriedly. The pie proved extremely toothsome, and the muffins light and hot. They disappeared rapidly, especially the pie. I think, thought Duchess to herself, I think it would be wiser if I help myself to pie. Though Ribby did not seem to notice anything when she was cutting it, what very small fine pieces it has cooked into. I did not remember that I had minced it up so fine. I suppose this is a quicker oven than my own. How fast Duchess is eating, thought Ribby to herself, as she buttered her fifth muffin. The pie dish was emptying rapidly. Duchess had had four helps already, and was fumbling with the spoon. A little more bacon, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. Thank you, my dear Ribby. I was only feeling for the patty pan. The patty pan, my dear Duchess? The patty pan that held up the pie crust, said Duchess, blushing under her black coat. Oh, I didn't put one in, my dear Duchess said Ribby. I don't think that it is necessary in pies made of mouse. Duchess fumbled with the spoon. I can't find it, she said anxiously. There isn't a patty pan, said Ribby, looking perplexed. Yes, indeed, my dear Ribby. Where could it have gone to? said Duchess. There most certainly is not one, my dear Duchess. I disapprove of tin articles in puddings and pies. It is most undesirable, especially when people swallow in lumps, she added in a lower voice. Duchess looked very much alarmed and continued to scoop the inside of the pie dish. My great-aunt Squintina, grandmother of cousin Tabitha Twitchit, died of a thimble in a Christmas plum pudding. I never put any article of metal in my puddings or pies. Duchess looked aghast and tilted up the pie dish. I have only four patty pans and they are all in the cupboard. Duchess set up a howl. Oh, I shall die. I shall die. I have swallowed a patty pan. Oh, my dear Ribby, I do feel so ill. It is impossible, my dear Duchess. There was not a patty pan. Duchess moaned and whined and rocked herself about. Oh, 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 I feel so dreadful. I have swallowed a patty pan. There was nothing in the pie, said Ribby severely. Yes, there was, my dear Ribby. I am sure I have swallowed it. Let me prop you up with a pillow, my dear Duchess. Where do you think you feel it? Oh, I do feel so ill all over me, my dear Ribby. I have swallowed a large tin patty pan with a sharp scalloped edge. Shall I run for the doctor? I will just lock up the spoons. Oh, yes, yes. Fetch Dr. Maggotty, my dear Ribby. He is a pie himself. He will certainly understand. Ribby settled Duchess in an armchair before the fire and went out and hurried to the village to look for the doctor. She found him at the smithy. He was occupied in putting rusty nails into a bottle of ink, which he had obtained at the post office. Gammon? Ha <laughs> ha! said he, with his head on one side. Ribby explained that her guest had swallowed a patty pan. Spinach? Ha <laughs> ha! said he, and accompanied her with alacrity. He hopped so fast that Ribby had to run. It was most conspicuous. All the village could see that Ribby was fetching the doctor. I knew they would overeat themselves said Cousin Tabba the Twitchit. But while Ribby had been hunting for the doctor, a curious thing had happened to Duchess, who had been left by herself sitting before the fire, sighing and groaning and feeling very unhappy. How could I have swallowed it? Such a large thing as a patty pan. She got up and went to the table, and felt inside the pie dish again with a spoon. No, there is no patty pan, and I put one in, and nobody has eaten pie except me, so I must have swallowed it. She sat down again and stared mournfully at the grate. The fire crackled and danced, and something sizzled. Duchess started. She opened the door of the top oven. Out came a rich steamy flavour of veal and ham, and there stood a fine brown pie, and through a hole in the top of the pie crust there was a glimpse of a little tin patty pan. Duchess drew a long breath. Then I must have been eating mouse. Ugh, no wonder I feel ill. But perhaps I should feel worse if I had really swallowed a patty pan. Duchess reflected. What a very awkward thing to have to explain to Ribby. I think I will put my pie on the back yard and say nothing about it. When I go home, I will run round and take it away. She put it outside the back door and sat down again by the fire and shut her eyes. When Ribby arrived with the doctor, she seemed fast asleep. Gammon, ha, 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 said the doctor. I am feeling very much better, said Duchess, waking up with a jump. 
I am truly glad to hear it. He has brought you a pill, my dear Duchess. I think I should feel quite well if he only felt my pulse, said Duchess, backing away from the magpie, who sidled up with something in his beak. It is only a bread pill. You had much better take it. Drink a little milk, my dear Duchess. Gammon, gammon, said the doctor, while Duchess coughed and choked. Don't say that again, said Ribby, losing her temper. Here, take this bread and jam and get out into the yard. Gammon and spinach, ha 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 shouted Dr. Maggotty triumphantly outside the back door. I am feeling very much better, my dear Ribby, said Duchess. Do you not think I had better go home before it gets dark? Perhaps it might be wise, my dear Duchess. I will lend you a nice warm shawl, and you shall take my arm. I would not trouble you for worlds. I feel wonderfully better. One pill of Dr. Maggotty. Indeed, it is most admirable if it has cured you of a patty pan. I will call directly after breakfast to ask how you have slept. Ribby and Duchess said goodbye affectionately, and Duchess started home. Halfway up the lane, she stopped and looked back. Ribby had gone in and shut her door. Duchess slipped through the fence and ran round to the back of Ribby's house and peeped into the yard. Upon the roof of the pigsty sat Dr. Maggotty and three jackdaws. The jackdaws were eating pie crust, and the magpie was drinking gravy out of a patty pan. Gammon! Ha ha ha! He shouted when he saw Duchess's little black nose peeping round the corner. Duchess ran home, feeling uncommonly silly. When Ribby came out for a pailful of water to wash up the tea things, she found a pink and white pie dish lying smashed in the middle of the yard. The patty pan was under the pump, where Dr. Maggotty had considerately left it. Ribby stared with amazement. Did you ever see the like? So there really was a patty pan. But my patty pans are all in the kitchen cupboard. Well, I never did. Next time I want to give a party, I will invite Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. End of the tale of the pie and the patty pan. A Retrieved Reformation by O. Henry of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jimmy Valentine Read by Adrian Stevens. Warden. Read by Abai. Mike Dolan. Read by Rob Marland. Ben Pierce. Read by Java Man. Boy. Read by Larry Wilson. Annabelle. Read by T.J. Burns. A Mr. Adams. Read by Todd. Agatha's Mother. Read by Beth Thomas. Narrator. Read by Sarah Height. A guard came to the prison shoe shop, where Jimmy Valentine was assiduously stitching uppers, and escorted him to the front office. There the warden handed Jimmy his pardon, which had been signed that morning by the governor. Jimmy took it in a tired kind of way. He had served nearly ten months of a four-year sentence. He had expected to stay only about three months at the longest. When a man with as many friends on the outside as Jimmy Valentine had is received in the stir, it is hardly worthwhile to cut his hair. Now, Valentine, said the warden, you'll go out in the morning. Brace up and make a man of yourself. You're not a bad fellow at heart. Stop cracking safes and live straight. Me? said Jimmy in surprise. Why, I never cracked a safe in my life. Oh, no! <laughs> laughed the warden. Of course not. Let's see now. How was it you happened to get sent up on that Springfield drop? Was it because you wouldn't prove an alibi for fear of compromising somebody in extremely high-toned society? Or was it simply a case of a mean old jury that had it in for you? It's always one or the other with you innocent victims. Me? said Jimmy, still blankly virtuous. Why, warden? I never was in Springfield in my life. Take him back, Cronin, said the warden, and fix him up with outgoing clothes. Unlock him at seven in the morning and let him come to the bullpen. Better think over my advice, Valentine. At a quarter past seven on the next morning, Jimmy stood in the warden's outer office. He had on a suit of the villainously fitting, ready-made clothes and a pair of the stiff, squeaky shoes that the state furnishes to its discharged compulsory guests. The clerk handed him a railroad ticket, and the five-dollar bill, 
with which the law expected him to rehabilitate himself into good citizenship and prosperity the warden gave him a cigar and shook hands valentine nine seven six two was chronicled on the books pardoned by governor and mr james valentine walked out into the sunshine disregarding the song of the birds the waving green trees and the smell of the flowers jimmy headed straight for a restaurant there he tasted the first sweet joys of liberty in the shape of a broiled chicken and a bottle of white wine followed by a cigar a great better than the one the warden had given him from there he proceeded leisurely to the depot he tossed a quarter into the hat of a blind man sitting by the door and boarded his train three hours set him down in a little town near the state line he went to the cafe of one mike dolan and shook hands with mike who was alone behind the bar sorry we couldn't make it sooner jimmy me boy said mike but we had that protest from springfield to buck against and the governor nearly balked feeling all right fine said jimmy got my key he got his key and went upstairs unlocking the door of a room at the rear everything was just as he had left it there on the floor was still ben price's collar button that had been torn from that eminent detective's shirt-band when they had overpowered jimmy to arrest him pulling out from the wall a folding bed jimmy slid back a panel in the wall and dragged out a dust-covered suitcase he opened this and gazed fondly at the finest set of burglar's tools in the east it was a complete set made of specially tempered steel the latest designs in drills punches braces and bits jimmies clamps and augers with two or three novelties invented by jimmy himself in which he took pride over nine hundred dollars they had cost him to have made at blank a place where they make such things for the profession in half an hour jimmy went downstairs and through the cafe he was now dressed in tasteful and well-fitting clothes and carried his dusted and cleaned suitcase in his hand got anything on asked mike dolan genially me said jimmy in a puzzled tone i don't understand i'm representing the new york amalgamated short snap biscuit cracker and frazzled wheat company this statement delighted mike to such an extent that jimmy had to take a seltzer and milk on the spot he never touched hard drinks a week after the release of valentine nine seven six two there was a neat job of safe burglary done in richmond indiana with no clue to the author a scant eight hundred dollars was all that was secured two weeks after that a patented improved burglar-proof safe in logansport was opened like a cheese to the tune of fifteen hundred dollars currency securities and silver untouched that began to interest the rogue catchers then an old-fashioned bank safe in jefferson city became active and threw out of its crater an eruption of banknotes amounting to five thousand dollars the losses were now high enough to bring the matter up into ben price's class of work by comparing notes a remarkable similarity in the methods of the burglaries was noticed ben price investigated the scenes of the robberies and was heard to remark that's dandy jim valentine's autograph he's resumed business look at that combination knob jerked out as easy as pulling up a radish in wet weather he's got the only clamps that can do it and look how clean those tumblers were punched out jimmy never has to drill but one hole yes i guess i want mr valentine he'll do his bit next time without any short time or clemency foolishness ben price knew jimmy's habits he had learned them while working up the springfield case long jumps quick getaways no confederates and a taste for good society these ways had helped mr valentine to become noted as a successful dodger of retribution it was given out that ben price had taken up the trail of the elusive cracksman and other people with burglar-proof safes felt more at ease one afternoon jimmy valentine and his suitcase climbed out of the mail hack in elmore a little town five miles off the railroad down in the blackjack country of arkansas 
Jimmy, looking like an athletic young senior just home from college, went down the board sidewalk toward the hotel. A young lady crossed the street, passed him at the corner, and entered a door over which was the sign, The Elmore Bank. Jimmy Valentine looked into her eyes, forgot what he was, and became another man. She lowered her eyes and colored slightly. Young men of Jimmy's style and looks were scarce in Elmore. Jimmy collared a boy that was loafing on the steps of the bank, as if he were one of the stockholders, and began to ask him questions about the town, feeding him dimes at intervals. By and by, the young lady came out, looking royally unconscious of the young man with the suitcase, and went her way. "'Isn't that the young lady Polly Simpson?' asked Jimmy with specious guile. "'Nah,' said the boy. "'She's Annabelle Adams. Her pa owns this bank. Uh, what'd you come to Elmore for? Is that a gold watch chain? I'm going to get a bulldog. Got any more dimes?' Jimmy went to the Planters Hotel, registered as Ralph D. Spencer, and engaged a room. He leaned on the desk and declared his platform to the clerk. He said he had come to Elmore to look for a location to go into business. How was the shoe business now in the town? He had thought of the shoe business. Was there an opening? The clerk was impressed by the clothes and manner of Jimmy. He himself was something of a pattern of fashion to the thinly gilded youth of Elmore, but he now perceived his shortcomings. While trying to figure out Jimmy's manner of tying his foreign hand, he cordially gave information. Yes, there ought to be a good opening in the shoe line. There wasn't an exclusive shoe store in the place. The dry goods and general stores handled them. Business in all lines was fairly good. Hoped Mr. Spencer would decide to locate in Elmore. He would find it a pleasant town to live in, and the people very sociable. Mr. Spencer thought he would stop over in the town a few days and look over the situation. No, the clerk needn't call the boy. He would carry up his suitcase himself. It was rather heavy. Mr. Ralph Spencer, the phoenix that arose from Jimmy Valentine's ashes, ashes left by the flame of a sudden and alterative attack of love, remained in Elmore and prospered. He opened a shoe store and secured a good run of trade. Socially, he was also a success and made many friends. And he accomplished the wish of his heart. He met Miss Annabel Adams and became more and more captivated by her charms. At the end of the year, the situation of Mr. Ralph Spencer was this. He had won the respect of the community. His shoe store was flourishing and he and Annabel were engaged to be married in two weeks. Mr. Adams, the typical plodding country banker, approved of Spencer. Annabel's pride in him almost equaled her affection. He was as much at home in the family of Mr. Adams and that of Annabel's married sister as if he were already a member. One day, Jimmy sat down in his room and wrote this letter, which he mailed to the safe address of one of his old friends in St. Louis. Dear old pal, I want you to be at Sullivan's place in Little Rock next Wednesday night at nine o'clock. I want you to wind up some little matters for me. And also, I want to make you a present of my kit of tools. I know you'll be glad to get them. You couldn't duplicate the lot for a thousand dollars. Say, Billy, I've quit the old business a year ago. I got a nice store. I'm making an honest living and I'm going to marry the finest girl on earth two weeks from now. It's the only life, Billy, the straight one. I wouldn't touch a dollar of another man's money now for a million. After I get married, I'm going to sell out and go west, where there won't be so much danger of having old scores brought up against me. I tell you, Billy, she's an angel. She believes in me. I wouldn't do another crooked thing for the whole world. Be sure to be at Sally's, for I must see you. I'll bring along the tools with me. Your old friend, Jimmy. On the Monday night after Jimmy wrote this letter, Ben Price jogged unobtrusively into Elmore in a livery buggy. He lounged about town in his quiet way until he found out what he wanted to know. From the drugstore across the street from Spencer's shoe store, he got a good look at Ralph D. Spencer. Going to marry the banker's daughter, are you, Jimmy? said Ben to himself, softly. Well, 
I don't know. The next morning, Jimmy took breakfast at the Adamses. He was going to Little Rock that day to order his wedding suit and buy something nice for Annabel. That would be the first time he had left town since he came to Elmore. It had been more than a year now since those last professional jobs, and he thought he could safely venture out. After breakfast, quite a family party went downtown together. Mr. Adams, Annabel, Jimmy, and Annabel's married sister with her two little girls, aged five and nine. They came by the hotel where Jimmy still boarded, and he ran up to his room and brought along his suitcase. Then they went on to the bank. There stood Jimmy's horse and buggy, and Dolph Gibson, who was going to drive him over to the railroad station. All went inside the high, carved oak railings into the banking room, Jimmy included, for Mr. Adams' future son-in-law was welcome anywhere. The clerks were pleased to be greeted by the good-looking, agreeable young man who was going to marry Miss Annabel. Jimmy set his suitcase down. Annabel, whose heart was bubbling with happiness and lively youth, put on Jimmy's hat and picked up the suitcase. "'Wouldn't I make a nice drummer?' said Annabel. "'My, Ralph! How heavy it is! Feels like it was full of gold bricks!' "'Lot of nickel-plated shoehorns in there,' said Jimmy, coolly. "'That I'm going to return. Thought I'd save express charges by taking them up. I'm getting awfully economical.' The Elmore Bank had just put in a new safe and vault. Mr. Adams was very proud of it, and insisted on an inspection by everyone. The vault was a small one, but it had a new patented door. It fastened with three solid steel bolts thrown simultaneously with a single handle, and had a time lock. Mr. Adams beamingly explained its workings to Mr. Spencer, who showed a courteous but not too intelligent interest. The two children, May and Agatha, were delighted by the shining metal and funny clock and knobs. While they were thus engaged, Ben Price sauntered in and leaned on his elbow, looking casually inside between the railings. He told the teller that he didn't want anything. He was just waiting for a man he knew. Suddenly, there was a scream or two from the women, and a commotion. Unperceived by the elders, May, the nine-year-old girl, in a spirit of play, had shut Agatha in the vault. She had then shot the bolts and turned the knob of the combination as she had seen Mr. Adams do. The old banker sprang to the handle and tugged at it for a moment. The door can't be opened, he groaned. The clock hasn't been wound, nor the combination set. Hush, said Mr. Adams, raising his trembling hand. I'll be quiet for a moment. Agatha? He called as loudly as he could. Listen to me. During the following silence, they could just hear the faint sound of the child wildly shrieking in the dark vault in a panic of terror. My precious darling, wailed the mother. She will die of fright. Open the door. Oh, break it open. Can't you men do something? There isn't a man nearer than Little Rock who can open that door, said Mr. Adams in a shaky voice. My God. "'Spencer, what shall we do? "'That child, she can't stand it long in there. "'There isn't enough air. "'And besides, she'll go into convulsions from fright.' "'Agatha's mother, frantic now, "'beat the door of the vault with her hands. "'Somebody wildly suggested dynamite. "'Annabel turned to Jimmy, "'her large eyes full of anguish, but not yet despairing. To a woman, nothing seems quite impossible to the powers of the man she worships. Can't you do something, Ralph? Try, won't you? He looked at her with a queer, soft smile on his lips and in his keen eyes. Annabelle, he said. Give me that rose you're wearing, will you? Hardly believing that she heard him aright, she unpinned the bud from the bosom of her dress and placed it in his hand. Jimmy stuffed it into his vest pocket, threw off his coat, and pulled up his shirt sleeves. With that act, Ralph D. Spencer passed away, and Jimmy Valentine took his place. Get away from the door, all of you, he commanded shortly. He set his suitcase on the table and opened it out flat. From that time on, he seemed to be unconscious of the presence of anyone else.
He laid out the shining, queer implements, swiftly and orderly, whistling softly to himself, as he always did when at work. In a deep silence, and immovable, the others watched him as if under a spell. In a minute, Jimmy's pet drill was biting smoothly into the steel door. In ten minutes, breaking his own burglarious record, he threw back the bolts and opened the door. Agatha, almost collapsed but safe, was gathered into her mother's arms. Jimmy Valentine put on his coat and walked outside the railings towards the front door. As he went, he thought he heard a faraway voice that he once knew call, Ralph! But he never hesitated. At the door, a big man stood somewhat in his way. Hello, Ben, said Jimmy, still with his strange smile. Got around at last, have you? Well, let's go. I don't know that it makes much difference now. And then, Ben Price acted rather strangely. Guess you're mistaken, Mr. Spencer, he said. Don't believe I recognize you. Your buggy's waiting for you, ain't it? And Ben Price turned and strolled down the street. End of A Retrieved Reformation by O. Henry <laughs>